legislative branch appropriations before the House Rules Committee. The Rules Committee is the final stop for the spending bill before it makes its way to the House floor. The measure is expected to be debated by the full House on Thursday. The $1.8 billion bill contains appropriations for the House, for joint committees, and for congressional support agencies, including the General Accounting Office and the Library of Congress. During the proceedings ahead, members of both parties petitioned the committee to allow them to offer amendments on a range of issues, including eliminating funding for several House-Senate joint committees. Another amendment would cut House spending by 25 percent. After considering each of the proposed amendments, Rules Committee members vote on whether to allow them to be considered on the House floor. The committee is chaired by Massachusetts Democrat Joe Moakley. The ranking Republican on the panel is Congressman Gerald Solomon of New York. Committee on Rules will now come to order. There's been a request for filming of uh, portions of today's proceedings. Is there any objection? Chair has none. The matter before the committee today is H.R. 2348, the Committee on Appropriations, Legislative Branch Appropriations for Fiscal Year 1994. The witnesses uh, will be the chairman of the subcommittee, uh, Mr. Fazio, and do want to be accompanied by anybody, Mr. Fazio, <laughs> when you come back in the room? Sir, he attended Union College, is it? Mr. Young? Uh, today marks the opening day of the fiscal 1994 appropriation season at the Rules Committee. We'll take first, we'll take up fiscal year 1994 appropriations bill, and I can't think of a better beginning in this defi deficit conscious time than the legislative branch appropriation bills. I think we lead best by example, and for the third year in a row, the legislative branch bill provides less than the previous year's appropriation and will result in a reduction from current projections of between 5.8% and 6.4%. The bill requires reductions in full-time equivalent positions and in administrative expenses. These provisions are estimated to cut off 920 staff slots and reduce administrative costs by over $415,000. The amount recommended by the bill is $19 million below last year's appropriation, and by comparison to fiscal year 1993's appropriation, the House will face a $6.9 million cut including a provision to rescind $1.5 million representing the elimination of select committees, and the GAO will face a $4.3 million cut, the Library of Congress will see a $3 million uh, cut, and the Government Printing Office will be cut by $1.2 million. Cost cutting like charity begins at home, and this legislative branch bill, I think, is the best cost cutting austere tradition of the Appropriations Committee. I think it's a fine way to start the year, Mr. Chairman, and I congratulate you uh, for this matter. Mr. Solomon. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, thank you very much, and uh, I think that uh, we really should note for the record that this is the first time in, in my memory anyway, and perhaps in the history of this House of Representatives, that a rule for an appropriation bill has been requested by someone other than the Chairman of the Appropriations Committee. Uh, today we have a letter of request from the chairman of the Legislative Branch Appropriation Subcommittee, uh, my good friend, Mr. Fazio, who is a graduate of Union College from uh, up in my neck of the woods in upstate New York. So I mean no reflection on him personally. But Mr. Chairman, as most of my colleagues are aware, the chairman of the Appropriations Committee, Mr. Natcher, has not requested a rule and does not intend to uh, on any of the appropriation bills that are going to come before um, May I the House of Representatives. Mr. Sure, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Nactor just called me and said that uh, he personally won't come up on his own bill. He realizes some of his appropriation bills have to come before the committee 
And he said, Mr. Fazio is one of those bills, and he has no objection that the, uh, Mr. Fazio appear before the committee and ask the rule, and he has the chairman back. Him. Well, as the uh, chairman knows, I have the greatest respect, as we all do on both sides of the aisle, for our good friend, Mr. Natcher. He, he really is one of the most respected members of this body. Uh, however, when he appeared before my good friend, uh, Mr. Dreyer, the, uh, one of the uh, co-chairmen of the Joint Committee to Reorganize the Congress, uh, he stated uh, that his reasons are quite simple, and, uh, and I think they were very commendable. Uh, he does not want to encourage the practice of adding legislative uh, and unauthorized matters to appropriation bills. And he was very, very emphatic uh, about that, and uh, many of us feel the same way. That practice, as he said, is in violation of House rules because it interferes with the prerogatives of the authorizing uh, committees, of which we all try to defend uh, those uh, uh, prerogatives. The main reason this bill is before the Rules Committee today is because someone is seeking protection for those unauthorized and legislative provisions. Otherwise, this bill could go directly to the floor as a privileged resolution without our help here in the Rules Committee. Now, at the same time, I think we should recognize, and I think this is a, a very important point, that the legislative branch appropriation is really a cross between an appropriations bill and an, and an authorization. And the reason is we have no regular authorization for the legislative branch. So the vehicle often is used to insert legislative language. The committee report, for instance, I think uh, noted some 32 provisions which are legislative in, in nature and therefore would require waivers of points of order. Now, Mr. Chairman, the point I wanted to make is that that being the case, if the committee does decide to protect those 32 provisions, I think it is only fair, by the same token, that we grant similar waivers to those amendments of a legislative nature which are being requested here today, and we intend to so move at the appropriate time. In other words, if members of the Appropriations Committee are given the prerogative to legislate in an appropriation bill, then therefore, since there is no authorizing committee that has jurisdiction over this issue, I think all of us deserve that same right to legislate in an appropriation bill. Otherwise, you all know from my previous uh, testimony and arguments that uh, I don't like to see uh, legislation uh, amendments being uh, made in order. Uh, the other reason that this bill is before us for a rule, I am told, is to restrict the amendment process. Now, that's something which the House has refused to do for most of its 205-year history. In fact, we have had only five highly restrictive rules and appropriation bills since I came to this Congress 15 years ago. Uh, four of those were on foreign appropriation bills, uh, which are very controversial, as the gentleman knows, and one was the legislative branch appropriation bill uh, in the last session. Again, this is something Chairman Natcher says he opposes, and yet here we are considering a rule that is contrary to, uh, to that wish. This is a sad day, I think, for the House, for the Rules Committee, and the Appropriations Committee if, in fact, we do try to put out a restrictive rule. I think we ought to have an open rule. It ought to go to the floor, and every member of this body, Republicans and Democrats alike, ought to have the ability to offer amendments uh, and let the House work its will. So having said that, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the time, and uh, let me commend the two gentlemen appearing before us for the outstanding work they do. They, uh, it's a tough job, and we all realize that. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let me simply say, to begin with, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to appear here today with my colleague, Bill Young from Florida. We have been working together now for five months, and I think uh, we've established a good working relationship. And I look forward to uh, a continuing one. I know it's not an easy burden for him. He's picked it up this year, I think, uh, in the great tradition of uh, the minority on the Appropriations Committee. And I hope we can continue to work together as we move toward the inevitable difficulties we always have with this bill on the floor. This is not an easy bill because in this day and age, we provide tremendous amount of scrutiny over the branch of government that we are part of that we have to periodically maintain. This legislation is always going to be a lightning rod for people who wish to uh, uh, change in either minor or dramatic ways the way in which we do business here. And I would maintain that 
our subcommittee has caught the tenor of the times and in recent years particularly have been exceeding any other bill that comes before the House in terms of appropriations matters in reducing spending. This would be the second year in which we come before you with a sizable outlay reduction. And for those who aren't familiar with the term, that is exactly what we spend, not what we authorize for expenditure. The outlay reductions in this bill, when added to those we took last year, will bring us to something close to 13 percent, which is well on the way to a 25 percent reduction, which is certainly a, a worthy <coughs> goal for all of us over the four, four to five year span of time that I think is the only reasonable way in which we can find uh, reductions in expenditures that won't really cut to the quick uh, this very important branch of government, one of the three that the Founding Fathers decided needed to have independence and objectivity when considering policy initiatives of the executive. A lot of people are not aware of exactly what's in this bill. It doesn't just fund the House of Representatives or the Congress. Much of it covers agencies which serve the general public and these two branches of government only incidentally. In addition to the House, this bill has, of course, the Joint Committee funded. It has uh, a number of support agencies that do serve our needs, the Congressional Budget Office, the Office of Technology Assessment, the Congressional Research Service, that one small element of the Library of Congress, and, of course, the GAO, the General Accounting Office. The architect of the Capitol is also included in our bill, but three of the larger expenditures are for the Library of Congress, the Government Printing Office, and the uh, uh, Copyright Royalty Tribunal. Uh, the funds for the Senate, of course, will be added in the other body when the bill is taken up over there. We reported this bill on June 8th. We completed our hearings at the very beginning of the year. <coughs> and what I want to present to you now is a bill that amounts to $1.785 billion, $1 billion, $785 million in budget authority. That is a reduction of almost $300 million under the budget as requested. That is a reduction, if I remember correctly, of something like 14 percent from what we were requested to expend. That is a reduction of almost $19 million under the 1993 budget authority this committee was provided, and a reduction of some $17 million under our discretionary allocation provided by the full Appropriations Committee, uh, translated through by the budget resolution. It's $7 million under the current level of funding for the House, the operations of the House. We've asked uh, the Joint Committees and those support agencies that they be reduced by 1 percent in budget authority. That's not outlays, budget authority below the 1993 level. For example, we've asked the General Accounting Office to take a $4.4 million reduction. We have provided a few essentials. We did provide uh, almost a uh, million dollars for the implementation of the Americans for Disabilities Act. Those, I think, need to go forward. We've heard a lot about the need for Congress to live with the laws we pass. We are well underway in uh, modifying the plant to accommodate the many people who visit us who have disabilities. We did provide additional funding to continue to update our lighting. The energy uh, retrofitting that we're undertaking, I think, will save us a lot of money down the road. And of course, because we have some hazardous waste in our facilities, we do have to spend some funds to reduce those and remove that potential danger to our employees and to our visitors. There are a number of legislative proposals that I wanted to highlight. One extends the authority for one more year <coughs> for the uh, architect of the Capitol to purchase, lease, or otherwise provide a remote storage facility for very pressing needs of the Library of Congress for off-site storage. Working with the uh, Military Construction Committee, we think we've found a facility in nearby Woodridge, Virginia, which will help alleviate that burden. We provide in this bill a very important retirement incentive for the GAO, GPO, and Library of Congress employees. We're going to provide incentives for people to take retirement if they're eligible so that we can reduce the number of personnel in those agencies. It will help us with the overall goal that we have established 
of conforming to the executive orders that the uh, president and our friend Leon Panetta at OMB announced at the very beginning of the year. We're going to be reducing our overhead, our expenses, and we're going to be reducing our personnel over the next several years. The retirement incentive, I think, will go a long way to help limit the number of people who are employed in the legislative branch. We're not going to allow these positions to be filled, and thereby we get the savings in the first year and in future years of the salaries that would have been paid to these people. Uh, we're, we're going to make, uh, over the next four years, as I've just indicated, a real effort to reduce our overhead and our personnel, but we want to do it in a way which will be fair to them and not in a meat axe across the board kind of approach that would, uh, as some I know have indicated, reduce by 25 percent in one year the entire branch of government. This is not uh, analogous to reducing, say, White House staff by 25 percent. The proposals that I've heard would cut 25 percent of this branch of government's ability to perform. I want to say I think the approach that we've taken that will get us there over a four or five year period is humane and will do it in a way in which the institution will survive in uh, a form that can uh, truly represent our constitutional responsibilities. We're also asking uh, some minor language be included so that House daycare employees can have comparable benefit to the Senate in terms of uh, el being eligible for retirement. Uh, we have uh, eliminated something that I think is long overdue, and that is the archaic 1866 provision that allowed for members to be reimbursed for travel to and from their districts. We now have a much more comprehensive travel allowance and we didn't fund last year this provision this year, and we not only not fund it, we do not even allow its authorization to remain in law. There are a number of other minor housekeeping provisions that expedite the operations of the House and other agencies, for example, flex time, allowing for people uh, to deal with emergencies in the garages, uh, et cetera. But I think uh, Essentially, we have uh, not really intruded into the responsibilities of the various authorizing committees that have jurisdiction over this bill. We've had the endorsement by Mr. Clay and the Post Office and Civil Service Committee for the provisions relating to the uh, retirement incentives. Mr. Rose at House Administration has kindly seen fit to go along with the daycare center language. The staffing and administrative cost savings were directed by the Speaker and the Senate Majority Leader. I know a certain amount of uh, communication has been maintained with the minority uh, leadership on these matters as well. Uh, I think in general this is a bill that we can bring with pride because of its uh, stringency, its tightness, and I think its conformity to the general uh, will of the body that we make every effort to lead the way in reducing expenditures. There's certainly no uh, other committee that will come before you that will be in a position to make reductions over prior year. Uh, most of those committees will be working off a baseline, which shows gradual growth. This committee has long ago uh, overlooked any baseline as a standard by which we'll be judged. We know we're not going to be judged by bu budget authority reductions. We're going to be judged by what we spend one year after another, and that's why I'm so pleased to be able to present a bill that will, I think, uh, keep us on track in the direction of, over time, a 25 percent reduction in our outlays. I'm requesting a rule which will weigh points of order against these provisions based on clauses 2 and 6 of Rule 21 of the House. I'm here today to ask that the rule provide for an orderly consideration of this measure, including a waiver of the three-day rule, Clause 7 of Rule 21. Mr. Chairman, I thank you and the ranking member for uh, your letting us be first out of the barrel. Uh, I uh, certainly look forward to hearing any questions we might have from members of the committee. Uh, I know there are an awful lot of people who are anxious to deal in very real legislative terms with this bill. I know that those, these are very important political goals to a lot of people, but I do hope the committee will help us uh, in holding together a uh, kind of bipartisan spirit here that allows this institution to perform its duties at the same time that tries to lead the way on expenditure reductions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for starting this well-prepared session. I think we are flattered by it.
think you're to be applauded by the, the cuts that you're, you're making in, in the legislative appropriations bill. Mr. Young of Florida. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to be here with my friend Mr. Fazio. Uh, I've seen your witness list. I recognize you have a long hearing ahead of you on this, so my comments will be rather brief and pretty much to the point. But I, uh, in view of the brevity, I, I, I would like, though, to say just a few comments about uh, my friend Vic Fazio. This is my, as, as he indicated, this is my first time on this subcommittee, uh, having been on the Appropriations Committee for more than 20 years. but. Uh, first time on this subcommittee, and I've le I learned a lot about the, uh, the, the funding of the legislative branch of the government, believe me. And I take my hat off to Mr. Fazio. Uh, he, he sometimes has to be a referee between a lot of important people with, uh, with important issues to determine. Uh, my respect for him goes back, though, before, uh, before this experience. Uh, Vic and I both had daughters with leukemia. And we both had daughters who had bone marrow transplants, and we both came here to, determined to create a national registry of bone marrow donors so that other people in our situation uh, could have a life-saving bone marrow transplant. Uh, the good news is the national program is working exceptionally well, uh, and Vic's daughter and my daughter are both alive and well because of the bone marrow transplants, and during that time I gained a lot of respect for Mr. Fazio and, and of course, during this period on, on this legislative bill, or this legislative appropriations bill. Uh, we, we do have a, a little disagreement on the rule that we'd like to ask for. I personally would request an open rule. And I have several reasons for that. Uh, I don't have a lot of amendments that I prefer to offer because much of the uh, uh, reform that I thought we should see, we've already put into the bill with the, with the support of the chairman. I do have personally several amendments that are almost technical in nature. But the reason I ask for an open rule is that uh, many of our new colleagues, many of the freshman class of both parties, ran their campaigns based on changes they wanted to make in the operation of the Congress. And they're not going to have a better vehicle to do that except through this particular bill. And I believe they ought to have a chance. I might not even agree with what they want to do, but I really believe that this large freshman class uh, should have an opportunity to, to make its case. And if we have, with a closed rule, I just don't think they're going to be given that opportunity. Besides that, I think open rules are good for the, for the institution. Sometimes they, they are time consuming, but uh, it's been such a long time since we've had very many open rules that we're not used to them, so we're not, we're not sure how to work with an open rule, so we do use a lot more time. But give us an open rule. And secondly, I would like to ask that if there is no open rule, to at least give the minority uh, an opportunity for several amendments that we've presented to Mr. Solomon, uh, that he'll present to the committee and give us an opportunity for a motion to recommit with instructions. Mr. Chairman, other than the letter sent to J.O. by Mr. Conyers and Mr. Dingell, do you have any other legislative committees that may be objecting to anything on this bill? I don't believe so. Uh, I think we may still uh, be seeking input from the Public Works Committee on this minor provision that allows the architect of the Capitol to, to uh, work on behalf of the Library of Congress to find this off-site storage facility, uh, but it's only a one-year extension of that authority, and they provided uh, a checkoff on that last year, and I hope they will again. We're not uh, asking them to change permanent law. It's just that uh, they can do the job a lot more quickly and efficiently than GSA can do it under the circumstances. I hope we heard positively from them. Okay. Mr. Derrick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a, a, no questions, just to say that I know that this is a hard and arduous task to bring this even to this point, and I suspect uh, we have difficulties ahead yet to be dealt with, but thank you both for your hard work. It's something that probably doesn't have too high a profile out there, we hope, but uh, it's hard work, and thank you. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Mr. Solomon. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I've already... Uh, commended the two gentlemen uh, testifying before us uh, and another gentleman sitting behind them uh, who uh, preceded uh, Mr. Young, uh, Mr. Jerry Lewis, uh, who worked with Mr. Fazio for many, many years in, in one of the toughest, uh, I think, subcommittees uh, in the Appropriations Committee and in the Congress. And uh, I would just like to, if I might, uh, submit the statement of our Republican leader, Bob Michael, uh, for the record, without his consent. And uh, Mr. Michael uh, 
says in his letter in calling for the traditional open rule, which uh, you gentlemen in the past have uh, taken to the floor and, uh, and uh, have worked diligently and, uh, and justified the expenditures and, uh, and the House uh, had the opportunity to work its will. Uh, Mr. Michael, in uh, the fourth and fifth paragraph of his letter, says, but what is to be afraid of amendments that cut appropriation bills? If the numbers cannot be justified or defended, they should be changed. And we should not be afraid to face these amendments because they are politically difficult. Any legislator worth his salt will be able to cast tough votes and not worry about them because the vote is justified. And Mr. Fazio, you, you in particular, uh, you've certainly done yeoman work over the years in justifying uh, those expenditures. I guess that's one of the reasons why we, we all admire and respect you. Uh, concerning funding levels for Congress, and I don't mean to get into debating the bill here in the Rules Committee, and I won't do that, but uh, Mr. Fazio, just for instance, you mentioned that uh, uh, you were critical of maybe a, a MEDAX approach mm -hmm. of a 25 percent cut uh, across the board, and uh, there is some justifi justification to that. Mr. Michael recognized that on our opening day, as a matter of fact, when we presented our rules changes to the uh, House of Representatives, we recommended a 10 percent cut per year for three years, uh, using some of the justifications that, uh, that you've just stated. Uh, so I guess the point I'm trying to make is this. In your letter, Mr. Fazio, you say that you respectfully request an appropriate rule. And uh, you didn't uh, uh, define that as such, but I think Mr. Young did when he said that uh, we have almost 25 percent new members in this body, both Republicans and Democrats. Many of, uh, uh, of those freshmen campaign uh, on reform and cutting the cost of Congress. And those members should have the right to, to make their case on the floor. It's the only place where they can make their case because there is no, legis no, no authorizing committee. And that's why I just strongly support the open rule, and I hope that you will too. Uh, so that the House can work its will. And uh, I, for one, am going to vote against some of those amendments uh, uh, because they might be meat acts. Uh, but uh, again, we need to let the House work its will. So having said all that, let me just commend both of you for coming before the committee. And we wish you well on the floor uh, later this week. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, too, welcome these, these two gentlemen, as you all do. They're two of the of the finest and hardest working members uh, of the Congress, and they, and they do us proud. Um, whatever we end up doing today, quite obviously, I suppose there'll be some discussion on the floor and some votes on some of these particular measures that, and amendments that members from both parties wish to, to offer. I, I'd just like to take a moment at the, at the outset uh, to say something which I feel very deeply, and I'm sure the members do too, but the public needs to be aware of it every now and then too. I think in many respects, that we're the most we're the most valuable branch of the Congress and certain of, of the of the um, of the government, and certainly the one that's closest to the people. Uh, people back home have to understand that. I mean, I was just back there for eight or nine or ten days, I guess it was, as many of you were. Um, if they didn't have us going back, if they didn't have us having town meetings and meetings in our offices, people would have no no close personal relationship with the government. They don't have it with the executive branch. They don't have it with the judiciary branch. They don't have it with the bureaucrats. Uh, people want to cut franking privileges, which, is, which I understand. Uh, but if we didn't have the, the frank available, we wouldn't be able to mail out notices to town hall meetings. And when you don't mail out notices, nobody comes because they don't read notices of the newspapers. And I've had the experience over the past week and a half, as many of you have, of having several town hall meetings with two to 300 people at each one of them. I found them to be extremely useful to me in terms of learning what's going on back there, and I hope useful to the people back there, because I had a chance to talk directly to, for two hours, two and a half hours in some instances, uh, to, some, to the person who represents them. The only connection they have with the federal government, they can complain about it and yell about it and not be happy about things, but at least here with us in our relatively modest sized districts, they're getting bigger and bigger, but compared to Senate districts, certainly they're, they're more modest sized, they're smaller. They have a chance to really have some effect on, on all of us. People want to cut salaries by 25 percent or the size of the Congress by 25 percent. And, you know, if that, so be it, if that's what's going to happen. But people should understand that, at least in our office, and I suspect in your offices too, that, that 80 to 85 percent of the salaries are paid to men and women in our district offices and here whose 
almost 100% of whose time is taken up by responding to and, and trying to be helpful to constituents, either helping them with their social security problems or their military benefit problems or, or trying to get passports when they, you know, when otherwise they won't get them in time. And even more so, of course, in terms simply of answering their phone calls and, and, and responding to their letters. I think I've got about two and a half or three staff people out of the 15 or 16 I have, both at, at home in California and here, who really, you know, just work for me. The rest of them spend the vast majority of their time, as they should, and as is, you know, as is necessary and proper, um, as I said, answering phone calls and, and, and helping me respond to people back home. Uh, quite clearly, if we, cut our, if we cut our staffs by any sizable extent, we're going to be less responsive. We're going to, by necessity, have to be less responsive to the people whom, whom re we represent. So there, I, I understand, you know, we all understand what's going on these days and how people feel about their government and how they want us to cut budgets and so on. And that, that's perfectly understandable and laudable, at least in theory. Uh, I just want to throw out a cautionary note at the beginning that uh, we do represent something very special here terms of people's connections with a government which, which in many respects continues to grow further and further away from them. We're the, the last bastion of, of closeness in some respects people have to, to Washington. And I, I just would like to caution us all not to, not to take any steps which would make us uh, seem even further away or, or less responsive. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Mr. Quillen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to join my colleagues on the committee for their commendations to both of these fine gentlemen. They do their homework and they're Trojans carrying the banner for us. It isn't easy. You know, the perception of the general public is when they bring this bill to the floor, it only deals with the legislative branch, the House of Representatives. And there, the public has an idea that we can cut uh, the franking privileges, we can cut the salaries, we can cut everything that d goes into the operation of the House of Representatives. And cut we must, but I don't think we can cut it all. But that's the perception of the general public. And you all have done a Trojan job in bringing a bill with cuts to us today and I hope that it can go to the floor without too much controversy. I know everybody has amendments that they want to offer, and I'd like to see them have that opportunity. But admittedly, all of the amendments that will be offered will not be adopted. And the members have that privilege of voting for or against. So I don't know what we can do to calm the the uh, surge of public opinion against the legislative branch. I think to a degree we're at fault. First day of, uh, of uh, the, the Congress, we voted to eliminate the, the cost of living, pay raise for members of the House. The Senate did likewise, uh, and the Senate. It's always to hammer away at the legislative logjam, at the legislative branch here in the House of Representatives. I commend the public for that, but I don't think they really understand what's going on. Uh, Mr. Fazio, you've explained that there are other uh, agencies uh, included in this appropriation bill. I think we should stress that more often than we do, that it not only is the operation of House of Representatives, but it branches out into other agencies. When we do that, and should we do that, and should we get it open to, over to the public, I think it would be easier sledding for us here in the Congress. About 40 percent of this bill, Mr. Quillen, doesn't directly uh, benefit the Congress, the House and the Senate. Well, I think we need to get that out, and I'm glad to hear you point that out. And I'm glad this is going to be on C-SPAN. We should do it more often. We know, as the gentleman from California said, we need to communicate with our constituents. And we shouldn't eliminate everything that we have here to accomplish that goal. But we can do it uh, with all of the agencies, and we must have cost-cutting. We know that. 
cost cutting without increase in taxes. But we won't get into that argument today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Krillin. Uh, I have a uh, statement to submit from the record from one of the authorizing committees uh, that control your appropriations committee. In fact, there are three or four authorizing committees that deal with your committee. So you do have authorizing committees. You're, you're not alone being an authorizing appropriations committee, as Mr. Solomon alluded to, are you? Well, that's not our intent, Mr. Chairman. However, uh, sometimes people come to see us rather than the people who truly have jurisdiction. Would the gentleman yield? Uh, Love to you. Uh, the point I was making uh, that I alluded to was that there is no authorization bill, so there is no opportunity for the House or a committee to work its will, and that's uh, that. Therein lies the problem. That's why we we have to justify that by dealing with an appropriation. Every appropriations committee, of course, has a mix of authorizing committees. Uh, there's no one authorizing committee for each appropriations committee. Right. There'll always be a mix, and we have that mix. Well, this is from one of the authorizing committees uh, objecting to the point of uh, waiver, the point of order against Section 306B uh, in the bill. Which committee is it? That's Government Ops. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Frost. Uh, Mr. Fazio, I have a a technical question, but it's an important question. Um, and it deals with how we define the rule, what's an open rule, what's not. Uh, and in an appropriations bill, um, and technically an open rule, as I understand it, would mean that members could offer cuts on the floor, but they could not offer what is called legislation in an appropriations bill. That would, the uh, legisl amendments that attempt, attempt to underwrite existing law would not be under, in order under a, an open rule. We would have to grant waivers of, above and beyond an open rule to permit those type of matters to be made in order. Is that correct? That's my understanding. You know the rules a lot better than I, but I think that's the, the way they would uh, be interpreted. And, and my follow-on to that is the, the chairman of the full appropriations committee, Mr. Natcher, it's my understanding, is taking the position not only as to your bill but as to other appropriation bills that he doesn't want uh, us to grant waivers to permit uh, what would be term, uh, legislative amendments on appropriation bills. And if I understood your testimony that you will be seeking waivers for certain amendments, you're not taking the same position as Mr. Natcher that there shouldn't be any legislative amendments uh, made in order by waiver. Well, as you've heard, the chairman uh, reiterate his phone conversation with Mr. Natcher. I think he has supported what uh, we brought here. But in general, I think Mr. Natcher feels that the authorizing committees have had their territory, their turf, impinged upon too often in the past by the appropriations process. Uh, this is a particularly frequent occurrence in the other body where so often members have subcommittees on appropriations and committees that authorize that are overlapping in jurisdiction. I think we could cite, and I won't at the moment, a number of instances where people have been authorizing uh, on legislative uh, appropriation, on appropriations bills when, um, in effect, they are controlling the entire subject matter. And that's a serious problem. Our committee would like to uh, do less of that, do as little as possible. I think the, uh, the general rule has been for this subcommittee that we are only going to proceed on authorizations when we have the complete support of the Committee of Jurisdiction. And generally, we've had that, particularly your Committee on House Administration. Well, there may be other appropriations bills that come before this committee in which the authorizing chairman uh, approve of the granting of a waiver for legislative language. Uh, that's why I raised the question even though Mr. Natcher may, be, may prefer that those amendments not be made in order, this may not be the only bill that comes before us where an authorizing chairman says he'd like to see a particular amendment made in order. And we may face this. Whatever we do on your bill will have implications on other appropriation bills that we will deal with during this month. It, your bill doesn't stand alone and apart. Uh, we're not dealing with it as a separate entity, but as one of 13 appropriation bills which may, in fact, uh, uh, provide us some guidance on how to deal with appropriation matters generally when they come before us in the next month. There's a certain irony. Uh, you know, we are occasionally pillared in uh, public for having taken the step of legislating in lieu of an authorizing committee, but very often we do it at their request or to accommodate them. Mm -hmm. They're not interested in bringing a major authorization mm -hmm. in a given year, but they don't want anomalies in the law to go unattended. So we often 
provide a relief mechanism, and I think that probably will continue to be the case. Well, I only make the point, to the extent that we do this for Mr. Fazio, we may perhaps uh, be asked to do it or want to do it for some of the other appropriation bills that come before us. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me uh, join in welcoming these two fine members of Congress here. And I'd like to follow on with some of the remarks that were made by my California colleague, Mr. Bielenson. He's absolutely right. We are the first branch of government, the branch which is clearly most responsive to the needs of the American people. Uh, we stand for election every two years. And it's obvious that providing the wherewithal to communicate and respond to constituent needs should be a top priority. The only thing I'd say is that there is a sense among the people whom I represent, and I sense that maybe some of my colleagues may have heard the same thing, that uh, by virtue of having 38,507 employees in the legislative branch, uh, we may have in some way insulated ourselves from those constituents whom we hope to represent. So I would argue that, that uh, some cutbacks, possibly even further than the committee has uh, as uh, proposed, would be in order so that we can become more responsive individually to those needs. Now, uh, we do need a staff. I'm not saying that we should eliminate our staff, but we're allowed 18 full-time and four part-time staff members in our personal offices. We have a tremendous number of committee staff who, in large part, um, from what I've found, work uh, on a, a lot of personal uh, member office items. So I think that that uh, by making some of the cuts that are going to be proposed in amendments here, that we will, in fact, enhance our opportunity to achieve the goal to which Mr. Bielenson referred, that of being more responsive to our constituents. I would like to, uh, to raise one particular issue, uh, Vic, which has been of, of concern to me. You know, we've witnessed over the past several years the proliferation of so-called legislative service organizations. And these are uh, vehicles which uh, members used to establish certain caucuses, most of which are very well-intentioned, and yet they utilize uh, dollars that come from our personal office accounts uh, without the kind of uh, accountability that exists in those office accounts when, dollars, when funds are appropriated there. The reason I, I uh, raise this is that uh, Jerry Solomon raised the, the uh, Joint Committee on the Organization of Congress. Pat Roberts, uh, provided very compelling testimony before our Joint Committee on the Organization of Congress on this whole issue of, of legislative service organizations, the proliferation of them, and the funding which comes from our uh, office accounts. And I wondered what propose, how you respond uh, to the proposals to uh, dramatically cut back on those LSOs. Well, I, I, I first of all would want to remind the committee that last year we uh, initiated work with the GAO to standardize accounting procedures for all LSOs. We were concerned that, that the accounting wasn't always top drawer, wasn't always uh, done in the manner that I think the public interest involved in these uh, requires. And so the GAO has come forward with accounting principles that are going to be, I believe, standard for all of the LSOs. So there'll be no question about uh, any kind of uh, inappropriate or misuse of funds. Uh, I believe the authorizing committee under the uh, leadership of Mr. Gadenson, who I believe has a subcommittee of jurisdiction, is presenting to the House sometime in the near future a comprehensive approach to handling LSOs. And so while I know there are people who would like to bring amendments to the floor at this time, and I'm certain we'll discuss it, uh, I think we probably would be best advised to leave this very uh, difficult subjects that affect so many members in both parties for a, a comprehensive and thorough review with adequate time for debate that uh, an authorizing bill would provide. So I would hope that we wouldn't do any more at this time uh, in this area. I know Mr. Roberts uh, will have a lot to say as a member of the House Administration Committee about how that's formulated and I'm sure I have a lot to say during the debate on that legislation. I'm not sure of uh, a time frame when it will come to the floor, but I know Mr. Gadenson and the full committee uh, is proceeding quickly to bring this before the House, and I've asked him to be prepared to comment uh, on the rule or 
in general debate on this issue because glad, I know members feel strongly about it. I'm glad it. that they are going to be moving on it. I will say that, that Pat Roberts has for years pursued this issue. We've done a great deal of research, and I would uh, recommend that you and, and your staff take a look at the uh, compelling testimony which he provided before our Joint Committee on the Organization of Congress because he does have some very worthwhile proposals, and I'm going to support his effort here to get an amendment included in this bill. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Gordon of Tennessee. As I go across, Mr. Chairman, as I go across the district, having open meetings, a number of my constituents are saying that we've got to get the deficit down. There's got to be more efficiency in government and more cuts in government. Uh, along with Mr. Goss and others, I propose a variety of, of specific cuts, and I think that as we go through this legislative process, we're going to hopefully see many of those implemented. And so I want to compliment the committee uh, for coming forward with uh, a 25 percent goal to reduce the legislative uh, branch. Certainly, we're going to be making cuts around in other parts of government. The legislative branch needs to be. Uh, I understand that last year um, uh, we cut the legislative branch by over 6 percent, that you're proposing an additional 6 percent or over 6 percent this year. And I hope then that we'll see the same trend for the next two years so that we'll have an orderly progression of reducing the legislative branch by uh, 25 percent. And I compliment you on getting us on this track. Mr. Goss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, too, welcome uh, the distinguished gentleman from the Sunshine States. Uh, I think it's very appropriate that as we just deal with this that we have the Sunshine so well represented. And I'm particularly happy to see the leader of the Florida delegation here, from, which I'm proud to be a part of. Um, I think uh, this, uh, this uh, step that you all have made is very good. Uh, it's, it's a little bit along the Willie Sutton philosophy. Uh, it's where the fat is, cut it. Uh, and I believe uh, that is exactly what we're seeing and why the 25 percent uh, target is appropriate. When I left Washington in, nine, in the late 60s, I believe the average uh, Congress staff was seven. Uh, it is now three times that for not counting committee staff. Uh, and the size of the districts hasn't changed notably. Uh, I guess what that means is there's been a whole lot better service uh, by every uh, Congress, uh, congressional office uh, to the constituency. But I'm not sure the people know that yet. Um, it, my question, uh, I've got a couple of technical questions. The first is uh, on the, um, I guess, uh, for Mr. Fazio, in the cuts that are being proposed uh, in the approach you're presenting, uh, do you have any, any percentage breakdown between the cuts that are being assigned to congressional operations as opposed to the percentage of the cuts that are being assigned to the other government agencies that are being cut in this process? We have taken about a uh, across-the-board approach in the sense of asking for 1.1 percent in budget authority to be reduced in I the saw that, yes. adjacent uh, service agencies, but we've asked the uh, the House operations to be cut too. I think it's about nine million in total. We're expecting committees to be affected. We're expecting individual members to be affected, and we're expecting the uh, employees of the clerk and other institutions that serve us all to be affected. Now, we're leaving jurisdiction to the House Administration Committee. We're not determining in this bill exactly where these cuts need to occur, but we anticipate all of the types of entities that serve the members and the committees and the institution to be affected. We didn't want anyone to be immune. Uh, we got a misleading headline, I believe, in uh, the recent roll call, uh, which uh, emphasized reductions at GPO and the Library of Congress and the GAO because they will have this early out uh, or retirement incentive provision apply to them. And we don't have that because we thought it it would be best to experiment with it in the more structured agencies. We're not providing those sorts of uh, in retirement incentives for our own employees, but uh, we are going to be <coughs> making reductions. Um, we are going to have to uh, find Tony. places to cut and people to eliminate. And this will have to continue for us to live up to the standards that we agreed to in statute here, which are the same as the executive order of the president which reduces both staffing and overhead in the executive branch. We have agreed to do the same here over time. I hadn't been able to review the materials uh, and, and do these numbers myself to make sure that the percentage, the proportionate cut 
was uh, fairly distributed. I understand the intent is there. That's there. And uh, as long as that intent is there, and you can assure me of that on the public for record. For example, there's $2 million less for committees in the coming year than there was in the last year. Now, how that's allocated, of I course, is that. up to them. I, I, my, my breakdown, of course, is between congressional operation and the other agencies. The uh, in, in technical questions, uh, I uh, saw a draft uh, of a uh, reference uh, language to a former speaker's bill, which is a bill that I've been personally involved with with some time, as you know, and I understand both sides of the aisle and the freshman class are interested. Uh, can you advise, was that made in order in this legislation or not? Uh, what are, what's the status of that? Mr. Goss, uh, I know of your staunch advocacy of change in this area. You've had a number of your colleagues come across the desk of most of us. I know there are other members mm -hmm. who agree that this is something that needs to be attended to. It's obviously a very sensitive issue because <clears throat> it affects uh, various retired members differently. Some are active and still uh, very much part of public life. Others are uh, in much greater retirement in terms of their active contribution to public policy debates and in general uh, uh, good government kinds of activities. I think there are people who feel there's a certain um, need to look at former presidents and former speakers to some degree, at least as it relates to personnel and to office expenses in a similar manner. But I do think you have won the debate in the sense that there are people who believe that the uh, opportunity for these kinds of expenditures goes on too long. And I'm aware of the uh, possibility of an amendment being brought here and perhaps made an order by the committee that will attempt to deal with this in a way that would be hopefully uh, an accommodation of the bipartisan leadership perspective and uh, something that would, I hope, bring this issue to a close. I'll leave to the authors uh, the details of that, but I certainly understand the need to proceed on it. And I think uh, the reason we've come here is because it was felt that it would be something more appropriately done on the floor. I appreciate the gentleman's comments very much on that, and I, I share your view, incidentally, on the former presidents, and you will have my support on that for any reasonable uh, limitations. That should come before you and the Treasury bill, assuming they come to the committee. The uh, final question I have, Mr. Chairman, very brief. Uh, you've requested uh, the waiver of uh, Clause 7 uh, the, of Rule 21, the three-day layover. Uh, is there uh, any particular uh, reason for that particular request? Well, we simply wanted to bring our bill to the floor. Uh, and dispatch it, and move on. And uh, no, I, I think I, everyone I, feels that uh, that may be an appropriate way to proceed in order to, to get on to the other work that we have to do, knowing that this bill will be setting a good example for the other 12. But Mr. General, Chairman, I might respond to that also. We have no objection on. to that at all. Uh, we, Excuse me? We have no objection to that request at all. We support that request. I'd right, happy to yield the gentleman, gentleman Tennessee. Yield. Well, I, I, we didn't do anything yesterday on the floor. We're going to be here about an hour today. We you, could have a more uh, and you busy bring afternoon bill up on, a, on a Thursday. Yeah. We'll have a very busy Thursday. Well, I just the point I want to make is to both of you on why to, to rush it in the closing hours of the week. Was there any reason you couldn't request a rule before today? Well, I, I think we've been moving as quickly as we could this week uh, from full committee to the rules process and onward. You know, there's an old saying, work expands to fill the time allotted. I, I realize you and don't... We would set like to allot a certain amount of time and... I realize work. you don't set, set the schedule on the floor, but... Yes. And we just marked up in the full committee yesterday. Yesterday oh, afternoon. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank we you. Mr. Right. Chair, I wonder if I can make one comment Mr. before yeah. I think we have a vote on the floor. Right. Uh, I work on the Defense Appropriations Committee and the Education and Health uh, Human Services Committee, the two biggest parts of our budget. When you compare what we're presenting today with those two budgets, you could cancel this and you could, you could kill this bill and you wouldn't affect the national debt because it is a very minor part of our overall spending. But a number of the items covered by this bill are symbolic and the members of the Congress and especially the freshman members have made pledges to try to do something about some of these things and whether we are going to agree with them or not, I think they have a right to make their arguments and, and make their case on the floor. And the arguments that Mr. Bielenson made and Mr. Derrick made and Mr. Solomon 
Mr. Quillen, Mr. Dreyer, and Mr. Goss all made are very good arguments, but they are arguments that should be made on the floor so that, that all of our constituents can hear those arguments. And with a closed rule, they're not going to hear them. So I think that, that, that everything that, that your members have said today uh, argue for an open rule. Thank, thank, you very, thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. You're all done. Uh, you didn't, yeah. you didn't mean to cut you off. No, I, I, no, I thought when you said thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Young. Uh, if uh, the chair will be in a very, I'll just get down and vote and come right back, so I wouldn't wish that anybody had moved too much. You reprimand your other members, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I will also be brief. I appreciate the opportunity to testify before you, and I specifically am doing so as one of the co-chairs of the Northeast Midwest Coalition. I speak for myself here this morning, but ours, as you know, is a bipartisan group of more than 90 members representing 18 states. And we're very concerned, um, and I would like to register my opposition to the amendment that may be proposed by Mr. Roberts to eliminate uh, legislative service organizations. And um, I'll submit my full testimony for the record. Without and, objection, uh, the entire statement the young lady will be submitted to the record. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and members. I really don't think that this is the appropriate manner in which to deal with the issue of LSOs. And there's been a little discussion earlier this morning about the current work of the House Administration Committee. And uh, they are expected to report from the information that I have uh, around um, uh, June 15th, and I'm not sure when they are going to make the recommendations on LSOs, but it is very soon. Uh, it is my understanding. We would prefer that the LSO issue wait until uh, that committee completes its work. Let me just um, also mention that in terms of our own operations um, and the Roberts Amendment, not one dime of taxpayer money would be saved in terms of the Northeast Midwest Coalition. Ours is a voluntary organization. Members contribute because of their desire to work together on a regional basis. And in fact, I think we would view his amendment as taking our rights away uh, to work in the type of cohesive manner in which we have uh, for several years now. I think that um, uh, eliminating this particular organization, which provides indispensable information to us, would weaken us uh, as members of Congress, and no one of us out of our budgets can provide the type of, of staffing and research that is necessary that the, that the coalition does. For example, uh, some of you are very aware that um, the coalition is one of the few areas where individuals of both parties can get together and reach commonality on an issue, and for instance, in the CDBG formula design, uh, the coalition was extremely uh, active in that, the development of all of the pollution prevention uh, legislation, uh, the current efforts toward high-speed rail, uh, as well as the competitiveness of the St. Lawrence Seaway system. These are not issues that just one member can work on alone. And so we view the this particular LSO as, uh, as very invaluable to our own work as members. And um, I haven't really heard all of Mr. Mr. Roberts' testimony, but um, I, I did want to uh, point out that we have been audited for several years by the GAO. I was treasurer of the coalition for many, many years, and uh, now I'm one of the co-chairs. And um, our audits have always shown that we have operated uh, under generally accepted accounting procedures, and our reports have all been very good. So I would just ask the committee to seriously consider uh, our request uh, that this particular amendment not be entertained at this time, but be brought up in the context of overall congressional reform when House administration reports. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, how many LSOs are there now in the House, you know? I remember at no one time there were about five or six. I'm sure there's probably about 40 or 50. Oh, yeah. It's in that range. I, I don't. I'm not an expert on all of the LSOs. And uh, there's, no, there's no private 
money out is, is it all volunteer and uh, uh, from the person staff that's right we do have an institute oh here I was just given a list that there are 28 uh, legislative service organizations as of April 1993 and I don't know the history of all of these um, some of them may not be uh, organizations where members take money out of their own accounts in order to to fund them um, I'm sure that the committee is looking at the historical nature of many of these uh, their bipartisanship etc and their success really members don't belong unless they really accomplish something right. and they sure, sure don't take money out of their clerk hire if they're not uh, accomplishing if something. they're not doing something especially with the restraints that have been on us mm -hmm. thank you very much Ms. Kathy. Ms. Kalinson. Mr. Solomon. Let me just commend the gentlelady for coming before us. I worked for many years with her on the Veterans Affairs Committee. She was an outstanding member, and we appreciate her coming. Thank you. You know, I just say to the gentleman that on Memorial Day, we were over at the White House for the signing of the legislation that will now construct a World War II memorial in the right. nation's capital at no cost to the taxpayers. We thank you for your help on that. It was a great day. Thank Director. you. Mr. Quillen. No questions, but uh, just my commendation. You've been very patient today. <laughs> We appreciate it, and they've made it a very, very fine state. Thank you, Mr. Fowler. Thank you, Ms. Kemp. The next uh, witness will be the Honorable Jerry Lewis of California. Mr. Lewis. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and my colleagues. I, I come very briefly uh, uh, simply to reflect my own uh, support for comments already made by members of your committee. The, the Legislative Branch Appropriations Bill uh, in which it was my privilege to be the ranking member for a number of years, does reflect the funding of the People's House uh, as well as the other body when they get to about putting money in, in the, the legislative proposal. Uh, having said that, there's, there's little doubt that uh, there's been a significant shift in the public's attitude in recent years about uh, its institutions, including the Congress, and, and that's reflected often on the debate on the floor. Over the years uh, that I've worked with this bill, uh, the Rules Committee has chosen largely to have an open rule. And, and it's done so in no small part because uh, it is the one opportunity the people have to be heard by their representatives relative to their attitude about not only the, the funding of the legislative branch, but, but much of the work that it does. Uh, as, as a matter of fact, on my side of the aisle, we have often uh, almost used this legislative uh, vehicle as a mechanism whereby newer members uh, got experience in the amendment process, if you will. And, and it really has not harmed the institution whatsoever. Those debates have been very healthy. Uh, the amendments that have been proposed have, have largely reflected the will of the House, and, and the House has been willing to weigh very carefully its own view about the need for funding for the institution. Uh, last year, we made a, an exception to that with, with a, a limited closed rule. It, it seems to me that that we must be very careful as we go down that path as it relates not just to appropriations bills generally, but especially this measure. Uh, I, I understand uh, that, that you will be considering uh, a limited rule this year because of some very specific provisions. I would urge you, Mr. Chairman and, and, and Jerry, to, to think this through with your staff and you individually, uh, along with our Chairman Vic Fazio, about whether we want to continue this pattern. Uh, for, for indeed, uh, it, it, it is a pathway that sets a precedent that, that, if compounded, could essentially have the legislative branch end up being a closed process on the floor. Uh, we have, I would uh, suggest again, we have very delicate matters that involve the institution, but it is the people's institution. And for a full decade now, we've been very successful at having an open debate on the floor that's been healthy, I think, for the institution in the final analysis. This rule this year that's being proposed and no part comes on the heels of a significant shift of public mood in which they want to take on their government, but especially the Congress. And, and the committee operates in some fear of, of an overreaction on the part of the general membership that, that could lead to excessive amendment. I would suggest that our past experience uh, would indicate that the House, in the final analysis, will deal with itself pretty well in connection with that. So I urge you to to, uh, as you go forward with an appropriate rule this year that, that you have to, to make your own judgments about in just the, the hours and days ahead, I'd urge you to, to talk with the chairman as well as uh, your own staff and the committee staff about what kind of precedent we want to set here so that in the future 
uh, we can go about getting on another path, that is, open rules for all Appropriations Committee and, and let the debate to go forward uh, with the, pu the public's uh, full ability to have input regarding its legislative branch. Mr. Chairman, let me say to my very good friend Jerry Lewis, uh, we really do appreciate your, your sage advice. Uh, I say sage because uh, you came here, I think, 15 years ago, I think with Mr. Bielenson and myself in a, in a very, very large class. And uh, your, uh, uh, your thoughtful comments over the years uh, have really helped to make this a better institution. And uh, you certainly did carry the water on the, that subcommittee for, for so many years. And uh, I just want to... Uh, say that you are so right, because I can recall the first year we, we, we came here. Uh, it was the year after Jimmy Carter, President Jimmy Carter, had de-recognized uh, the Republic of China on Taiwan. And uh, we had a rule come to the floor, uh, an open rule, which allowed us to uh, have a free and open debate to write the Taiwan Relations Act. And what that did uh, was to protect the Republic of China and Taiwan against the communist aggressors on the mainland. And um, even myself as a freshman uh, had the opportunity to offer amendments that day successfully. And uh, we wrote a very strong bill, and it was a bipartisan bill. And uh, I cannot think of any piece of legislation in the past 15 years that has uh, uh, been uh, adversely affected by an open rule. Because when the House allows itself to work its will, you usually come up with the best legislation. And that's really why I think what you're saying here, and it echoes what our good Republican leader, Bob Michael, has uh, said before. Uh, so having said that, I appreciate you coming before us, and thank you. Uh, thank you. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your courtesy, and I want you to know that, that I, too, express my support, uh, as well as my appreciation for the work of the chairman and the ranking member. It's a very difficult bill. But, but that pathway that, that I suggest we ought to to consider and revisit, perhaps, uh, would, would be very helpful to the process. And I think Chairman Fazio would be very, uh, would very much welcome that, that sort of discussion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Quillen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Jerry, uh, you have uh, echoed a responsive core. The perception of the public is that this is our bill. The House of Representatives, the legislative branch of the House of Representatives, they don't consider all of the other agencies involved. We've got a selling job to do. And if we do that, then we've got to let these members have a say on the floor of the House. So I commend you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. Quillen. Mr. Dreyer. Mr. Garth. Sentiments which I also echo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, yield. I would be happy to yield. Yeah. yeah, you know, I'm just reading an article that was in the Washington Post here today, and uh, the headline says, Clinton yields on energy tax. President drops BTU levy, asks senators for alternative. Remember the debate we had in this committee on an open rule which would allow Bob Michael, our Republican leader, to offer that amendment to wipe out that BTU tax? You know, if that had been allowed, we'd have had the debate on the floor under an open rule. Uh, that would have become law. We probably would have had a budget uh, and a reconciliation signed into law by now. Well, Mr. Solomon, I, let me respond by saying I'm not here to, to pass judgment on the fine work of the Rules Committee generally regarding uh, rules they, they choose to pass uh, that protect some measures and, and not others. Uh, but in terms of the legislative branch, I think my colleague Bill Young said it very, very well. You could take our defense subcommittee, on which he and I serve mutually, uh, this bill does not reflect a drop in the ocean in terms of real expenditure compared to that, but it is the people's house. It's the one place where their views and attitudes about the institution can be reflected in the debate. And the institution has cared for itself extremely well as it's dealt with amendments in the past. I'd suggest that we allow that process to go forward in the future. And, and discussing the precedent that we may have been setting in the last couple of years uh, is very important. Mr. Chairman, may I reclaim my time? I thought, I thought you gave up your time. I yielded to, oh, yielded to Mr. Solomon, if I may. I had one question that I want to ask you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The point, I think you've touched on something very important. Uh, it probably only in Washington could you say $1.7 uh would be a drop. Uh, and that is the kind of problem that we have. 
uh, and while we're dealing with a trillion and a half budget, indeed 1.7 billion is a very, very small part of that. Uh, but it's a very a big perception out there that Congress takes better care of itself than the people that it represents, as the gentleman from California has uh, so well stated before. And I've got one question for you. Do you believe that even with this step towards reducing legislative appropriation that we are doing here today, that we have reduced and taken out and excised all of the waste, low priority, unnecessary, uh, or redundancy that is included under the area of legislation appropriations? I have yet to see any subcommittee report of the Appropriations Committee in which I did not see remainder uh, uh, opportunity for reduction in spending that I would support. And in this bill, there's not any question there's additional uh, what some would describe as fat that could be trimmed. The legislative branch uh, is the smallest bill of all of our 13, but indeed uh, there are places where it could be cut further. I, I'm pleased the gentleman has uh, responded that way. I feel very strongly the same way, and I think most people in this country believe that even if we make a good start, we certainly have not finished this job. And I think that is the best evidence for an open rule I can give you, because many of our imaginative newer members uh, are going to be looking at things even more uh, even a different perspective than those of us who have been here for a year or two or six or ten or more. Um, and, and they will have suggestions to make. And that's why I think the well, the floor of the House is the place for these kinds of things to go forward. And I thank the gentleman very Mr. much. Mr. Chairman, if I could, in my just closing comments, I might mention, uh, for the member's interest at least, that if you take the newer members who are the most active in this connection, you will find in office and after office on both sides of the aisle that it's the newer members who spend the highest percentages of their overall budget, uh, largely because they're in the process of establishing their offices, buying new computer equipment, et cetera, et cetera. But, but it's, it is interesting to rise on the floor and rail against the institution and, and at the same time spend all the money that uh, the bill provides for an individual office. And that happens time and time again. I know. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Barnard, do you have any questions? and uh, acknowledge his uh, contribution to this process over the years. He's been very helpful. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Terry. <clears throat> the Honorable Timothy Penny, Maria Cantwell, Eric Fingerhut, Eric Palmer. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Gadenson, I didn't see you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm not going to take the a lot of... The Honorable Sam Gadenson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, I'm not going to take a lot of the uh, members' time. I think that... Um, that like in many other areas, I believe that the rules ought to provide structure. Uh, and I know on the floor of the House we can't uh, criticize the other body, uh, but I'm not sure that rule pertains to the uh, Rules Committee. And I would say that if we're not careful, uh, we could look a lot like the other body, where their inability to set structure to passing legislation yeah. ends up creating more chaos uh, and more endless debate rather than really debating the issues. And I think that uh, we ought to make sure that the members of the minority have a opportunity to present a proposal uh, without any question in most instances that uh, clearly this committee has been more than fair I think in every instance in trying to come forward with a responsible product. To that end I would just like to briefly uh, discuss what we've been doing for over a year on the situation with LSOs and we're about to mark up. The reason we haven't marked up is uh, uh, the uh, one of our Republican colleagues had asked that uh, we wait until the GAO report is completed. Subcommittee on Office Systems stands ready to mark up the proposed committee regulations pertaining to legislative service organizations on Wednesday, June 16th. These regulations have been developed over a period of more than a year in consultation with members and LSOs and the Finance Office. I think the important thing to remember here is this is a way for members to get information efficiently rather than each person trying to develop a pool of expertise in a particular area. If you have a district that has a particular need you can pool your resources to deal with defense, environment, or other issues. The only reason the subcommittee, again, has not acted to date is that the ranking member uh, requested that the deliberations concerning this matter be postponed until the General Accounting Office had submitted its final report on accounting standards uh, to the committee. And that report, I might add, was authorized by the conference report accompanying the 1993 legislative branch appropriations. The draft committee on, the draft committee on House administration regulations currently under consideration by the subcommittee represents the farthest reaching reforms ever proposed. Under the draft, the following rules would apply to LSOs. All financial activities of LSOs would be placed 
under the Finance Office. LSO expenditures must conform with regulations that pertain to standing committees. All S LSO employees would be considered House employees subject to provisions of the 1989 Ethics Act, Ethics and Government Act. All financial transactions will be reported in the quarterly report to the clerk. Relationships and transactions that an LSO may have with an affiliate outside group would be disclosed, and the criteria and the certification of LSOs would be tightened. Legislative service organization members are very supportive of this approach. It acknowledges that LSOs provide essential research and legislative services to members in the most cost-effective man manner that a member's office could support. By placing all their financial activities under the office, under the finance office, like all other House entities, any questions regarding the propriety of financial transactions by LSOs would be subject to continuing financial oversight audit. The General Accounting Office released its draft LSO standards and guide disclosure statement on May 6, 1993. According, about a month ago, according to GAO, it spent 42 staff days dedicated to this product. In short, the GAO pr proposes that LSOs adopt an accrual basis of accounting based on the generally accepted accounting principle, which I believe would require every LSO to have a full-time CPA on its staff to properly record every transaction. Under the GAO approach, LAO, LSOs would have to control their own uh, financial accounts and, and authority no other House entity is given. What we do in the House is we move all those uh, responsibilities to the Finance Office. <clears throat> the regulations under consideration by the subcommittee are currently being discussed by the bipartisan staff to identify final areas of concern, but as a whole, these regulations have been developed in consultation with almost every LSO member of the committee, the Office of the Clerk, countless meetings and discussions, the Roberts Amendment undermines hard work, all the hard work, uh, thought and thought and effort that's been placed into crafting a meaningful reform proposal that gives members the, reflex, the flexibility to fulfill their responsibilities to their constituents. And we're going to have to get much better at this because while everybody around here wants to talk about cutting back uh, uh, the, the resources that Congress has to do its job, the challenge is growing. In our office, like many others, we've gotten more than three times the mail. Uh, this year that we'd gotten in previous years, we're going to have to find more and more efficient ways to operate uh, just to stay even. <laughs> Last year, the Rules Committee made a, a Representative Roberts' order amendment, uh, amendment in order. Needless to say, the sponsor did not even request a record vote because it was evident that an overwhelming bipartisan majority of the House did not support his uh, approach. I do not believe it's the best interest of members, especially with so many new members, simply throw this on the floor without a full committee markup and without having uh, the full deliberative process. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Gatterson, for a very, uh, very lucid explanation of uh, the LSOs. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Don't go away. <laughs> no, nothing really, Mr. Chairman, except to, to agree completely with the position taken by our, our friend from Connecticut. Here you have, an, uh, here you have a, uh, an instance where the, the Congress, in a very bipartisan manner, has been completely, I think, from what we know, responsive to an issue that's been brought before us and handling it in a proper way in an authorizing committee. And I think the proper, the proper way is for us to allow them to, to let, their, uh, let their proposal take its course. It'll be before us, as, as we understand it, in the, in the next few weeks. And I think that's a better way of handling these things in a, in a thoughtful and, and sensible way. Uh, and I'd just like to respond to that and just say, that, you know, it gets very frustrating out here in the authorizing committees to do all the work and then to kind of have it dissipate as part of a of a much, you know, larger package. We've put a lot of focus into this. Staff's done a lot of work, and I hope we're given a chance. It'd be a foolish waste of time and of staff time and of GAO time and everybody else's time and effort if we, you know, if we didn't uh, give some protection to the to the efforts of the of the uh, um, authorizing committee. All right, Mr. Solomon. <coughs> Let me just say to the uh, gentleman who I have great respect for, in all due respect, there is no authorizing committee uh, right. dealing with this subject, and that's too bad. Uh, as a matter of fact, I have a, uh, an amendment which I'm coming to this committee to do something I don't like to do, and that is to ask for a waiver of a point of order so that I can legislate in an appropriation bill. If there were an authorizing procedure, uh, I would not be here later on. I'm going to testify, I think, right after uh, the gentleman. Uh, it has to do with random drug testing of, uh, of employees uh, of, the, um, of the Congress. But uh, one thing just bothered me that you said, and that is that members of the minority should be allowed to present a proposal. And, uh, you know, that's all well and good, but you, you didn't mention at all Mr. Tim Penny sitting behind you or Mr. Fingerhood who just walked in the door and a few other freshman Democrats who would like the opportunity to offer very, very 
uh, meaningful amendments that they have had no um, uh, opportunity to have input into the bill. Let me finish. But uh, Mr. Penny's uh, is going to cut 5 percent. Uh, you know, that's not meat acts. Uh, it's not 25 percent or 30 percent. Uh, you know, that's reasonable. And uh, I think the way you could really point this out, just as you were walking out the door, I was pointing to a headline that says, Clinton yields on energy tax, President drops BTU levy. Now, uh, that's a great victory for those of us that come from the cold northeast, for one. But uh, my point is that we had a structured rule like you want with only a Republican proposal allowed. Mr. Bob Michael, our Republican leader, was not allowed to offer that amendment, which 75 percent of the, uh, the whole body, Republicans and Democrats alike, support. And therefore, because he was not allowed to, the bill passed in a form not acceptable to the American people. It went over to the Senate, and it's been languishing. So it wasn't disruption on the floor. It's the disruption it caused over in the Senate because we put out a closed rule and gagged the members of Congress. So there's always two sides to any story. I, I'd say two things. One is I was speaking more generally, but I, I may be showing my bias towards a parliamentary system. I think the problem with our system uh, in this country, in the Senate, is a particular example of that. It's very easy to come up with a process where everybody can have easy votes. And at the end of the day, you have a, 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 a product that government can't operate under. And so I can offer amendments on almost any bill if I'm given kind of the irresponsible ability not to have a total package. And I'm not referring to anybody in this room or any of the present proposals before us as being irresponsible. But clearly, when it comes to a budget bill in particular, I, I could get up and ask people to do away with the income tax. And it'd be very popular. And, and, and there are probably some people out there that think the country would run better without government getting any resources. And then I could get up and say that each community ought to get from the federal government $1,000 per citizen so they could build things. And that would be very popular. And it seems to me that what we have to do and what the Rules Committee and the Rules Chairman has been more than generous in doing is allowing some, some debate in areas where there are constructive and, and, and comprehensive proposals. But if you're not careful in this process, uh, we will end up with a government like many of the governments around the globe where no serious work can be done because the tough answers are difficult. And unless they're done in a package, the only thing you'll get are votes for spending proposals and none for paying for the programs or none for the actual cuts. And so it seems to me one of the great things about the House of Representatives, and it is a great credit to this Rules Committee, is that they do put some discipline in on the Congress. And if you want to get an end product done that has some substance to it uh, and not let two or three oil company states hold the entire country up for ransom, which is what happened over in the Senate. That's not a fight over people. They're talking about taking and raising the taxes on senior citizens so they can protect oil companies. I don't think that's good government, and I think the Senate would be better off if they had a rules committee. That's my own personal view, of course, sir. The gentleman is, is arguing that uh, someone like Mr. Tim Penny, who serves in the majority... I, I'm not discussing this issue, No, uh, no the gentleman just said that uh, he's arguing against the majority of the House. Now, do you really think that if the majority of this House passes an amendment that it's irresponsible? I think the majority of the House speaks for the American people. So I don't think that's, uh, that's irresponsible at all. That's I don't not think what I said, sir. I mean, if you want me to repeat what I said, I guess we could get the snogger. What I'm saying is, if we're not careful especially in budgetary and appropriations matters. Amendments can be constructed that, frankly, in the political process we live in, look, look awfully damning in 30-second 30, 30 commercials. But without that kind of responsibility that the Rules Committee imposes on the House, it would be very easy for every member of Congress to vote against all revenue, to vote for every program, and totally destroy this democracy. And I never once mis mentioned Mr. Penny's proposal <laughs> on this uh, amendment, on this bill, or any other. What I'm saying is that I think one of the real problems in the Senate, and it is not a problem we have in the House, is that we have a rules committee that decides some basic bounds for the debate so there's a responsible conclusion of the legislative process. And if we don't have that, we will end up like the Senate, which often puts amendments on bills and then ends up quietly in conference committee getting rid of them. We end up like the Senate, where one senator stands up and has oil companies in his state uh, that he takes out that provision that affects oil companies, and now they're talking about cutting the benefits to senior citizens. I don't think that's good public policy either. So, again, nothing that I've spoken about here refers to Mr. Penny or any of these other gentlemen's amendments. Uh, the, the Rules Committee will judge whether they believe they're meritorious enough to be heard in the full House debate. 
What I'm talking about is the principle of having a process by which a legislative body puts some limits on the amendments that it considers on the floor that makes those amendments deal in a responsible manner with our own responsibilities. Well, I would just say to the gentleman, I have a lot more, uh, I think, faith in the, uh, in, the, in the majority of this body uh, casting a vote uh, over what they think is responsible. I think that uh, Democrats and Republicans alike, I don't know of any of them in this body that are irresponsible. And I think they ought to be allowed their day in uh, court to work their will to represent their 587,000 people the same as uh, I do or you do. And uh, when you said that members of the Marty, majority, minority should be allowed to present one proposal, uh, then we have to disagree with you. I think that not only should Republicans be allowed, but Democrats as well. There's some good Democrat amendments that have been put before us here. And we and hope I to hope get you to vote for good Democratic amendments well, when they arrive. I have the in floor. the past, and I will in the future. Thank the gentleman for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to send, extend a very warm welcome to you, Sam, and say how very happy we are to have you here in the Rules Committee. Uh, we were focusing on legislative service organizations, and before you came, I had an exchange with Chairman Fazio on this issue. And uh, it seems to me that, that, that it really is not a new question which has come before us. I referred to the fact that uh, Pat Roberts testified before the committee of which you're a member, the Joint Committee on the Organization of Congress, which is charged with bringing about major reform of this institution. Mm -hmm. And uh, he makes a very compelling case. I've seen his staff members come into the room uh, today, and they have those charts. They are going to, uh, Pat in his testimony is going to be uh, outlining his concerns with legislative service organizations. The fact that, that we have seen members of Congress take funds from their office accounts and provide them to legislative service organizations. And while there has been some improvement in the accountability, uh, the past performance where there has been uh, what, what Pat Roberts has referred to as a major scandal brewing is one which I think we need to address uh, sooner rather than later. Now, you've stated the date that you've got your plans for your markup of legislation. But frankly, Pat Roberts, is he not a member of the uh, authorizing committee? Well, according to Mr. Solomon, there is no authorizing yeah. committee. I'm not ready to argue the facts that he's a member of the House Administration He's committee. a member of the House Administration we'll Committee. We'll mark that up. Yeah, he's a member of the House Administration Committee. So it seems to me that he has been intimately involved with the question of legislative service organizations and the problems. Now, if you, if you, had, uh, if you had seen his testimony before the Joint Committee on the Organization of Congress, it was very compelling. And I suspect the arguments that he'll be making uh, here today will be also very compelling. Uh, I hope that we make his amendment in order. I happen to believe, as Mr. Solomon does, that we should provide members who represent 600,000 Americans the opportunity to at least have their ideas heard here. Yes, the Rules Committee should restrict amendments in some cases, but not in as many cases as we have done it. And I hope very much that we'll provide an opportunity for members to be heard in an open rule on this. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I just say, uh, uh, gentlemen, I don't disagree with much of what he said. I think that's what the Rules Committee is for. You've got to pick the rules. I've made the argument against it, uh, including this one in a bill uh, when we're taking the very same matter up uh, within a couple of days. And I'd say that I'd look at LSOs the way I look at staff people. Uh, there have been some staff people on the Hill who haven't done their jobs, and either the member, uh, you know, fired them, or if the member didn't do it and it came to other people's attention, I imagine there was another remedy uh, for removing those individuals, but they didn't. Uh, take it out on every staff person in the Congress. Uh, the LSOs are basically a jointly used staff person. And uh, have every one of those operated perfectly? I'd say absolutely uh, not. I think our bill will make yeah. it work as well as you can have human beings work, and the rest is our oversight responsibility. No, table. Table. Uh, Mr. Boyner, no questions. Mr. Goss. Thank you. I welcome the gentleleman from the Thames River Valley, and uh, I'm very nice pleased to, to see hear. my friend from across the water. I'm pleased to be here. And, uh, <laughs> I, uh, he I tends to visit. He's from the South, but he visits us occasionally I've, I've up I've passed north. through many times, That's and it's right. a truly great part of our nation and well represented. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> I would like to, uh, <laughs> in most aspects. <laughs> I was going to leave at that point. The, the aspect that I want to talk about today is I, I'm pleased that, uh, very pleased that you are going to be producing a product because there's no question in my district, and I suspect as well in your district, that the LSO question uh, is a much lower priority on people's minds uh, than, say, jobs or the economy and other matters. Uh, and people would like to see that disposed of. It has become a little bit symbolic. Uh, and I think that today is an opportunity to, di to discuss it. Uh, I think you've made a very uh, ardent defense for your work product, and I look forward to that work product. 
I don't think that is going to dampen the enthusiasm out there, though, uh, to approach it from different ways. But I'm pleased to know that uh, there are responsible conclusions uh, from your efforts, and I look forward to seeing them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Hall. Uh, what you're arguing for is, is a chance to review not only what GAO has come out with, with but what do we do in the future about LSOs. And I, you know, here again, uh, as I, and I didn't hear Pat Roberts' uh, amendment, but I suspect what he's asking is eliminate all of them, when in fact there are a heck of a lot of issues here in Congress that, that will not get addressed, but as a result of LSOs probably will. And I speak in terms now of uh, the whole situation with the select committees. I don't want to bring that up again. But one of the things I want to do since, uh, you know, I basically don't trust Congress to address this issue very, very well, is to have an LSO on the whole issue of hunger. That is one way. I'm looking also at another way to do it. But, you know, well, if, you're going to eliminate, if you're going to eliminate that, then how, how do you get a special issue like hunger really addressed? It's a priority issue. But here again, this is an amendment to, to, in a broad brush to sweep them all out. Why don't you just pick and choose and have the guts to say, I don't like this, I don't like that, let's eliminate it, but let's keep this. The gentleman yield on that point. I've noticed here, from having uh, taken a glance at the amendments proposed, that Pat Roberts' amendment actually does maintain the Democratic Study Group and the Republican Study Committee, uh, according to this. So I think that there is a degree of flexibility. And in response to the, the uh, question raised by my good friend and former chairman of the Hunger Committee, it seems to me that, that uh, we're not saying that we don't want to focus attention on the issue of hunger. And it's, it also seems to me that you've got an ability to put together an organization that would be independent of the LSO structure. Uh, and I don't know exactly what shape that could take. But the problems of LSOs, I think, has created a situation <clears throat> where we don't want to see U.S. taxpayer dollars that are going by way of the personal offices of members of Congress utilized in the ways that they have in the past. Well, you've got issues like, let's, for example, the Human Rights Caucus. And if you don't have an LSO, you don't have that issue addressed. It's not going to be addressed. Now, you have a subcommittee. They have a private foundation. The Human Rights Caucus has a, a private foundation with which they work very closely on a wide range of issues. And it would seem to me that that might be the best vehicle for us to follow in trying to address these issues. If the gentleman yield for one moment, I just in, in support of what uh, Mr. Hall is saying, I don't think we want to have Congress solely dependent on the areas that wealth in this country is focused on. If you can get enough rich people interested, then the Congress can get some outside institute to, to help on the issue. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. But it seems to me if members of Congress want to dedicate a quarter of a staff person or half a staff person and use them collectively to work on hunger, to work on arms control, to work on the environment. We, we used them in the Northeast, the Midwest, and industrial issues that in our areas we were being devastated. But that makes good sense. And what our committee is going to come forward with is a process to give a responsible method of, 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 of watching the do taxpayer dollars. And that achieves basically what you want, is let members come together and do it and make sure there's a structure where it's done legally, honestly, and the numbers are used. I think it's an unfair characterization to claim that private foundations are solely funded no. by wealthy Americans. I, I agree with that. I agree with that. Sam, as usual, thank you very thank much you, for a nice Chair. job. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sorry to take so much time. The Honorable John Conyers. Chairman? And members of the committee, I shan't occupy a lot of your attention today. Uh, I, I come here to discuss this part of the proposed rules that are going forward uh, that deal with a provision that would make it appropriate in this appropriations bill to cut GAO staffing positions whenever someone accepts retirement. It's outlined in the, in the bill from appropriations. And uh, <clears throat> obviously, all of you are familiar with Rule 21 uh, far more than I am. Uh, it's pretty uh, obviously legislating on an appropriations bill. And as the chairman of the subcommittee that's uh, keeping GAO in line, I just wanted to suggest that there may be a uh, very uh, dangerous a situation here in that 
we have the Appropriations Committee deciding for us uh, a change that has not been uh, brought before our committee. We've not consulted with him, although I work closely with Chairman Natcher. And so I'm asking that a waiver not be granted uh, in this instance. The other uh, matter is that I have been told there are a number of amendments to reduce GAO funding that is in this appropriation. And on a policy point of view, uh, I hope that we will consider the kind of work that GAO has been doing. Uh, uh, they probably have the best uh, dollar save ratio for money expended of, of, of any group that serves the Congress. And uh, I, would, I would like to limit uh, as many of those amendments uh, being granted in the rule or eliminate all of them as far as I'm concerned and that we, we uh, uh, we uh, take this matter up uh, in another way. This is the annual battle, as you know. Every year we, we go through this. And uh, at this point in time, GAO has been cut two years in a row. And uh, I think that it would be uh, rather foolhardy for us to allow these uh, meat axe type uh, amendments to uh, uh, gut a, an organization that I think is serving us well. We've already submitted your full statement in the record. The letter that you wrote to the committee is already submitted in the state uh, in the record, Mr. Conyers. Mr. Sullivan. Well, Mr. Conyers, uh, appreciate you coming before us. And I was, I was just looking for Mr. Uh, Fazio's letter. I thought he had said he had cleared uh, that matter. Let me see. This language was included after consultation with the concurrence of the chairman of the Committee on Post Office and Civil Service. I beg your pardon. He was talking about another committee. But he did not, uh, there was no consultation with you on, uh, on doing this? Not that, I, not that I recollect, unfortunately. And we, we are the Committee of Jurisdiction. Uh, the Dean of the Michigan Delegation has also joined me in the letter that uh, Chairman Moakley referred to that was submitted. Uh, as you know, this is an a annual exercise. But what, what gets me, there, there are two kinds of approaches. One is a good faith uh, attempt on many members' part to reduce expenditures in the government. But somebody must understand that reducing and gutting the organization that has saved us in one year alone $36 billion in financial benefits, giving us a return of $83 for every $1 we've invested in GAO. There must be somebody that doesn't want us, want that organization to keep working as effectively as they have been. One way to do it is to keep making them smaller, make the investigators and the people that are turning up excessive waste, uh, reduce them in size, curtail their staff, and they're taking the appropriate hits in the reductions that everybody in the federal government must. So I urge you to consider sympathetically the, this, these comments that I make. The gentleman's points are well taken. Thank you. Mr. Barnier. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Thank you, sir. The Honorable, the Honorable uh, Jerry Solomon, New York. Mr. Chairman, I um, appreciate the opportunity to leave the rostrum and come down here and testify, and I'll try to be just as brief as I can. Uh, I've been here before on this issue. Uh, the amendment I'm offering would simply place the people who worked for the Congress under the same random drug testing requirement as the people who worked for the White House. Uh, you know, random drug testing does work. It has worked miracles in the military, where 10 years ago we had a use, uh, a drug use in our military of over 25 percent of all active military personnel. That today is down to 4.5 percent, which is practically non-existent. That shows it works. That's a miracle in itself. It works in the private sector. It works in the executive branch. It works in the White House. And it is high time we applied it to the Congress, which uh, I've been attempting to do for 
uh, I think, for the last six years. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if you are one of the tens of thousands of federal employees who serve in a sensitive position in the executive branch, from a security guard at the Department of Agriculture to a DOD official with a security clearance, Congress requires that you be randomly tested for drugs. This Congress has passed my bills which require that. Yet, if you work for the United States Congress and you have a security clearance yeah. with access to the same classified information as the DOD official I just mentioned, or if you serve on the Capitol Hill Police Force, you are exempt from being uh, tested for drugs. Time and time again, we place new federal mandates on American businesses and on the American people, and yet we exempt ourselves. Mr. Chairman, that's wrong. Everyone who works at the White House is randomly drug tested today. That uh, uh, regulation was implemented by Ronald Reagan and has been in effect now for about eight years. In fact, all of the White House employees must take a drug test when they, become, when they begin working at the White House. On the other hand, no one who works for Congress is drug tested in any way. Yet just last year, I don't have to point out to any of you here, some employees of the House of Representatives were arrested for uh, distributing cocaine right in the House of Representatives, right in the office buildings where you and I work, and they pled guilty to that. So it wasn't a question of, uh, of whether they were guilty or not. Mr. Chairman, the time has come for Congress to stop exempting ourselves and to start setting an example, and we can do that by taking, uh, making my amendment in order. Now, you know, Mary Rose Okar, a former Congresswoman who used to head the subcommittee in the House administration where my bill has languished for six years, promised me last year at the end of that Congress that she would hold hearings and that she would report my bill regardless to the floor so that it could be debated on the floor. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on which, which way you look at it, uh, Mary Rose Okar is not a member of the Congress anymore. Uh, I believe uh, Mr. Manton of New York is the subcommittee chairman, and Mrs. Jennifer Dunn is the ranking member. But uh, my bill still languishes there. And again, I would not be here before your rules committee, our rules committee, and I would not be trying to attach it to this bill if we had an authorization bill. But there has not been one in six years. So I just wanted to briefly uh, make my argument uh, and hope that uh, even though this is legislating in an appropriation bill, that you would give me the opportunity to offer that amendment. You wouldn't ask us to waive a point of order, would you, Mr. Uh, Sullivan? Only in the case of a legislative uh, uh, appropriation bill, because there is no authorization bill. Well, there are, there are authorization committees that deal with this, uh, this, this uh, appropriation committee. Uh, but as the gentleman knows, there has not been an authorization bill for six years. That's why I am been uh, gagged from my opportunity to offer the amendment. And it's not right. You know, uh, it isn't a question. Uh, it only costs about $11 to randomly drug test any employee, in, 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 uh, whether it be in uh, the executive branch or in the legislative branch. And it would set such, a, such, a, such an example, as it did uh, in the United States military. It isn't the fact that they caught so many people using drugs. It was the fact that it was a deterrent. And it worked miracles in the military. It's working miracles in the General Electric Company and the International Business Machines Company in private industry across this country. Let's do it here and set the example. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any questions? Thank you very much, Mr. Solomon. I see Dave Obey. Dave. As uh, chairman of the Subcommittee on Appropriations, uh, I think uh, you're up. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I uh, simply came up to testify because I was told that there were going to be uh, uh, several amendments uh, which uh, related to the joint committees. And I simply wanted to testify against uh, either one of them. I have no ax to grind uh, with respect to the joint tax committee, for instance. I'm, I'm not a member of it. I've never, uh, you know, I haven't had any association with it, uh, except that I've used it a number of times. In 1981, as you will recall, uh, we had the Reagan uh, budget proposals before us. We had the Democratic alternatives, the Rosmankowski tax bill. There were a lot of us in our party who felt that, that, uh, uh, that we needed to be able to present an alternative to both the Republican and Democratic uh, propositions at that time. We couldn't go to the administration for facts. 
because they had an axe to grind. We couldn't go uh, to the Budget Committee because they had an axe to grind. We couldn't go to the uh, uh, Ways and Means Committee because they obviously had an axe to grind. I sponsored the main Democratic alternatives to both the Jones budget and the Rosenkowski tax bill in 81. And the only way we were able to uh, come up with real numbers so that we could prevent or present uh, to the House uh, something uh, which had uh, an intellectual foundation was by going to the Joint Tax Committee, which the Joint Tax Committee had been subsumed into another committee such as Ways and Means. Uh, they would not have had that technical independence, and I dare say I doubt that we would have been able to, uh, to uh, get the numbers that we needed in order to uh, produce our alternative. As you know, numbers crunching around here is uh, a very tough and delicate business. And uh, uh, you have to be able to go to objective sources. <clears throat> and if you don't represent uh, one of the power centers in this place, as we certainly didn't at that time, uh, you have a hell of a time, frankly, getting uh, independent information um, that you can use to challenge the conventional political wisdom of the day. So uh, I would strongly urge uh, you not to allow uh, uh, an amendment on Joint Tax Committee. With respect to the Joint Economic Committee, I do have an extra grind uh, <clears throat> because I now serve as chair and I have in the past. It's been suggested that the Joint Economic Committee uh, somehow could be merged with the Budget Committee or with the CBO, I've heard said by uh, by people who have offered the amendment in various incarnations. And all I would say again is that I think it must be remembered there is much to economic policy that has nothing to do with budgeting. Economic policy is not just budgeting, just as legislating is not just dealing with the budget. There are an awful lot of other pieces of legislation that need to pass around here uh, in order to affect a comprehensive economic policy. And the Budget Committee only uh, uh, addresses the budget pieces of that, uh, of that economic uh, policy. Uh, uh, the role of the Joint Economic Committee, as Dick Bowling, who used to chair this committee, would, uh, would tell you if he were here, because he served as chair of it uh, uh, and one of the most active members. The role of that committee is very, very different from the day-to-day -day role that is played by the Budget Committee, for instance. The role of that committee is to try primarily to look at the long-term developments in the economy, not the short-term political hurly-burly that you get uh, involved in in the budget resolution every day. Um, uh, example, uh, we would not have made much headwork in this country in protecting American interests on semiconductors had it not been for the studies which were first commissioned by the Joint Economic Committee when Lloyd Benson was chairman, which demonstrated that if uh, the, that American semiconductors made absolutely no penetration in the Japanese markets, uh, that uh, they made considerable penetration into ours. And when you looked at a neutral territory, uh, namely Western Europe, uh, their American technology was able to compete very well uh, with, with Japanese uh, competition, uh, which demonstrated by testing it in three different markets that the Japanese were practicing protectionism. We were practicing much more op uh, uh, open uh, trade policies. And, and, and that we were not at a disadvantage uh, with the Japanese in terms of quality, because when you measured the way we could compete in a neutral market, namely the, uh, Europe, we did quite well. Um, if you take a look at the continuing studies that have gone on uh, for years uh, of the uh, of the Soviet and Chinese economies by the Joint Economic Committee. That is not stuff that the Budget Committee is going to do. The Budget Committee is wrestling with things on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, if you, today we all talk about the, uh, uh, the problems attendant to declining family income in this country. Uh, it was the Joint Economic Committee which first flagged that that was happening and commissioned the studies which brought that into the political dialogue uh, and which demonstrated that through a succession of administrations, Republican and Democratic, uh, that uh, we had essentially hit a turning point in 1973 in terms of the way this economy uh, functioned and the way it, uh, the way it produced uh, income earning opportunities. Um, uh, questions of corporate governance. Uh, they've done a good deal of, uh, of analysis uh, of the way corporations are governed to try to determine what it is the, that helps make a competitive corporation and a non-competitive corporation. I would suggest to you that uh, 
uh, uh, all of that work uh, was extremely useful uh, in, in, in helping us understand not only what was happening in the public arena of economic policy, but in the private arena of economic reality. And, uh, and uh, uh, to suggest that somehow the public would be served by the elimination of either one of these committees, I think, is extremely short-sighted. I would also point out that the Joint Economic Committee, for instance, I don't know what the, the uh, Joint Tax Committee record is, but JEC went 10 years in a row without having a single addition to staff. I doubt that there are many committees around here who can make that statement. So um, I would simply suggest that, uh, and even this year, I would point out that we operate at a disadvantage because unlike every other committee in this House, the Joint Economic Committee has to pay out of its own budget the cost of, uh, of uh, uh, government benefits uh, that accrue to its, its, its staffers. Other committees get that built in in addition to, uh, to their budget. We have to eat that in our base budget. So. Uh, while it appears that our committee has been treated neutrally and treated the same uh, by the legislative subcommittee as uh, all other committees, in fact, when you take into account the fact that we have, uh, have to absorb those agency contributions, we are having close to a 10 percent cut uh, uh, in, the, in, in the committee's budget uh, in real terms over the past two years. And uh, uh, I think that's quite enough. <laughs> Let me say to my good friend, Mr. Roby, that I have uh, some of your arguments, particularly when uh, about the Joint uh, Economic Committee and uh, perhaps even the Joint Tax Committee. But, um, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's an issue that really deserves to be debated. So rather than not allow amendments, uh, Dave, we really ought to, you know, spend some time on the floor talking about uh, how important these these uh, joint committees are, and uh, the same as we did with the uh, with the select committees. And uh, I just point out, uh, you know, this week uh, Monday we weren't in session at all. On Tuesday we spent less than one hour debating bills on the floor. Uh, today we're going to spend just about an hour, and Friday no session. And uh, uh, we really ought to take the time with this legislative appropriation bill and allow the amendments, and then uh, let the House work its will. Uh, uh, you know, you've all, you've been a leader, uh, you've been a watchdog, and uh, we respect you for that. Uh, and uh, But you ought to be able to get your points across about what's good. You can't do that if we don't have the debate on the floor. Well, I'd suggest uh, that, that it's important to have the debate in the proper arena. The appropriations process should not be used. I mean, I just went through an excruciating experience marking up my foreign aid appropriation bill. I know. And I uh, insisted that we eliminate every single earmark in the bill. That hasn't happened in that bill in 20 years. We don't have a single earmark in that bill this year. Uh, uh, I have gone to great lengths to try to make the appropriations process the appropriations process so that we can set numbers under policy set by authorizing committees. That's the way this place is supposed to work. Uh, I believe in the authorization and appropriations process. I don't think we should mix the two if, if it can possibly be avoided. We, um, uh, and, and in my view, uh, if people have arguments about budgeting, uh, uh, that's, that's one thing. But to, but to make a policy decision about uh, two key economic instruments used by this body to, pr to, to obtain independent long-term information, independent of the executive branch of government and independent of, uh, uh, of the leadership, it seems to me, is... Uh, is uh, uh, to bring this issue up uh, in the wrong arena, in the wrong forum. It does not belong on this bill. Uh, th this is a joint item. This is an item which, uh, which ought to be dealt with at the time that we, uh, uh, that we set the basic rules for organization of the House, but it does not belong uh, in discussion of an appropriation uh, 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 bill of this nature, in my view. Thank the gentleman for his remarks. Mr. Dreyer. Ms. Slaughter, Mr. Goss, thank you very much, Mr. Alvin. Thank you. Mr. William Thomas, California. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just let me say that uh, the comments of my friend, uh, Mr. Obie, uh, I think are well taken in regard to the uh, 
Joint Committee on Tax and the uh, Joint Committee on Economics uh, serving on the Ways and Means Committee, we do use the uh, Joint Committee on Tax. There are a number of changes that could be made. I notice he did not talk about the Joint Committee on the Printing or the Joint Committee on the Libraries. Oh. Uh, I have a letter from the Minority Leader indicating that he has looked at the evidence presented and that perhaps those two Joint Committees might be dealt with quite differently than Joint Tax uh, or uh, Joint Committee uh, on Economics. I'm before you today, Mr. Chairman, once again, uh, to ask uh, this institution to do what it's going to do eventually anyway. But do it in a way that, first of all, the institution can get some positive credit for understanding change and for anticipating change and meeting change. I'm asking uh, that an amendment be made in order which would cut the franking uh, budget by 50%. Uh, the 50 percent cut will deal with uh, unsolicited mass mail. Uh, we have never gotten a complete handle on the percentage of unsolicited mass mail. Uh, it is, uh, no one believes it's less than two-thirds of the volume that we send. A number of people believe it's as high as 80 percent of the volume of mail that is sent. It obviously changes over the seasons and over the years as we've discussed in the past. So a 50 percent cut on franking is a fairly conservative estimate of what would be eliminated if we eliminated unsolicited uh, mass mailing. Uh, in cutting at 50 percent, uh, a redefine unsolicited to go from 500 to 100 pieces uh, and to exclude notices of town hall meetings uh, by members because I think that is a legitimate way to announce that you're going to be there. It isn't a newsletter thinly uh, veiled campaign piece that's going out. It is an announcement of the member uh, making himself or herself available to the constituency. Uh, you've seen these charts before. I've updated them this time to include the 1992 costs and uh, they'll be made available to you. But what you see is that uh, sawtooth pattern of mailing, this is dollar amounts, mailing costs in the odd numbered years mailing costs in the even-numbered years. Uh, obviously, there seems to be a campaign advantage, uh, or at least some advantage, in mailing larger numbers of uh, unsolicited mass mailings during an election year. Uh, this is a comparison on number of pieces mailed. Once again, the sawtooth pattern, uh, odd-numbered, even-numbered years. The bottom line is incoming mail mail coming into members of Congress that would, of course, be allowed to be responded to in terms of uh, uh, correspondence from constituents and others. Uh, notice that there has been an increase in this line, but, but it doesn't follow anywhere near the pattern of mailings that, that members have followed in the past. As far as I'm concerned, the two most important areas that should be focused on on these charts are the last several years. There has been a significant change in the pattern of sawtooths. And it coincides with the House, this institution, deciding that members should be held personally responsible for the amount of mail that they send. That had a significant reduction in the amount of mail sent. And we've seen a follow-up this year, following uh, the last election in the off year, uh, of continued reductions. Uh, the numbers are, are startling. Uh, for example, uh, in calendar year 91, the expenditure was 52 million. In calendar year 92, the expenditure was 57 million. So far in calendar year 93, uh, it's 9 million. But that pales in comparison to what had been expended in the earlier years. And what we have is a clear reduction. In calendar year 90, first quarter 56 million, second quarter 11 million, third quarter 7 million, fourth quarter 32 million. A clear indication of the sawtooth. In 91, First quarter, 6 million. Second quarter, 8 million. Third quarter, 10 million. Fourth quarter, 20 million. But we began to have members being held personally responsible for the amount of mail that they send. In 1992, an election year, which should have been one of those upswings of the sawtooth, first quarter, 10 million. Second quarter, 10 million. Third quarter, 11 million. Fourth quarter, 3 million. Dramatic reversal in the amount of mail. The point is, members are no longer sending out unsolicited mass mail following the sawtooth campaign formula. It is over. You are going to hear from some members of your party and perhaps from some members of my party who continue to be mass mailers. And they will tell you, don't cut this source 
of contact with voters off. You will continue to be pummeled as an individual and as a member of this institution if we do not do the responsible thing, and that is eliminate unsolicited mass mail. Keep the lines of communication open between member and constituent for correspondence back and forth on issues, but do not allow unsolicited mass mail. We're going to do it eventually anyway. I think we ought to do it in a time frame in which we get some credit for understanding what we should do and do it right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Quillen. I came in late, the bill, but I want to thank you for your fine presentation. I hope the committee takes your advice. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It's a uh, a very important issue, and, and Bill, you've spent uh, almost your entire time uh, in this Congress trying to deal with uh, problems that relate to uh, things like franked mail, and I congratulate you for it. This morning on National Public Radio, I listened to a report on the flow of mail, which has increased dramatically, and I think the chart that you just showed, uh, the last line, is a tremendous increase in the flow of mail coming into our office. Now, the, course, the, the point made in this report this morning is one of which we're all well aware. Uh, much of the mail which comes into our office uh, comes with very little effort on the part of that constituent because we have a tremendous increase in the numbers of organizations which are ginning up uh, response from, uh, from uh, constituents. And it is a, a challenge, and I wondered if you have any thoughts as to how we might deal with that specific issue, which is on the horizon, and frankly, if that, if that continues to increase like that, no need to make your cut, because we will have to respond to constituent mail at the same level that we now respond or, or provide to unsolicited uh, newsletters. Uh, there has been an increase, as you indicate, in the mail, and as you can see by the chart, uh, it has gone up in recent years, but it's nowhere near the amounts that we right. have expended. So it's only about one third. But if you look, uh, that is almost an exponential increase. If you look at that just over the last couple of years, that's correct. And and to a certain extent, we're already responding to uh, a changing world. As you indicate, very often uh, people have very little to do with the mail that's actually generated under their name. They don't do it themselves. Organizations do it for them, and there are various ways to communicate other than the old-fashioned written. A postcard or letter sent in by a stamp. We have a pilot project, project going on right now in terms of electronic mail in which people can contact their members of Congress via uh, modems, computers, and all of the 21st century contacts that are available for businesses to business contacts. We're making it available uh, to people who are in elective office. This will cut down the amount of old-fashioned, if you'll allow me to call it that, mail uh, that will be coming in to a One of the things extent. that they said is going on is there will be an organization which will telephone uh, a constituent out there and then directly put them through by telephone to our office, to the individual's office they want to... Uh, uh, That's already happened to, to me several times. And what we have are caseworkers in the office talking to startled people on the phone who had no idea they were calling the member's office and then hanging up abruptly. So there has to be a great deal of education before we understand that. People call our office. They... Uh, we generate a piece of paper that's transmitted back and is handled as though it were a piece of mail. That, of course, would be allowed under the uh, provision of uh, banning unsolicited uh, mass mail. The other point is this. The 50% is a rough cut. It clearly is below the percentage of mass mail that we send out. But I don't think anyone will begrudge an adjustment in the franking amount when Congress can stand up and honestly say 100% of the money is used to deal with direct contacts with constituents. It isn't used for mass mailing. It isn't used for thinly uh, uh, veiled campaign brochures. And so people are more willing to say, sure, you need that amount of money to contact your constituents because 100% of it is being used for responsible, constitutionally permissible, obviously necessary kinds of communication. I certainly will do everything that I possibly can on this committee to ensure that your amendment's made in order. Well, I, d I don't have high hopes that, that it's actually going to happen either on this piece of legislation or it'll happen in this Congress. I think it's not wise of the members to do it. We should do it now. We should get credit for doing it. It's the right thing to do. But it will happen eventually. Mr. Goss. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I congratulate you, Mr. Thomas, for coming forward on this subject. I know it's a subject that the American public is more and more aware of, and they certainly are more and more aware of the excesses uh, that have taken place. The sawtooth chart that you've held up, uh, I, I think, is dramatic evidence of what we know and what increasingly others are finding out. Uh, if we are unable to get this amendment attached oh. today, and I will certainly do everything I can to get it on the floor because it deserves debate, uh, I would point out to you there are a couple of uh, other bills that have got this provision in it. Uh, I only know of two, uh, which I authored. I'm sure other members have authored their own, because I agree with you. The time is coming, and I think 50 percent is the right level. I know of no office that uh, has more than a 50 percent use of its frank budget used in responding to incoming mail. Do you? No. And it's a far lower percentage than that, actually, if you, if you separated it out. We've never done it mechanically in a way to get an actual dollar value. Uh, I, I have no information on that subject, but uh, from what I've been able to check and what I've been able to find out, 50 percent is a very safe number. No member's style would be cramped. No member would be shut off from communicating with his or her constituents in response to uh, an inquiry, uh, if, if I'm reading the numbers properly. And that's your... Correct. Okay. The second question I wanted to point out uh, I have is that we have a definition question about an unsolicited mass mailing. Uh, that to me is a self-aggrandizing newsletter, uh, which uh, frequently show up more often around election time than not. But I believe that there are uh, legitimate mass mailings, uh, and I want to know whether they're in your definition. And one, our colleague from uh, California, Mr. Bielenson, I think properly brought to our attention, because it's also been my experience that when you announce town hall meetings and newspapers, uh, through uh, public service announcements, uh, which are really at the will of the, of the, of the newspaper, uh, you don't get good response. If you do send out town hall meeting cards, you do get good response. And I think that is a worthy use of the taxpayers' dollars. Would you, those be prohibited under your proposal? Uh, the way we would define mail that could be sent out if this were to become a governing of members' behavior would be that we would not ban communications with government officials in the media, we would not ban direct responses to communications from persons, not just constituents, from persons to the member. We would not ban follow-up responses to persons who have communicated to the member. We would not ban town hall meeting notices that do not include a picture of the member and use the name of the member only in the form of a signature for franking purposes. So I have, and frankly, I wrestled over the business of town hall notices, uh, but uh, in, in um, in deciding that the need to notify outweighs the political advantage, if you don't have your picture on it, and if you don't write it like a campaign postcard, I think it serves a very legitimate purpose, and therefore we have included it. But what we've also done is reduced the definition of uh, mass mail from 500 pieces to 100 pieces, because most people are familiar with the, uh, the classic 499 piece done 10 times, so that you, in fact, wind up with what amounts to a mass mailer, but because of the way in which mass mailing is defined, it isn't, and so we make it 100. Uh, and, and we do allow complete and open communication with government, the media, and any person, not just constituents, and follow-up responses to those people, including town hall meetings. Clearly, what we do not allow are the mass postal patron newsletters, uh, which I think um, may have at one time serves somewhat of a legitimate service, but the members themselves in their mailing patterns clearly indicate that this is no longer the valuable tool uh, as it apparently a thought once was. The last question, is there anything in your proposed amendment that includes penalties for what I would guess we might call willful abuse of the limits? Well, we, we do not include penalties because if you uh, redefine it to 100 and you clearly uh, uh, determine what can and can't be sent out, through our abilities uh, uh, and use of the House Post Office and the folding room, uh, we can control uh, the flow of mail in terms of policing it according to... You can preempt it. I, I believe we can. Thank uh, you. I'm not interested in making some kind of a policeman structure here. I'm trying to indicate that the members uh, of this institution uh, know and understand the concerns that the public has, and we respond to them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So what if you get a petition with a thousand names on it? on some particular uh, subject matter? That would be a follow-up response to persons who have communicated to the member, and that would be permitted. That would be permitted. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Any communication with anybody who communicates with you first would be allowed. Okay. It is the uninitiated mass mail that I'm focusing on, which the members themselves have backed away from, except mm -hmm. for a notable few.
Mr. Uh, Chairman, can I just yes. ask one question? What about follow-ups? Uh, once again, uh, any follow-up responses. That is, if someone writes you about a bill, uh, I believe it's perfectly legitimate to, one, notify them where it is in the legislative process. If it moves through a committee, you can notify them again. If it moves through the floor, you can notify them. That is part of the legitimate legislative job of informing constituents. This is not a gimmick. This is not a partisan position. This is, to the best of my ability, as the ranking member on House Administration, and I was going to say to the chairman in closing, uh, he urges folks to go to the authorizing committees to deal with this issue. This is the authorizing committee. It is the authorizing <laughs> committee. I'm glad we found you. I'm just sorry Mr. Solomon's not here. And, uh, uh, and uh, I am going to continue to move forward in doing what the House is ultimately going to do anyway, but I want it done in the time frame in which this institution gets credit for doing it instead of being driven to do it and then gets no benefit from it. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Thomas. Thank you. Now, finally, after many interruptions, uh, the Honorable Timmy, Timothy Penny, Maria Cantwell, Eric Fingerhut, Earl Pomeroy, and Karen Shepard. And I'm sure you're aware of why other people went in before you because of the I, I understand that. I've been through this drill before, right. Mr. Chairman. Okay. And I'll be mercifully brief. Uh, I want to uh, defer to uh, my freshman colleagues uh, who have a very important member to offer. You can pull the chairs up if you want. Uh, uh, I first, Mr. Chairman, want to uh, uh, express my admiration for Chairman Fazio. Uh, he's exhibited great courage uh, to be the first appropriation subcommittee chairman to come to the House floor. Uh, and it's a particularly difficult bill to uh, present, particularly in, in the political climate uh, in which we find ourselves. Uh, nonetheless, uh, uh, there is some legitimacy to the uh, demand uh, by the public for cuts in uh, the legislative branch. Uh, acknowledging that it is uh, uh, the smallest appropriations uh, bill that, uh, that we consider. Um, uh, we, um, we can, I think, send a signal to the public that we're willing to sacrifice first uh, with our own budgets uh, uh, before we proceed uh, with uh, the remaining appropriation measures in which uh, we will be making significant cuts in, in other areas of public expenditure. Um, I've been involved in uh, franking uh, policy for a number of years, several years ago introduced legislation to reform our franking practices by limiting uh, newsletter mailings and by uh, requiring disclosure. Uh, some of those ideas uh, were incorporated into the Frenzel Fazio bill, which uh, now is law and does govern our operations and I think has uh, dramatically reduced uh, the level of uh, franking in this institution. Uh, I am here to endorse an amendment that will be offered by, uh, uh, by Ms. Shepard, uh, Mr. Pomeroy, Mr. Fingerhut, and others uh, to further limit our franking appropriation in the coming year. I also am here to request an amendment that would uh, cut 5% uh, uh, from the levels uh, in this appropriations bill. Uh, I realize that there's a modest reduction in the funding levels uh, in the bill as it comes uh, to us. Uh, but uh, I believe a more significant reduction can be accommodated and, uh, and that 5% reduction would be across the board. Um, I anticipate that if it's adopted, there may be some changes made in the conference committee and if uh, the, uh, uh, if the uh, members of that conference committee want to take the 5% hit in some different fashion by spreading it in a different way, I, I have no objection with that. Um, but I, I think just for the simplicity of, of, uh, of moving the issue forward that uh, uh, as I offered on the floor, if this committee would allow the amendment, it would be a 5% across the board cut. Thank you. Ms. Shepard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I am here to propose uh, an amendment that uh, the four of us have uh, collaborated on, and uh, it is also an amendment which fits very well with what the freshmen have as we went through our reform practice endorsed as a group. And it is an amendment which uh, reduces the appropriations included in the House Frank mail budget by an additional $5.8 million over what currently is in that budget. If this amendment is adopted, the Frank mail appropriation will be $40 million for fiscal year 1994. 
and that will represent a reduction of 7,711,000 below the fiscal year 93 appropriation. I'd like to point out with regard to the charts that were just held up that this is a reduction in a non-election year over uh, an election year, so this is a significant reduction. And it is 31 million below the amount currently authorized by our mail allowances. And I, I guess I just have one brief thing to say. I am uh, one of the members who has reduced uh, her budget by 25% voluntarily. Um, I have um, done that with a, a commitment to my constituents and, and seeking all the time not to diminish my service to my com constituents in any way at all. I have found that that has required some striking uh, sacrifice and so many, many, many long hours from staff workers and a significant decrease in our use of the mail budget. And I think it's possible, but it requires us to be thrifty. And I think it's also important to note that our job as representatives is to inform and educate people about their government. And I am very concerned about the shrinking understanding of the general public of what we do here and about the increasing cynicism of what we do here. And I think it is an extremely important that we do not simply kind of throw the baby out with the bathwater with regard to how often and when we contact them that we need to cut, we need to be thrifty, we need to be responsible, we need to be careful, and we need to uh, find balance in that. Thank you. Have all you people voted? No. Well, I think probably this is the time. I thought we'd get somebody up here, but a few people haven't voted. Let's have brief recess and come right back. Just vote, come right back. Okay. Maybe will be in brief recess. I'm going to defer to Mr. Pomeroy. For All right, Mr. Pomeroy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to bring our proposed amendment before you. The stated goal the freshman Democrats are hoping for relative to legislative account reductions, 25 percent over five years, we find that the committee's action on the appropriation uh, makes a uh, another concrete step toward that goal. If you look over the last two years, I believe the legislative funding will be down about 13 percent, which represents positive progress toward this 25 percent reduction goal that we have. We think in the area of franking, however, that more can be done. The actual amendment described to you by my colleague Karen Shepard would represent about a 15 percent cut in the franking allowance. Uh, we think that's appropriate. We think it's important to uh, signal that at a time when we're asking the people of this country to do more, government, starting with Congress, is willing to do with less. And we would appreciate the opportunity to vote on this amendment tomorrow. I know that I speak for many freshmen. In particular, I'd like to uh, mention uh, uh, Representative Cantwell from Washington, who has also been active in the task force the freshmen have had looking at the legislative account activity. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. won't repeat the statements that have been made by my colleagues, uh, but would like to add one point that Karen Shepard alluded to. Uh, in the course of our deliberations in the uh, Freshman Democratic Task Force on Reform, um, we had, frankly, a full and complete debate uh, on the subject of reaching out to constituents, constituent service, uh, and what our obligations are. Uh, as legislators, as one of the co-chairs of that task force with Karen Shepard, I thought it was important to note that while we endorsed significant reductions in legislative branch appropriations, as uh, Congressman Pomeroy has already indicated, uh, we also recognize that it is part of our responsibility to communicate with our constituents about the workings of their government and to inform them as fully as we can about uh, the issues and concerns that have been raised. Uh, uh, Congressman Dreyer and others uh, have previously alluded to the fact that there is an increase in organized activity uh, among the public around specific pieces of legislation or specific issues. We have all seen that reflected in our mail in our offices. I think we all view that as a positive um, 
step in terms of the public's uh, information. But as the public seeks to be informed uh, about the legislative process, uh, I do believe it is uh, our responsibility, and I wish to reflect the debates and discussions that occurred in our uh, reform task force, uh, that it is our responsibility to be part of that uh, information debate. Uh, certainly, there have been abuses uh, of the privilege uh, of, uh, of mailing information to constituents. That has given all of this process a bad name. Uh, it is something that those of us as new members uh, inherit. Is a, it is part of our cross to bear in trying to work our way through this. Uh, but we do wish to make clear that as we work our way through that, as we seek to eliminate all abuses, seek to make the necessary budget cuts that reflect this institution's commitment to deficit reduction, uh, that we also do not uh, un take off uh, uh, to too great extent our ability uh, to communicate appropriately with constituents about the work of the Congress. Thank you very much, uh, for both of you, for a fi very fine statement. Mr. Goss? No, I think that you've uh, certainly uh, borne out the uh, proposition that has been uh, stated earlier here in this committee hearings today that from the newer members we are going to get uh, good ideas on what kind of change people are expecting and uh, I suspect that uh, you have uh, satisfied uh, that prediction very well here because I think you've come up with some good thoughts and certainly the goals I think we're all working on together on a nonpartisan basis it's more a question of how to but I thank you for coming forward thank you thank you gentlemen the Honorable Pat Roberts of Kansas the Honorable Bill Orton of Utah. Thank you. See, if we could communicate with constituents like that, we wouldn't have to be up here on this right <laughs> now, huh? True. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have submitted the uh, necessary copies of the amendments to the committee, but I have just given you a copy of the okay. amendments with a brief explanation. I have two amendments, uh, the first of which I can uh, virtually eliminate uh, if this committee finds in order the amendment uh, that the previous panel has recommended or the amendment that uh, Mr. Fazio from uh, California has uh, recommended, I would simply withdraw my request for this amendment because it also seeks to uh, reduce the expenditures for the office mailing account. I think everything that needs to be said about that has been said and I won't further burden the committee. My uh, recommendation was for a 10% cut. If we can get a 15% cut, I'd go with that. <laughs> and so um, I will just uh, leave that amendment uh, at that. And if the committee finds the previous amendment in order, then I would withdraw my request for the First Amendment. My Second Amendment also seeks to um, uh, continue toward our goal of a 25% reduction in expenditures in the legislative branch. And in so doing, it focuses in the area which has been the most rapid growing over the past uh, uh, couple of decades, uh, particularly in the area of expenses attributable to committees and running the, uh, the legislative branch itself. Uh, my recommendation makes additional cuts to uh, four specific areas. The uh, funding for House leadership, committee employees, standing committees, special and select committees, and salaries officers and employees of the House. Uh, in these areas, this identifies the bulk of the administrative uh, employees, both through the operation and the uh, committees. Um, and my recommendation uh, simply includes or uh, increases the cuts the committee has recommended in these areas to make a, uh, an overall 10 percent reduction from 93 appropriation levels. Uh, I believe this would be an appropriate step uh, reduction to hopefully get us to a point of, uh, uh, of an overall uh, 25 percent reduction, which the President certainly has encouraged, the leadership uh, uh, has endorsed in concept. And uh, so I would encourage the committee to make uh, uh, that amendment in order. Mr. Goss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have no further questions. You've articulated very clearly, and I think that the, the direction you're heading is the right one. Thank you. Thank you very much. I thank the chairman. Uh, once again, we'll call the Honorable Pat Roberts of Kansas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sure.
Delsa? Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know that uh, before this distinguished uh, committee, that sometimes you hear uh, testimony that uh, represents very strong differences of opinion, but you do so with respect, and I thank you for your past courtesies. I'm a little saddened and concerned, however, uh, to learn that my colleague uh, from Connecticut, uh, a fellow member of the House Administration Committee, has described this member in my amendment as one that is destructive and frivolous and undermining reform in regard to the needed reform of LSOs, i.e. the legislative service organizations, uh, I have tried to uh, smother my colleague with the milk of, uh, of uh, maybe human kindness. Apparently it is curdled. Uh, I would uh, you know, try to emphasize to you, sir, that uh, my amendment is uh, certainly not really frivolous. I know the gentleman from Connecticut is taking it very seriously, and I think it is positive and represents uh, some real reform. I'm going to try to uh, do this in five minutes because I know that you are are pressed for time. Since 1982, the House Administration Committee has appointed two task forces, I was a member of both, a separate subcommittee uh, investigation and report, and then another subcommittee review, all to reform the special interest caucuses, or what we call in the House, the legislative service organizations. And all of these, um, all of these efforts advocated change primarily to to place the LSOs and their employees under the same rules as the House before the, the train really jumped off the track. The last uh, uh, subcommittee review that began in the 102nd Congress is now continued into the 103rd, and my friend from Connecticut is the chairman um, of that review. Now, we had a debate on the legislative appropriations bill as of last year, and I offered an amendment to prohibit the use of the members' allowances and expenses to continue the funding of the LSOs. Now, I know Mr. Gadenson said I withdrew my amendment that it was, what, maybe a little frivolous or whatever. Uh, I didn't call for a record vote in that the majority on the House Administration Committee said, let's do yet another GAO study. Only this time they used the words investigation and audit. Well, I have been working with Mr. Boehner of Ohio, who is the ranking minority member on the appropriate uh, subcommittee. We have met with the GAO. And we find now that the third or fourth or fifth uh, draft won't be ready until September. If we do that, we will have gone another year without any real work. I would say to you that the time for reform is past. The train is not only off the track, but there are cars missing. The accident that was waiting to happen that I warned about on the House floor has happened. Uh, and it is because of this. When we had the debate as of last time on the floor, there were several members from LSOs who came to me and said, you're taking too much of a narrow picture, need to broaden the picture on the fine work that we do, and so we did. And in keeping with the uh, past uh, task forces, um, my office has completed a 10-year review of the, LSA, of the LSO quarterly uh, financial reports that are filed with the clerk of the House. The big picture is that House LSOs with millions of dollars in federal tax dollars uh, have a whole bunch of uh, of tax dollars that are simply missing. They are unaccounted for. They are an embarrassment uh, uh, to the Congress. Now, let's look at the bar chart, if we can, over here. And you will see that the 10-year review involves some surprising and alarming figures. It shows that the members of Congress have funneled more than 35 million bucks, uh, approximately 34.6 million, and they report spending of 26.8 million. Now, if you can have the pie chart, please. Uh, of the total dollars that our members of Congress have given to LSO, 7.7 million are absent. They have simply disappeared. One out of every five dollars is missing and unreported, and simply we don't know where they are. At the very least, we should have an outside audit and accounting of what has happened to these funds. I want to say again that the GAO report uh, is uh, simply that, a report. We don't have any past audit. Now let's get up the summary chart, if you will. This is a 10-year summary of receipts and expenditures for each of the LSOs. Where are the funds? If you look at the receipts, the expenditures, the total net, and the percent that are, are missing, that is the classic answer. One possible answer might be that LSOs are capable of really creating a cushion or a carryover fund. Uh, I know that these surpluses are often uh, simply uh, created by the LSOs to help their uh, situation in terms 
of funding for the next year. But we can't do that in our member's office. We can't do that in committee. I think it's a practice that should not be allowed. If the House Administrator will come in and tell members of Congress very quickly that we're going to have to cut back our office operations by 10 percent, it could be we will find out that part of what we have contributed or the members that contribute to LSOs uh, will ha have been socked away in some bank in a carryover fund when we're going to have to cut back 10 percent in terms of our office operations. I don't think that's right. A second answer might be the errors in regards to bookkeeping and unreported spending. Now, since I asked the question about the $7.7 .7 million, many LSOs have come to me and said, wait a minute, we just didn't report our clerk hire from the red uh, square there over to the right square in regards to the grand total. Well, that in itself is a bookkeeping error. We went back over the spreadsheets for the last 10 years and we found that really was responsible for somewhere between 20 and 25 percent of the error, even though it was a bookkeeping error. There's about six million dollars still missing and we don't know where it is. That leads us to the third possible option, misspent or worse, funds that were diverted to other uses. And I would call the attention of my colleagues, several dear colleague uh, letters that I have sent out and would ask perhaps if uh, one of my colleagues could distribute that uh, to the August members of this committee, and I would uh, call your attention to LSO spending facts. I'm not going to read them all, but we got $4,000 for Watergate pastries. We got a thousand bucks for staff travel to the Virgin Islands over New Year's. We have uh, 4,431 for the processing of somebody's questionnaire. Uh, we had uh, private clubs. Most of these things are social events. We can't do that in regards to committees. We can't do it in terms of individual members' offices. These are spending practices that I think. Uh, should simply be done away with. So, uh, basically the LSOs have their own bank accounts and they're comprised of taxpayer funds and their own checkbooks and they are free to spend it any way they like. <clears throat> that is waiting, a system waiting for a scandal to happen and it's happened. Uh, in closing, let me just say I'm not trying to perjure the intent of the LSOs. And I'm not trying to single out any LSO or their purpose. I want to stress that some of these caucus uh, do a, a good job and they do well-intentioned work. They do provide some special interest focus and some interest. And I want to especially thank some of the LSOs for their efforts in providing uh, better reporting and also some full disclosure. So my comments and suggestions are not really wrapped in a blanket of blame. Uh, however, I think these organizations, Mr. Chairman, they further diffuse an already fractured subcommittee and committee structure. We have 300 subcommittees and committees in the House alone. Most of us are supposed to be at two places at the same time over half the time. They take up viable office space. They do not serve a true legislative purpose on Capitol Hill. And so consequently, I can't understand why the LSOs can't really get along like the 110 uh, congressional member organizations that are very similar to LSOs but do not use the taxpayers' money for very questionable spending practices. I happen to be the co-chairman of the World Health Care Coalition along with Mr. Stanholm of Texas. We have 12 members who are on the steering committee. We have 146 members, bipartisan, all throughout this Congress. We have met with the First Lady. We met with Mr. Magaziner. We meet all the time with the Mason, uh, 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 with the Ways and Means folks. I think we're doing a good job, but we don't have to be an LSO. And there are 109 other organizations like that, as opposed to the LSOs. So I would ask you, sir, since, uh, uh, since the wise people of the Rules Committee made my amendment in order last time, I think it is time we had a mercy killing. The time for reform has passed, and I would hope you would make uh, my amendment in order, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. I have one additional amendment along with Mr. Upton, Mr. Chairman, uh, but would yield for any questions at this time. Do you have any questions? Just one quick one, if I may, to, to our friend. Um, and uh, please forgive me, for, I missed the very beginning of your testimony, but are you at all hopeful that whatever it is that Mr. Gadenson and his friends are coming up with, apparently in the near future, will, will, will be beneficial in this regard? I mean, I know it doesn't do away with them, it does try to, you know, to, to ensure proper accounting procedures and so on, and perhaps some rules that they haven't had before. Do you have any uh, faith that that might turn out to be useful, or, or can you not yet I tell? I would tell my colleague from California that I have been on two task forces, two review committees, and an LSO partridge in a pear tree.
And it isn't that I haven't worked long and hard for reform. It's just when these recommendations go to the leadership, and I'm not trying to perjure anybody, they disappear. Really? And we have been down that road and down that road and down that road four separate times. We started off with Mr. Frenzel, who was the ranking member, Mr. Hawkins, who was the chairman. Mr. Anunzio and others put a hold on the number of LSOs. Let me interrupt briefly. If, I'm so sure, I, Pat, if I were you, I'd you know, feel exactly the same way. My only question really is, does, does this time seem to you to be any different? I mean, is it likely, do you suppose, or do you think, you get the feeling that, it's, that something real is going to occur this time, or, or you're not If you're a member of, of the minority, hope springs eternal. And uh, I would hope that we could take some action, but we're not going to have the GAO draft until September. Uh, doubtlessly, uh, we'll see what happens, but there's an effort by the Speaker already to, in to increase the number of LSOs. All of the regulations that were mentioned by Mr. Gadenson have yet to be worked out in bipartisan fashion. I just talked to Mr. Boehner. He's unaware of any kind of a markup. I don't want to uh, understand. No, you just, know, to indicate. No, you've that answered. We'll never it. That's fine. There. That's fine. That's, but that's see, answer. we've see we've taken the action on the four select committees. Every argument in behalf of terminating, uh, perhaps uh, uh, too strong a word, the select committees can be made in spades on this outfit. And we've never gone pack with a past audit for the 7.7 .7 million. And if members have to cut back their official their official office allowance only to find out that many of the LSOs have a lot of carryover funds in banks and, you know, for whatever purpose. I just think we can get along fine uh, with your CMOs, i.e. your congressional member organizations that don't use the taxpayers' money in terms of setting up an organization and doing things that an individual member or no, a committee I, I uh, take your point. I, do. I don't disagree with your point at but all. What's wrong with this? If there's an institute or an organization that is directly connected to an LSO, and most of them are, and they have a lobbying purpose, and I'm not trying to purge, you know, to, uh, to simply perjure that. What I'm saying is, move them off campus. You know, they can do this business without the use of taxpayer funds. Do you have a list of the, of the um, LSOs? Do we have one? Just yes, so we had a chart right here, and I'll be happy to, sh to share that with you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Roberts, you, you mentioned this is a $35 million uh, item that we're dealing with here. Uh, and the, the big problem with it appears to be that about 20-some percent of it is not accounted for. Is that correct? That's correct. We spent uh, $34.6 million over 10 years, and uh, we went back and reviewed all of these expenditure reports, which are not really fully reported, and we're missing $7.7 .7 million. Now, let me be fair. Some of the LSOs have indicated they didn't put the clerk hire figure over on the final balance sheet. That's like somebody, you know, writing a check, but it isn't in your monthly uh, statement, okay? Mm -hmm. But even if you went back and checked that kind of information, there's still approximately six million that is missing. Now, it's either sloppy bookkeeping or, or the money is in a carryover fund or it's been misspent or it's in a bank somewhere. We, we, we don't know. So that that is not really in controversy that we're, we've got a bracket between six million and seven and a half million or seven and three quarters million. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm sure it would be controversial with each LSO that are some, by the way, are doing an excellent job. And there will be some that say, well, wait a minute, I wasn't on board when that happened. That, would, that happened way back in 1984 when you're trying to explain a Tiffany's gift or a trip to the Virgin Islands or a $9,000 rental in regards to a piano for some kind of a reception, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, basically, a lot of these expenditures are for social things that, uh, quite frankly, I think we can do on our own or simply off campus, off of, you know, off of Capitol Hill. The, the point I was trying to make is that we have taxpayers' money here that we seem to have lost track of, and it is our oversight responsibility to maintain uh, a track of that money, and that seems to me to be a somewhat pressing issue and somewhat different than the type of, uh, I would say, testimony that Mr. Gadenson gave us earlier, which was to get more into the debate on what the value of the LSOs are mm -hmm. and is or is or not a good use of taxpayers' money, which I think is a reasonable debate and a much broader question. Well. You know, let me give an example. Again, I have one staffer who works about 60% of her time on the Rural Health Care Coalition, but we pay her and all of the reporting is done on a regular basis like every member's office is reported. And I don't understand why people who belong to LSOs can't do the same kind of thing. Or if the institute or organization, say like uh, there is the, um, oh, the Art Institute that uh, works with the Arts Caucus and their primary function was to gain full funding of the National Endowment of the Arts. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just that to set up an LSO to do it, I think, is very uh, 
uh, complicating and it really duplicates the committee system. You could do it either through a CMO, a congressional member organization, which would be uh, simply voluntary on the part of the members using existing staff. Charlie Stenholm and I have a very good organization. We serve, you know, donuts and coffee, and we have meetings, and we have meetings with the appropriate people with the administration on the rural health care issue. We just don't have to have an LSO to do it. Now, the issue there is a very clear one. It's, uh, does this warrant taxpayers' money relative to the other uses and priorities for taxpayers' money in this age uh, with the budget deficits? Well, now, let me, let me have, draw, but <clears throat> you know, let me draw uh, a difference here in that uh, in the amendment that I would propose, it is, it is different from last year in that I would authorize the DSG and the RSC to continue as a legitimate arm of the leadership. Now, you're going to ask me, could they use clerk hire and the member's allowance, and the answer to that is no, I can't really legislate on an appropriation bill. It would have to be a line item. But I see, uh, I can say there is a legitimate uh, legislative interest in regards to the RSC and the DSG. Well, uh, I think that that's very good uh, perspective from, and I understand your explanation very clearly on that. I think there is a very big difference between exercising oversight on six to seven and three quarter million dollars that we've lost track of and getting into the debate. And I believe both issues de deserve debate on the floor of the House. I think it would be absolutely indefensible, given this information you've given us, not to have either an open rule or an amendment made in order to track this money down uh, and take the appropriate action uh, on the floor of the House. Uh, I certainly believe there will be merit in what Mr. Gaydon's uh, task force is doing as well. But I think that there is a greater urgency. Uh, and after what you've told us, I can't imagine uh, not uh, not having this body go forward and try and find out where exactly that money is. Uh, apparently, it's not going to be that difficult. Well, I think I think where we err is when we try, I don't want to say uh, uh, cover something up, but uh, I, 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 think, I think the benefit of, pul of full public disclosure and debate would be very helpful. Now, obviously, in some of these cases, you're not going to be able to go back that far to determine what happened to the money. In addition, let me point out that some LSOs do a very fine job and would like an opportunity to stand on the floor and say, yes, we are doing a good job, and I tried to recognize that as of the last amendment that we debated in the last session. That is all well and good, but as we all only too well know here, when one member or one thing goes wrong in the institution, we all suffer uh, the singeing uh, that goes along with that. And therefore, we have, uh, I think, a responsibility to be purer than Caesar's wife, especially with taxpayers' dollars. And if you've got this kind of evidence uh, and these kinds of charts, uh, I, I don't understand how we can delay in uh, Would the gentleman yield? I'd please. be happy to. Is there something I don't quite understand? Maybe you can, Pat, clear it up for me. Uh, I understood that the proposed amendments from you, aside from the franking one, had to do with prohibiting official expense or clerk hire funds to go to legislative service organizations. There was nothing here if we made an order for Mr. Roberts that necessarily was going to track down in any better fashion, more successfully than he's been able to in the past, where the money's gone over the past 10 years. Is now, that not we, we, uh, true? What happened in the debate as of last year is that in the midst of the debate, which was you know, rather you know, strong with adjectives and adverbs, understandably, uh, in that fashion, I didn't call for a recorded vote because the majority on the House Administration Committee said, let's try this one more time. And I asked for a GAO audit and an investigation. Neither were forthcoming. We got into a study that was prospective. How can we better apply rules and regs so make LSOs uh, uh, commensurate with what we do in committee and as members? And several of the LSOs, obviously with their nose out of joint, said, Roberts, why don't you take a longer look at this? We have really provided a valuable service. And we did. I think we're the only ones in the Congress who spent two or three months checking these individual spreadsheets, and out of approximately uh, 35 million bucks, 7.7 .7 million is missing. We don't know where it is. Now, we have said it could be sloppy bookkeeping, carry no, I understand over funds, all this. or Please, whatever. People are not I, I, it would not be my intent to go over that in the debate so much as to say that is, this is what has happened. You're in trying the past. to do away with these, right? Rather than going back and checking further. That's I'm the only thing I'm trying to, to clarify a, for yeah, my I, friend for, yeah. for Florida. You know, I'm trying to put them in a different pasture. I, I don't want to do away with, their, you know, you know, with their function. If the gentleman from California let me reclaim my time, my concern is I don't think I and I don't think most members want to be put in a position of having to vote for 
$4,000 for Watergate pastries, uh, $981 for staff travel to the Virgin's Islands for New Year's holidays and so forth. When this information is made public, this is the kind of thing that's going on. I would rather stop the flow, and if that's my choice, stopping the flow or not, the place to have the debate on this is on the floor and let those LSOs that can defend this kind of activity, and if there's incorrect, let it come forward at that time. No, that's fine. It's just that, forgive me if I'm if the would yield again. I just, I just miss, no I understand further. what you're saying now. There, we have before us the, the, the question of whether or not we make an order the, the proposal by the, our friend from Kansas to, to prohibit official expense or clerk higher funds, period. That's it. It's exactly. not a question of going beyond that and seeing where the money went. Apparently, they just can't find it. We won't find out, unfortunately, no matter what. So, I mean, that's, I mean, we have one issue in a sense. Yeah, it is. I, my, my point for the gentleman from California is good money is following bad here. Well, I understand the gentleman's point. That's, that's my that's issue. That's fine. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Quillen? No questions, because I know I, I missed one of the greatest uh, presentations <laughs> ever. The gentleman from Kansas is always very, very good, and Pat, we're glad to have you here. I thank the gentleman from Tennessee. Thank you very much, Mr. Roberts. I have one further amendment with Mr. Upton, and we can be very brief, Mr. Chairman. Surely. If he would allow us to do that. Go ahead. All right. The Upton-Roberts amendment is a striking amendment that would reduce the official mail allowance from uh, 45 8 uh, to 35 6 million. That is a 10 million point, a 10.2 million uh, reduction of the committee recommendation. Uh, what we're really doing, Mr. Chairman, uh, we took a look at the, um, at the authorization and the appropriation levels in 91 and 92, and we projected them out to 93. In 1991, we appropriated $59 million. We expended, in terms of the official mail allowance, $31.3 million. That left a cushion, or a bank, if you will, of $28 million. Uh, th those funds obviously were used for reprogramming, and we think that uh, if you would simply lower the amendment in terms of the allowance more in keeping with what we will spend on mail, it certainly would be better. Uh, it isn't that we are diametrically opposed to reprogramming, but it seems to me that's an open invitation. And if we had some honest, um, uh, I guess, budgeting, if we need uh, certain things, we ought to do it that way. In 92, uh, there was 71 million authorized, 80 million actually appropriated, and we spent 34.3 million in the calendar year. That's the first year we had the public disclosure uh, and the account. Uh, and then as of this year, we have authorized 71 million. We're going to appropriate 47.7 million, and I certainly uh, credit the folks who went down from that figure, but we're still going to have 15 to 20 million dollars in regards to. Uh, sort of an unused bank account here we can use for reprogramming. Now let me say, having served on the police and personnel subcommittee, there was a time during the Persian Gulf situation when security demanded an increase in the Capitol Hill police force, and so some of those funds were taken from reprogramming. I buy that, but we should have done it either with a supplemental or, say, up front. I think, you know, the one example we could all more or less agree on, although, you know, all the work is done, the Reprogramming funds were the funds originally used for the extension and the remodeling of the western front of this capital. Every member heard debate after debate after debate for I don't know how many years on whether we do this or not. And with the reprogramming funds, we started it, and then the argument was, well, since we started it, we're going to have to finish it. Now, since it's finished, uh, you know, you know there's some very fine meeting rooms, and I think it's probably in the long run it will serve the interest of the capital, but we didn't go through the right kind of process. So the effort is twofold to try to bring the funding level in line with what we usually spend on mail in the off year, and also to prevent sort of a build up here in terms of a reprogramming bank, and I yield to my good friend and colleague from Michigan. Mr. Upton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to submit my uh, prepared statement for the record. Without objection, the entire statement of the gentleman will appear on the record. I'd like to make just a couple of points. Uh, historically, Mr. Roberts and, Ms. and I have been able to offer such an amendment virtually every year, I think, that we've been in the Congress. So this is not a precedence uh, breaking at all. Uh, the reason why we settled on the dollar amount that we did was that historically we spend about 50 percent of what is authorized. 50% of what uh, was authorized in calendar year 92 is right about where we are here, $35 million. And 
I know that from my perspective, and I think most members, as I've talked to them uh, in, the, in recent weeks, we're getting a lot of mail these days. In fact, it's about, for me, 800 letters or cards a week. Well, if you multiply that times the amount of a first-class stamp times 52 weeks times uh, 440 members, this dollar amount is still about six times more than what is needed to respond to every letter that comes into our office. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why many offices, including mine, last year were able to send back or not spend $100,000 uh, for our own mail account. And I think that anything less would not be penny wise in terms of as we look at this uh, amendment. And I would hope that you would agree that we would be able to uh, be allowed to offer our amendment. Uh, and I think that it would be one that would pass on the floor. Uh, if the gentleman would yield. Uh, I want to point out, Mr. Chairman, we add a cushion of 1.1 million or 3.1 percent to the 34.5 uh, for any kind of growth or change in the mailing practices. Obviously, we can't control that if you get a, a flood of mail in, but it's been my experience again on the police and personnel um, uh, subcommittee when uh, we were, <laughs> I guess, in charge of the postal operation here, uh, that uh, it's been in past practices that that percent would allow for any change. And so we think it's right on the money in terms of what we're going to spend. If we would need some in terms of answer the mail, obviously we could do a, a supplemental or we could take care of it. Mr. Ellison? One quick question, if I may. I, I thought I understood what you were proposing and rather agreed with it until my friend from Michigan uh, spoke in terms of having enough in, in one's account to respond to the, to the increased amount of mail we have. You're not saying we should not have enough that we... That no, I'm, what I'm saying is that this is still going to be about six times what is needed to respond response. individually. So, there's to, I mean, so you, you still have a, a good cushion for your town meeting notices and, okay. and newsletters, the things okay. of that nature. And, and the only intent involved here really is for us to basically appropriate the amount we think we actually will use. That's right. Yes, sir. Okay. That's right. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Quiller. Mr. Goss. Thank you. I think that's a very refreshing idea. Uh, may I ask a question about how much uh, mail do you get on a weekly basis in your office, Mr. Upton? Do you know? For me, it's about it's been about 800 letters a week in recent weeks. Mr. Roberts, do you have any idea? We get about 150 a day. Uh, just a you know a whole lot more now that the BTU tax is uh, <coughs> has been proposed and people are starting to pencil that out. We're getting a whole a whole flood of mail. Our, our experience in our office is we run probably on the average about 2,000 letters a week. We do send out town meeting cars and we spend 25 percent of our uh, franking allowance. And if that's any useful guideline, the type of thing you're trying to propose, so you're welcome to it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Honorable Karen English. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I have a simple, probably shouldn't say that this early in my comments, um, <laughs> amendment for um, uh, rescinding a total of $1,621,754.77. Specimens we've heard all day of house funds left over from fiscal years 1991 and 1992. Uh, during those years, house funds were appropriated to remain available uh, until expended. Those funds have not been expended. There are some purchase orders still outstanding for equipment and supplies for both 1991 and 1992. Funds still available <coughs> after the rescission will allow those bills which are proper and ordinary to be paid. This amendment eliminates all excess funds that we know about and that remain in the 1991 and 1992 accounts of the House. Um, my colleague, um, Congressman Stupak, has some description of those funds. Mr. Stupak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, of the $1.6 billion that uh, we're looking to rescind, uh, in 1991, would come out of the salaries and expense account from the House of Representatives, which would come from the House leadership offices, uh, members, clerk hire, the, some of the standing committees, the select committees, and the special committees of the House. And even the Committee on Appropriations uh, would also refund some money back here. And then in 1992, 
approximately 891,000 would again come from house leadership offices, members, clerk hire, and also other allowances for offices and salaries, officers and employees. So when you put that all together, Mr. Chairman, it's about $1.6 billion that uh, house leadership offices have made available and other special accounts we have in the house that can be put back to the taxpayers of this country. Thank you. Mr. Billings? It sounds good. I mean, I think I don't see how anybody could be opposed to it. Do we, do we know? Do you all, have you all found out what happens to this money if we don't um, stay do this? There. It stays, it stays in the uh, Forever, remaining sort of. accounts, or it stays it can in the be accounts used until it's expended. And, and some of these dollars have been there quite a few years. Okay, thanks. It's thanks referred to as slush funds in, in <laughs> by some of the public, and I think it's time to eliminate those. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Are these funds transferable to another member? At this point, I don't believe so. They are in, they remain in the fund until expended. Is that a request, Mr. Quinn? <laughs> well, that's a suggestion. <laughs> you know, I, I think if we don't keep in touch with our constituents, we just become uh, a non-identity. And if we keep hammering away at what we can spend, and that's exactly what's going to happen. I think we ought to zero in on the agencies that spend billions of dollars. And this is a stepping stone, I agree. Cutting a million dollars from one uh, appropriation bill from one item. It's just like uh, throwing a pebble in the ocean. Maybe it could catch on. I don't understand why all the emphasis is on the legislative branch of the Congress. Admittedly, the perception is bad in the eyes of the public that we spend and waste an awful lot of money. I put out uh, one notice every two years inviting people to come by for an open door in each of my counties, and that's what I spend. If I didn't do that, I could go into a county and set up an office. I wouldn't have anybody there. And I don't see anything wrong with it. And I answer all of my mail. I answer all the petitions. I'm very careful in the 31 years that I've been here. But if we keep hammering away at our own throats and our heads, I don't know what the end result no one can say that I'm not a conservative. No one can say that I don't vote to save money. I do. But I guess the philosophy is to walk a mile, you first got to take a single step. And if we take the single step in cutting $500,000 or a million dollars, then we're going to take another step to cut even more money. I hope that philosophy carries over, whether it does or not, I don't know. Certainly it hadn't carried over in the period of time that I've been here. The perception in the eyes of the people, we're playing up to that perception and we're creating. I hope that we do not continue to do so. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Goss. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I. Uh, I think that Mr. Bielenson has asked a question that is a little more than rhetorical. Who could be against this? Um, I would like to know where the numbers came from and what the proportion, the division is, how much is in the Speaker's office and how much is in the Leader's office, what was the original intent of the funds. Uh, and then I, I have a somewhat different understanding, although I very much congratulate your effort to get these funds back to the taxpayers or into some higher priority use other than sitting around, as you say. Um, my understanding was that if these aren't reprogrammed for lawful purposes uh, within the purview of the people who can do that in a specific period of time, a time certain, that these monies revert to the U.S. Treasury. Uh, is that incorrect? Well, it is our understanding that the $1.6 million that we're speaking of... Is it million or billion? It's million. 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 It's million. I misspoke earlier. It's uh, okay. $1.6 just million. Probably ought to that it would that go with the recent uh, legislation that has been passed, the Budget Reconciliation Act, that it would go in the Deficit Reduction Trust Fund. 
as that legislation said, all monies saved would then go into that uh, fund, and that is our understanding and our intent where this 1.6 million would go. I agree with the other gentleman, it may only be a pebble, but uh, gotta have a heck of a lot of pebbles before you can build a Oh, I think this, uh, that 1.6 million is, is a big pebble. Uh, if, if I were dealing with it myself, I'd find it a large rock, uh, in fact. Um, the, the issue uh, here, it seems to me, is to get the money to a priority use, uh, and, and that's what I'm aiming at, and I share very much your goal to get it out of limbo uh, back into some priority use, and I would certainly say deficit reduction is a tremendously worthy goal. It's not one we've done well at, and uh, this would, that would be a good step, and perhaps some, symbolic in some ways, but nevertheless a good step. My question is, uh, am I wrong in saying that there was provision to return these monies to the Treasury if they were not reprogrammed, and that those who have the authority to reprogram them uh, are supporting your amendment? M Mr. Goss, it's my understanding. Um, I don't know the answer to the first part of it. It is my understanding that it would stay in the account until, uh, until it is removed. And uh, we do have support for this amendment. From uh, the Speaker's office? From the Speaker's office. And from and the Minority Leader's from office as well? eight different um, um, locations that they would be coming out of. And Mr. Stupak uh, okay. mentioned those locations, those accounts earlier. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You. Chairman. Mm -hmm. The Honorable Tom Ridge of Pennsylvania. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. My colleagues, I thank you for the opportunity to uh, offer this amendment. I ask unanimous consent that my entire statement be included as part Without of Without objection. We recall about 14, 15 months ago, in the wake of the problems that we encountered with the House Bank and the House Post Office and with the House Restaurant, uh, there was a bipartisan task force on reform of uh, Congress that was appointed in, in March of 92. And then in April, a reform package was passed. Uh, it was somewhat mislabeled, and there was a particular office in the reform package that I think was horribly mislabeled, and that was called the Inspector General's Office. It was not only mislabeled, but here a year later, it still is a vacant office. And it's troubling to me because it was not the kind of uh, a serious effort that I thought uh, we had undertaken when eight Republicans and eight Democrats started talking about uh, reform of the, uh, the process. Uh, it's troubling because it is not the kind of inspector general that exists uh, throughout uh, this town. Uh, we started back, Congress started back in 1976, uh, enacting legislation imposing the offices of inspector general throughout the executive branch of the government. I think since 1976, Congress has imposed upon the executive branch of the government 61 offices of inspector general, 14 uh, cabinet uh, offices, uh, regulatory commissions, uh, major departments and agencies. So Congress, I think, appropriately so, uh, exercised its legislative uh, authority and initiative, created an, an entity called an inspector general. We made it autonomous. We made it independent. We gave it uh, auditing authority. And from time to time, Congress appropriately exercising its uh, legitimate oversight responsibility calls upon these inspector generals to come up to the hill. We don't have that kind of inspector general uh, in the uh, reform package. We don't have any inspector general, number one. It's, it's still vacant. And basically what this amendment would say that uh, uh, no monies available in the act for the operations of the inspector general of the House of Representatives will be appropriated unless the inspector general, who will still operate at the direction of the Committee of House Administration, not as autonomous as I would like it, but it's still at the uh, direction of the uh, Office of uh, the Committee of House Administration, expand, uh, frankly, the, the duties and the responsibilities for auditing and investigation. And that's uh, pretty much uh, the straightforward uh, amendment. I must tell my colleagues that in 1990 alone, the offices of Inspector General in the executive branch of the government uh, proceeded and found enough for several thousand criminal investigations and convictions, recovered through either fines or penalties or out-of-court settlements about $750 million, 
Uh, President uh, Bush's uh, task force and review of uh, uh, regulatory uh, uh, environment and, and how we go about better utilizing taxpayers' dollars attributed about $15 billion worth of savings to the use of the Office of the Inspector General. Uh, but we don't have that kind of tool available to us again in the House of Representatives. I might say to you that every time a subcommittee or full committee invites the IG from one of the executive branches to the Hill, we confirm, uh, we re-emphasize uh, our commitment in a very formal way that we ought to have within the institutions of government independent autonomous auditing entities to help us determine whether or not whether or not taxpayers dollars are being appropriately spended last year alone the congress on nearly 180 occasions committees and subcommittees said to inspector generals come on up to the hill we want to talk to you about personnel practices we want to talk to you about cost overruns we want to talk to you about this or that we have given inspector generals very very impressive authority as we look to them to oversee activities in the executive branch. I just want to expand the duties and the responsibilities of the IG as we oversee our own use of taxpayers' dollars. I think it's a case uh, too long. Again, Congress uh, found it in its wisdom to enact some legislation uh, to oversee everybody else, uh, but not itself. And I think it's about time, since we have authorized 61 IGs, downtown uh, since we called upon them 180 times nearly 180 times last year to come on up to the hill to oversee uh, help us oversee where these taxpayers dollars are going that we expand again only at the direction of the uh, committee and house administration some of these duties i couldn't help but uh, think that the seven plus million dollars that our colleague pat roberts was talking about and, and wondering where those dollars uh, where they've gone if you had an ig with the duties and responsibilities uh, that we would include in this extension and this amendment, uh, we would probably know where that $7 million has gone. Of course, there are some that maybe don't want to know, and maybe that's why the position is not filled yet. But I would respectfully request that this matter be given uh, consideration and debate on the uh, House floor. Thank you, Tom. Questions of Mr. Ridge? Mr. Quillen? Mr. Goss? I presume you're requesting a waiver for legislation. Yes, Yes. Thank you. It's clear. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Quill. Tom, uh, do you feel that we have too many inspector generals? I do. Well, we may, there may be a, a difference of opinion as to whether we have too many inspector generals in the executive branch of uh, government, but we have none uh, overseeing the legislative branch of government. And I'm not looking for too many, I'm just looking for one. Well, I know that, and I'm not against what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me that every agency has an inspector general, and maybe a number of them, but we never hear their report. I don't know what they really do. I'm not on the committee that would hear those reports, but... Uh, well, I would say respectfully to my friend and colleague that last year in 1992, depending on the committee uh, or subcommittee, uh, there were 180, almost 180 occasions where uh, sometimes uh, in bipartisan effort, Republicans and Democrats asked somebody to come to the Hill and make a report. I just think the same kind of bipartisan approach uh, toward the oversight of nearly $700 million expended uh, through the Congress of the United States is appropriate. Well, bipartisan would be fine. I, I know that we, under the Iran Contra, uh, some of the IG's reports were not nonpartisan. Mm -hmm. So I just point that out. I, I certainly have no objection to what you're talking about. It seems to me that we could save money by eliminating a lot of the bureaucracy in the IG. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Mr. Thanks Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hefley, I think you're next, sir. Joel Hefley. We are currently experiencing some technical difficulties. We ask that you please stand by.
I think emphasizes the fact that, and that uh, we are becoming more and more conscious of the fact that we need to get a grip on our spending. We need to get this spending under control. And we're seeing amendments that kind of nibble around the edge, and we're seeing amendments that make dramatic change, that look at whole programs and say whole programs, as Pat Roberts' suggestion uh, was, that whole programs uh, have to go. Mr. Chairman, earlier this year, we eliminated the House Select Committees in an effort to streamline Congress, and I supported this effort. I think most of us uh, in this room supported this effort. My amendment today would take, I think, the next logical step by eliminating funding for the Joint Committee on Taxation. Again, not nibbling around the edges, but looking at whole programs and determining not whether maybe they are nice to have, but whether we absolutely have to have them. Officially, the Joint Committee on Taxation is asked to provide objective bipartisan advice to the House and Senate on tax matters. Unofficially, it seems to be more of a holding tank for tax experts whose 80 employees' efforts are duplicated by other bodies. Both Ways and Means, the Ways and Means Committee and the Finance Committee have tax staffs. They could act as li liaison to the Treasury and outside interest groups. CBO scores uh, legislation having a uh, revenue spending impact. Why not maybe have CBO also score tax legislation as well. And if they need to add a few people to help them do this, I, if we eliminated uh, the Joint Committee on Taxation, there would be a few people that they could pick up from that, perhaps. Mr. Chairman, the Joint Committee on Taxation was created in 1926. It was created at a time when the Ways and Means Committee had six or eight employees. Today, the Ways and Means Committee has 138 employees. The JCT is a luxury Congress, and I think, Mr. Chairman, the American taxpayers can no longer afford, and I request the Rules Committee to make this amendment in order, and let's take it to the floor, and let's discuss this, because I think it will open the, the opportunity for us to begin to take the broader look at, at really getting away with majors, doing away with major segments that have grown up, and grown up for good reasons over the years, but maybe those good reasons don't still exist. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Mr. Goss, sir, any questions of our friend from Colorado? Not at all. I think he's very uh, articulately uh, presented a case that uh, is exactly in line with what message we are getting from the people of this country, and that is they want us to cut lower priority or redundant or wasteful spending. And I think the gentleman has his finger on one of those areas. They Thank also you. want us to cut other spending, such as our salaries. There would be a long and lengthy debate, Mr. Chairman, over the degree of necessity in those salaries, I suspect, but that wouldn't be the right issue. The issue would be whether we earned them. That would be the tough part of the I'd debate. I'd like to say to the folks in Florida who are looking in that you certainly do, sir. You're worth every and penny we pay you and more. <laughs> and I will say to the people of California are equally well served by the distinguished chairman. Let's go to Mr. Bunning. Thanks, Can Mr. We, Mr. Can chairman, we have five minutes Mr. to chair here? Mr. Chairman, before I leave, don't, don't you have any words for the people of Colorado? <laughs> Colorado. That's out west in the Rockies there. Somewhere yes. in between, Mr. Chairman. got some nice folks, too. Gentlemen from Mr. Kentucky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, wants to eliminate something else like, here. That's exactly right. It yeah. seems like this is Elimination Day uh, prior to the All-Star Game. Uh, thank you uh, for allowing me to testify. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss an amendment which I believe is very timely and appropriate, like many others that have been presented prior to, the, prior to me uh, coming forth. At a time when our country is looking at uh, Congress and looking for us to uh, do some belt tightening, uh, I think we must examine all of the workings of Congress and decide where we can become more efficient. And I'd like to offer an amendment to eliminate the Joint Economic Committee. Earlier this year, the House made a good uh, decision, as my good friend from Colorado has stated, uh, to eliminate three uh, committees uh, of jurisdiction, select committees, because of overlapping jurisdictions. Well, I believe the Joint Economic Committee is another example of unnecessary duplication. The Joint Committee on Taxation, the Ways and Means Committee, the Budget Committee are well equipped and well staffed to assume any duties that the JEC now carries out. With the passage of the 
1974 Budget Act and Enforcement and Control Act, JEC's role of economic advisor was diminished and many of its duties were taken over by joint tax and by the Ways and Means and by the Budget Committee. We can do without it and it would save just a little under four million bucks. In this bill, joint tax will be appropriated 5.7 million, Ways and Means spends about 4.9, and the Budget Committee receives about 6.7 million. So there's a total of just around $17 million. That's enough. We should be able to do without the $3.9 million for the Joint Economic Committee. And I ask for a favorable consideration of this amendment on the floor. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Quillen, any questions, sir? Mr. Porter Goss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I certainly agree that uh, this is a, a topic uh, that is worthy of consideration and, and should uh, have the opportunity to be debated on the uh, floor by the full House. I think every member has an interest in this, and I think every member has an interest in saving dollars. And I think you're right on target. Thank we'll do our best. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Mr. Beener, I think you're next, sir. Am I right or am I wrong? Sorry. Mr. Tom, I'm here with Craig Thomas, and my staff just went out to get him, so he's okay. not here. Okay. Should we? Is he nearby? Okay. John, why don't you go? Well, Mr. Chairman, my colleagues, good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity here in the Rules Committee to, for members to come up and offer amendments to the Legislative Appropriation Bill. I have two amendments that I've submitted to the committee for your consideration uh, to be included, hopefully, under the rule. Uh, if I could cover the, the easier one first, uh, I think it would uh, make the second one give us more time to discuss it. I agree but the uh, first uh, amendment that I offer uh, would make the allowances and expenditures of the architect of the capital's funds for fiscal year 1994 subject to the same conditions of disclosure as members and committees in the clerk of the House report. As you know, under the legislative appropriation bill, uh, we appropriate money for the architect's office and try to find out uh, how the architect spends the money that's appropriated to him. Doesn't show up in the clerk's report, doesn't show up in the Senate report. He may report it somewhere, uh, but I've never been able to find it. And I think that if funds are being appropriated uh, by the House for the architect of the Capitol, that those expenditures uh, should show up clearly uh, in, the, uh, in the clerk's report. Uh, that's the sum total of that amendment. I mean, quick, quick question yes. while we're on it. Uh, do other sort of Groupings within the within the legislative branch are they required to, to report quarterly as you would have the the architect? I mean, is this the fact that he does not report quarterly something different from what other people do? Do you know? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. I think all those other funds uh, show up quarterly in the they report. Do. Okay. Okay, sir. Frank Mail. Second amendment uh, deals with the congressional frank, the free mailing privileges that we as members of Congress have. And this amendment would eliminate the frank uh, for all mail except in direct response to mail that we receive in our offices, a mail to another member or another uh, federal, state, or local government official, uh, news releases, and administrative uh, duties that we have in our offices. In other words, we would eliminate most of the mail uh, that goes out of here on a daily basis. Last year, Congress spent some $34 million uh, on free postage for members of Congress. Uh, in my office, uh, I spent 7.5% of the funds that were allocated to me, about $14,000 last year and $14,000 the year before out of a budget of about $170,000. Uh, the point that I make is this. Uh, we're trying to find ways to, to save money uh, here running the legislative branch of government. Uh, and I think that saving, in round numbers, almost $30 million uh, of postage uh, that uh, is used primarily, uh, in my view, of, to reelect members of Congress is wrong. Uh, we've been down this path several times, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you and I have discussed this uh, amendment that I've offered, uh, tried to have offered on the floor on several occasions. And uh, every mail, Every member ought to be able to answer the mail that they get from their office, from their districts, uh, 
but to continue to allow members to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars of taxpayer funds on postage, uh, sending out newsletters, uh, I believe, is inappropriate. Now, this amendment uh, certainly is subject uh, uh, to uh, a point of order, as some would, would indicate that it may be uh, legislating in an appropriations bill. But I would suggest to you that uh, it's going to strike vast sums of money from the franking account. And I don't want to put any undue hardship on any member by saying, I could have said as an example, a strike, uh, uh, just take a round number, give every member $25,000 uh, to answer the mail that comes in. Uh, but some members get more mail than others. And so I don't want to restrict anybody's uh, ability to take care of, of their own mail. And so I offer uh, this amendment, I uh, hope that you will grant it a waiver. I know that that's not uh, customary for members of, of the minority, uh, but uh, certainly something that does happen in this committee, and I'd appreciate your consideration of not only this amendment, uh, but uh, the architect's uh, amendment as well. Thank you very much, John. Uh, let me respond just very briefly, if I may, before we go to our friends here for, for questions. Um, you do, if you, you do, as one needn't point out, raise real and serious questions. I mean, they are, they are real, and I and I sympathize to a great extent with what you're with what you're trying to do. But it, it's it's a little bit more complex than that too, as, as you yourself are well aware. But perhaps not everybody watching in. Um, we do have, to a certain extent, perhaps some some duty to communicate with people. Each of us, I suppose, looks at this from his own personal or her own personal viewpoint. In this case, you know, you're, you're speaking to somebody who, who I suppose uses half or perhaps two thirds of the amount of money that he he's allowed to for, you know, for franking mail. I do it for mailing out town hall meetings because, as we discussed earlier, people don't come to them if you just put a notice in the paper. But if you mail it out to registered voters or to postal patrons, as many of us do, you do get a couple hundred people, and for them it's a good thing. They learn about stuff. They get a chance to talk to you. For those of us in the legislature, I must tell you, I mean, I'm sure you do too. Any of you who have it. You learn an immense amount, you know, being subjected to two hours of comments, questions, and whatever else, you know, speeches and rhetorical questions from, you know, from, from constituents of yours. I also, as do many of our colleagues, and uh, this is self-serving to say, I mean, I happen to think more of my questionnaires than, than a lot of others. A lot of guys ask questions like, do you think we should crack down on drugs? So you get 98% yes, 2% no, or, you know, things of that sort. But we ask really complex questions uh, in the course of which, uh, I wish I brought one up to show you because I'm really proud of our questionnaires. We, we, in the course of which we educate people back home and in return I hear from 15 to 18 to 20,000 people and I really do get a feel for what's on people's minds and what their opinions are in a way I wouldn't if I weren't able to do this. And finally, I and some of our colleagues put out one or two general purpose newsletters a year. They vary hugely. I try again, speaking only for myself, to, to discuss in a, in a serious manner some major issues which are before the Congress. Now the real problem comes for me, and I assume for you, uh, when you see sometimes the kind of stuff that is put out by some of our colleagues, you can barely distinguish it from campaign mail. It's got pictures of the, you know, of the of the member all over the place. It's it's got basically nonsense in there, if I may say so. Uh, he or she puts in things which he knows will appeal to the people back home. Not not a serious discussion of the issues. Uh, I, what I frankly wish were, because $34 million is real money, but, you know, spread over the entire country, it's not a huge amount of money. If it enables us to communicate in a real and serious and grown-up way with our, with our, you know, hundreds of millions of, of, of constituents, I really wish we could succeed somehow in cracking down, finally, on the kinds of stuff that people send out uh, so that it is, you know, it is clearly intended to be something other than campaign-type mail, which too much of it is. With respect to the latter, I agree with you completely. It's a disgrace. Well, but for Chair those of us who try to be serious in terms of our communication with people, we'd be unable to communicate, except in response to letters. But you know, we have a we have a duty to to educate people, to lead people, to discuss issues, which which I think we'd be deprived of, of being able to do. Well, I agree that we do have a responsibility uh, to communicate uh, uh, with our constituents. Uh, the congressional frank goes back uh, to the beginning of the first Congress, and uh, and it's. We've had it for 200 years. The means of communication today, as compared with 200 years ago, 100 years ago, even 50 years ago, the means of communication with our constituents has increased, obviously, in a pretty dramatic way. And but only for some of you. For those of us who live in big urban areas, there's no way to get to people. We're never on television. We're never on radio. The only way we get to people is by mail. 
Anyway, forgive me for interrupting. I'm sure. But even you... for those members who, who really believe that they have to have the mail, uh, most members uh, uh, are pretty adept at raising campaign money. Even some of my good friends who send a, an awful lot of mail that I think is inappropriate, uh, if they feel that strongly about it, uh, using their campaign funds uh, to send that uh, may, be, may be much more appropriate. Absolutely. Yeah, it is. Well, I understand. Or, or it's government or, mail. Well, or even or newsletters as such, I think. Anyway. All I know is every time I drive across... As campaign literature, it can be sent. Every time, every time my wife and I drive across Ohio, we stop, you know, in a cafe or something. People say, well, "Gee, we never hear from our congressman, John. <laughs> Who is it?" I said, "It's John Boehner. He's a really good guy, but he should be writing you more often." <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Let's go to more serious people over here, Mr. Solomon. I'd be glad to yield our chairman over there. If oh, sorry, Mr. Well, chairman. No, no, I, I, I enjoy being here, but uh, uh, I, I remember uh, what, the reason I said that because at one time <clears throat> I wanted to send something out. And they looked at it and they said, you can't use campaign funds to send it out. So that, that's why I know that they're... Right, if it, you can't <coughs> use campaign funds if it's an official piece. Yeah. But if you think it's important enough to send uh, on your behalf, you can, you can do it out of your campaign account. It can be clearly marked that it's paid for and, and, and mailed uh, by, by the campaign committee. That's certainly appropriate if you want to do that. But I just think that uh, uh, we've been struggling with this issue of, of the Frank for some time. We've made progress, and I want to uh, congratulate the chairman of the committee and the subcommittee chairman. We've made progress. We now have accountability. We have budgets. Uh, those numbers are published. And the use of the Frank continues uh, to go down. The, no the dollars we're saving continue to be significant. Uh, but I would argue uh, that we could save a lot more money, and we could give challengers in elections, a, a much better opportunity uh, by eliminating the frank. Actually, uh, somebody remarked that uh, my franking cost was so low they weren't sure that I still write my mother. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't use the frank as much as a lot of people do. But uh, so it's not that I'm arguing that for personal viewpoint. But, but Mr. I know Chairman, some when I people... write my mother, I put a stamp on. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, does your mother live in my district or your district? <laughs> Actually, my mother's passed away, so. It, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I contact it directly now. Don't use the mail. <laughs> oh, Mr. Brother. Solomon. Well, John, I'm sorry <coughs> that I um, missed uh, the early part of your testimony. Uh, it was good. Uh, however, I know your amendments uh, very well. And uh, uh, first of all, let me just point out that uh, my good friend Mr. Bielenson says that he has difficulty uh, coming from a very heavily populated area with small in geography of uh, getting his constituents to know who he is. And that's, that's probably true. Uh, I have just the opposite uh, sort of a problem. Uh, my district, even though it's in New York State, covers 10,000 square miles, and it's about 270 miles in length. And it has a, uh, seven major television audiences. Um, one is uh, Montreal, Canada. <laughs> one is uh, Burlington, Vermont, over in another state. Another is uh, Connecticut. Another is New York City, which is completely divorced from, uh, from the people I represent. <coughs> and then the Poughkeepsie, Kingston area, and the Albany Capital District area. And um, so I have a sort of a different problem uh, of getting uh, uh, my word out to the people uh, that want to know where I stand on certain issues. Now, after 15 years, they don't have much of a problem anymore because I guess I have a, about a 90% uh, name recognition and everybody knows where I stand on every issue, whether they like it or not. Uh, but uh, I do uh, have some sympathy with, uh, with people coming from heavily populated areas who, when they get off a plane, they, they don't get any television time. Uh, uh, that's difficult, and it's difficult in areas like mine. Be that as it may, uh, I think you have a point. I really sort of resent uh, many members who, uh, who frank the entire voter registration in their districts. In other words, they have it broken down, Mr. and Mrs. John Jones, and then they have it broken down by ethnic groups. So they could, for instance, write to every uh, Irish family in their district and send them a, a, uh, a targeted message. They could write to an Italian family or to a, uh, a large Ukraine uh, population that I have in my district. And that's wrong. Uh, I send out a questionnaire, uh, a very comprehensive questionnaire, at the uh, first of every year, around January uh, 2nd or 3rd. And I really depend on that because you try to make it as unbiased or, you know, uh, try not to leave the answers. 
um, because it really does help you in a district like mine where people come that are New York City oriented or they are, they're uh, Canadian oriented and it's very difficult to get a really a cross section of, of where people, uh, what, what they believe. So uh, I, don't know, I guess I have some mixed emotions about it. I think we really ought to ban a lot of what yours say, but, but I don't think we ought to ban the questionnaire. Uh, uh, so the problem that you have is that we don't have a committee uh, really uh, that produces an authorizing bill. So you're here uh, asking to legislate in an appropriation bill. Uh, I'm here to do the same thing. Well, I support your, your right to offer those amendments. You should have that opportunity because really this is an authorizing bill and an appropriation bill because there is no authorizing bill. And you should really have your day in court to, uh, to work your will on the floor. And uh, I would just point out that there are 32 different provisions in this bill that is produced by the appropriators where they are legislating in their own appropriation bill, which they're not allowed to do. They need waivers of points of order to do that. Uh, the same as you need a waiver of point of order. The same as I need one to, um, to uh, put my amendment on the floor that won't get knocked out on a point of order that uh, requires random drug testing of all uh, legislative employees, all 37,000 of them. Uh, but the reason you have to come and I have to come is because there is no authorizing bill and there hasn't been one for six years where you could actually attach your legislation. If so my friend would be glad for a moment. There's something useful we could do here between the three of us. A few other guys will join in. Um, I, I happen to agree completely with what I think our friend Jerry Solomon is saying. I, I don't like the sort of specialized, non-responsive mailings. I mean, people do write to the Irish, to the Jews, to the Ukraines in your district, uh, or to real estate brokers, or to lawyers, or to doctors, or even to senior citizens. I really think we should limit or prohibit that. I really do. I think many of our colleagues would be very angry with us if we did, but I think we should. That's clearly sort of campaign type mail because you know what's on their minds, you know what they want to hear, and you can tailor your message for and them. And that's where the biggest abuse is. Well, I agree. Back. That's where the abuse is. What we should ago. do is require, if at all, and I do think we should allow them, uh, require mailings to be, to be uh, district wide. That is, you have to say the same thing to everybody uh, or ask the same thing of everyone instead Registered of tailoring your message. Or not. Pardon? Registered voter or not? Well, whatever. I only mail to registered voters only because. Because, you know, if people don't bother to register to vote, I'm not going to waste taxpayers' money mailing them things, frankly. I send the same thing to Republicans, Democrats, Independents. Uh, but some people send post a patron, I don't care. But in any case, I don't think you should be able to, I don't think you should be able to keep little uh, things on your computer, uh, dividing people into different segments, either by, either by uh, race or origin. And you make a point, because although we've saved Frankie money in total over the last several years, what's happening is with, with uh, the advance of technology, the member's ability to target a message into very small audiences has increased. Uh, well, that should be prohibited, and, in my opinion. And it, we all know it goes on. Well, you should write a amendment, if I may be so bold, as to, as to prohibit that. I think you get a lot of support for well, it. Well, the, the gentleman made a good point uh, earlier today, Mr. Bielenson, when he said that um, if he didn't send out his notices uh, for his town meetings, that, he, that nobody would show up. And uh, I have the same problem in, in my 10,000 square mile area. Um, I send out a notice when my mobile office is going to be traveling this huge district. And if I didn't send that out, my mobile office would go into the town of Corinth, and I have no way, they have no local newspaper, I have no way of letting those people know that my mobile office is going to be there on, on a particular day. So uh, we really need to look into it, and, and I think a, that to just abolish these, uh, these targeted mailings, but if you have a questionnaire or if you want to notify of a town meeting, you know, that to me is a service to the, to the community. And it would, you could substantially, you could wipe out 80% of the entire franking cost if you did just that. I appreciate your coming and we'll do everything we can to make your amendment in order. Thank you. Oh, Ms. Slaughter. Thanks, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I've been here, I'm starting my fourth term and I've never seen anything, uh, every single year we have this issue up on the floor. and. I know you're not doing this, but I can tell you that every year when it comes up that numbers of people vote for it who frank beyond belief. And they will vote with you and pray to God that it, it never happens. Pass. Yeah. Right? So I've been one of those people all these times trying to go ahead and say, well, I'm going to assume that these people have some idea what they're doing and vote it. I'm getting tired of it. I use almost no frank mail. But I do really believe that 
the money that is allocated for frank mail is should be determined by the member himself or herself as to what the best use of that is in, in, in talking to their constituents i'm not sure we can hamstring every single thing down to say you can only send a postcard every fourth month or something the mail is overwhelming uh, we're at the point now where i really i don't have staff even enough to answer it but I get a lot more complaints in my district for saying I haven't heard yet back from you than, good Lord, will you stop writing to me? I mean, because we don't, obviously we don't do that. But I wish that we really could determine that there is part of the office expense a certain amount of money for responding to mail and let members decide how to use it. I mean, I, I presume, presumably we were grown up enough to do that. We've whittled it down. It's probably less than half of what it was when I first came here, and I don't think anybody misses it. But I think you can almost reach that point where we are going to be totally unable to even respond to the letters that are sent to us. And I don't think that benefits either this body or the people we represent. Well, and I'm not, I'm not suggesting that we, we eliminate members' ability to answer their mail uh, or to eliminate the Frank for that purpose at all. Matter of fact, my, the amendment specifically. Uh, excludes, it bans the use of the franc except in the case of response mail, uh, communications with other office holders, federal, state, and local, the communications uh, uh, of a general nature that you need to do in your office. Basically what we're talking about is banning mass mailings. Well, you know, though, I, let me throw this out. I don't know if this is possible at all, but maybe it might be worth concentrating on, thinking about a little bit. Um, the members in the past who have always voted to cut franking should make some determination of how much they're going to frank and limit themselves, right? I mean, I, I think probably the thing that troubles most of us are the people who are the top frankers oftentimes in this house are the people who have voted against it for six years that I've been here. Now, somehow or other, we should say to them, okay, you don't want to do this. Cut yourself down to $12,000 or whatever it is that, that you want to spend and stay with that. And give leeway. Every, obviously, we're all responsible when we go to the voters for what we've done or haven't done. But why don't we have a little latitude and let members here decide what they're going to do? But make sure that if you can't support it on the floor, you can't hide behind that vote and go ahead and be a maximum franker. Mm -hmm. I think that's the most troubling aspect to me because I'm tired of the hypocrisy of it. What do you think of that suggestion, John? Sounds fine to me. Okay, let's work on that, John. So it sounds fine to me. All right. Jim? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I... You know, we keep harping away Just about the franking privilege. I used to serve on the franking commission. And I know some members take advantage of the franking privileges, especially just before an election. You do away with franking. You do away with your ability to communicate with your constituents. Yes. Yeah. And I don't think it's right for us to do that. I know the media, the press back in my district, are against members for sending out a mass mailing. But on the other hand, that's one way to reach people in a rural area. It might not take a daily newspaper. Or a might not get a weekly newspaper in time for your notice about appearing at the courthouse. So I don't see anything wrong with franking if you use it legitimately, and maybe the rules ought to be drawn so that they would know whether they were using it legitimately or not. We know that it is not in some cases. And that's the whole point, Mr. Quillen, is that uh, trying to draw that line for the legitimate use of the frank uh, as, as relative to the illegitimate use of it, gets to be very, very difficult. And, and my feeling is, is that with the, uh, the communication tools that are available to us today, uh, this, is, this is something that we could eliminate and do without. I just think we make it too much of an issue of it. We've got more things to do, more important. But we're on this bill, and I think it's good to bring it up. Let's have a full discussion on the floor of the House. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Quillen. Mr. Garth. No, Mr. Chairman, just very briefly, I think I agree with Mr. Bielenson on this, that uh, there are so many different unique circumstances for every member's district 
Uh, I find that people really don't come to town meetings unless I send out the meeting cards, and yet we only use 25 percent of our franking budget. And you get into drawing some fine lines, which you've tried to do. And I certainly think you should have your opportunity on the floor of the House to draw that line and let others draw the line where they think it should be drawn. I think it's of interest to every member of this House. I think it's of interest to the American public because there's dollars to be saved if we do this right. And I think we all dislike the idea that there are people who are what we will call the top frankers, just like we all dislike the idea there are people who take every single possible advantage of the IRS code. And shame on us for not correcting the IRS code through legislation if we feel that way. And that's what this is about, correcting the code if we feel that way. Of course, there are always a few who are abusers. Uh, that's not what this is about. This is about trying to rewrite the law so that we all feel more comfortable. And I congratulate your effort, and I hope we get it to the floor. Thank you very much, John. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Okay. The Honorable Christopher Cox. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wonder if I might uh, ask Jay Dickey to join me. Fine. Since it is, in fact, he that is going to be offering the amendment, uh, we're both working on it together, as are several of our colleagues. Okay, that's great. Uh, in fact, um, we may be joined at some point here by Congresswoman Dunn, Congressman Taylor, and Congressman Sam Torum. Okay. Uh, the purpose of our amendment is to specify reductions in legislative branch appropriations to meet President Clinton's pledge of cutting our expenses by 25 percent. Uh, just last month, President Clinton reiterated his own promise to cut White House staff by 25 percent. Uh, by the way, we're still waiting for that to happen. Uh, uh, the President mistakenly said that he'd done it already, and uh, it turns out that that hasn't yet happened. But uh, I'm glad that he's still looking forward to doing so. Uh, and he is pledged uh, as a candidate and, again, as President to holding Congress to that requirement as well. So this uh, amendment will simply do that. You will see uh, from the numbers in our amendment uh, that we maintain all essential functions of the Congress at 100 percent of recommended funding, or 100 percent of FY 1993 funding. That includes members clerk hire. So every member's office uh, expenses for staff uh, will remain unaffected by our amendment. Uh, likewise, uh, we fund at 100 percent uh, all of the legislative services. Uh, for example, uh, the council, uh, the parliamentarian, the law revision uh, attorneys, and so on. Uh, all of the uh, essential functions of the House are funded at 100 percent of that recommended uh, by our uh, Appropriations Committee and uh, actually spent in FY 1993. There were a couple of instances in which uh, the committee has recommended cuts, uh, and in those instances, uh, our amendment uh, uses that number, the reduced number, rather than the FY 1993 number. Uh, but uh, uh, all of the uh, other functions uh, are maintained, uh, uh, all of the essential functions, I should say, are maintained at 100 percent. I should also say that the Library of Congress, which uh, for historical reasons is lumped together with Congress's budget, is maintained at 100 percent. So we in no way affect that. Uh, the result of uh, our specific changes uh, is a 75 percent uh, reduction in the amount uh, spent from a total of, if you've got the second page, look on the back here, from a total of uh, $1.827 billion in FY 1993 to $1.358 billion in FY 1994. Now, if you think about it, uh, for 535, excuse me, 435, because we're talking now only about the House, for 435 people to somehow scrape by on $1.358 billion uh, for themselves and their staff and uh, uh, what it takes to run the Congress ought to be achievable in a time of fiscal restraint. Uh, that is what uh, our amendment is all about. Uh, it is modest. Uh, I think we could go much further. Uh, our own Republican leader has talked about a 50 percent reduction in committee staff, for example, were he uh, the speaker. Uh, there are plenty of aggressive plans on certainly the Republican side of the aisle, but we've got reformers on the Democrat and Republican sides that are interested in having President Clinton satisfied with a 25 percent cut in our legislative appropriations. That's what this is all about. Uh, so I would yield to uh, Congressman Dickey, whose uh, amendment uh, this is. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm happy to join in this and, and make it a joint effort with uh, 
Congressman Cox. My original approach at this was 25% across the board, and I thought that that, in, in thinking about it, was was a little unfair in certain circumstances, and so we've, what we've done is we've adjusted these things. I still go back to the fact it's what the American people want and what the American people need as far as leadership in this country, and that is an example set up here so that we can sacrifice first and say it wasn't so bad, we survived, and, and you all can do the same, and then we can start imposing these things on, on our, on our electricate, electricate, elect, the elected people the, the people who elect us, I got it, and and not be not be uh, doing it from a standpoint of, of you do it and we won't. I think the um, this particular plan seems to be uh, very well thought out. It it uh, takes the the particular appropriations that are controversial in some instances, like the, the former speakers fund and, and my in my district and in my voting populace is is very distasteful and just eliminates them. It takes some of these committees that we have duplications on and eliminates those. But still, the message is going to be that we are sacrificing in Congress and that we want to pass that message on and that leadership on to the rest of the nation. <coughs> Mr. Uh, Dickey, we've had Mr. Cox up here many, many times and uh, it's a pleasure to have you here Thank as, you, as one of the new members uh, of our body. Um, your amendment um, is, uh, as I understand it, you've, you've checked it and it requires no waivers? That's correct. Is that? That's correct. That's correct. Well, I can just say this, that uh, Mr. Natcher, uh, the Democrat uh, uh, chairman of the Appropriations Committee, uh, always takes his, uh, his appropriation bills to the floor. He supports your right and my right to offer striking amendments like this. I just hope the Rules Committee follows his guideline and, uh, and does the same thing. We, we certainly hope you get your day in court, and we're going to do everything we can to help you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you coming. Thank you, Thank you very much. I, I should just add, uh, uh, because I, I failed to point out uh, some specifics, I, I did mention that uh, we're going to have to scrape by on $1.3 billion for 435 of us. Uh, but in terms of actual employees, the House has over 12,000 employees. Uh, we do have some room to pare back. Uh, we can behave, I think, uh, more efficiently, have more time ourselves uh, to read the bills uh, rather than delegate it all to staff uh, so that uh, the legislative process would improve. Uh, and I just keep in mind that uh, our over 31,000 staff, counting the Senate uh, and our congressional departments as well, uh, is substantially larger than the next uh, uh, largest staffing for a parliament in the world, 3,500 is the number of uh, staff that they have in Canada, which is the biggest congressional or parliamentary staff uh, after the United States. So we are about 10 times bigger than our closest competitor in terms of number of staff, and, and we really can downsize. Thank you. Well, actually, this committee has been a, a model for not increasing. We haven't increased our budget in three years in a row. Just well, that's right. We have held the line. Mr. Chairman, yes. congratulations. And, Thank you. And we want to make the rest of the Congress uh, behave just like you do. That's yeah. <laughs> Mr. Goss, do you have any questions? All right. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank yes. you. Yes, I have one other amendment that uh, I need to uh, bring to your attention, and that is uh, my amendment to limit the GAO budget to one-third of a billion dollars. Uh, and if, if that is uh, appropriate, I will discuss that just briefly. Surely. Uh, the... Uh, General Accounting Office, as you know, was founded in 1921 for the purpose of uh, curbing government waste. Uh, it was uh, a watchdog agency with a modest budget. It now has 16 regional offices overseas and around the country uh, and employs about 5,000 people. Uh, its uh, budget has swollen to one-fifth of all legislative branch spending. Uh, its uh, staff is 25% of all of our staff. Uh, about 10 people for every member of Congress uh, work for the GAO. Uh, they have three times as many people there as the OECD, which does all of the economic analysis for 29 industrial nations. Uh, and their budget is eight times the size yeah. of the Congressional Research Service, 10 times the size of OMB, and 20 times the size of the Congressional Budget Office. Uh, their budget has gone from $204 million 
1980 to $358 million in 1990 to $432 million requested for the coming year. Uh, it is uh, striking to see the rapid growth in an agency that itself is supposed to be devoted to uh, trimming government waste. Uh, they could do, I believe, a fine job for a third of a billion dollars a year, and that's what my amendment uh, is all about. Good. Mr. Quillen? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In other words, they don't practice what they preach. Uh, that's it, very simply. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. The Honorable Porter Goss. Thank you, Mr. Garth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a great pleasure to be here from this perspective. Uh, I come before you today to talk about the former Speaker's Bill, an amendment there, too. I have a prepared statement which I'd like uh, admitted to the record. Without objection, the gentleman's entire statement will appear on the record. In the absence of Mr. Uh, Howard Coble, the honorable gentleman from Carolina, uh, I would also ask that his uh, statement be admitted to the record. In Without objection. Thank you very much. Um, this. Uh, this amendment gets to the former Speaker's Bill, which I had the privilege of testifying before you on last year, uh, same time, same circumstance. The idea is that we've got legislation that provides uh, office staff uh, and office expenses, including the Franklin privilege, for our former speakers. And the, uh, the language uh, and the intended language was pretty clear in the original legislation of some uh, almost uh, 25 years ago. Uh, and that legislation uh, was to provide this, these funds, these public funds for those purposes, for that public office, for the administration settlement and conclusion of affairs of the Speaker's office. Uh, one would hope that that would not take too long a period of time. It could be accomplished uh, expeditiously. What has happened instead, apparently, is that we have three former speakers, and uh, they are all maintaining their offices and the staff, uh, three persons in each, I understand still using the Franklin Privilege and all the support systems for those offices to the tune of some unspecified amount of money, but probably in the area of about $750,000 a year. Uh, it appears that what is happening is they are using those offices to perpetuate the Speaker's office uh, rather than to conclude the Speaker's office. Uh, so my amendment, uh, which is the same as it was last year, basically speaks in terms of allowing a generous time period for the original intent of the legislation, which was to, in fact, conclude the Speaker's duties, to wind them down, to get to the Library of Congress, which should be there, to turn over to the new representatives from the districts, uh, the constituent records as appropriate. All of those types of things we know when there is a turnover of office. We thought three years was very generous. Uh, and because it allowed for one full congressional term and then a half new term. Uh, the problem that we have had uh, as we have gone along, of course, uh, and this, I must say, is a constituent-driven piece of legislation. It was suggested by constituents. The problem we have had I is getting um, it to the floor. And we uh, now understand there is some discussion uh, in the freshman class, particularly on both sides of the aisle, about getting this to the floor with certain provisions very close uh, to the provisions that I have originally suggested. Uh, and I would like, uh, like very much to join that effort if, in fact, that effort is going to continue to go forward. But in the event it is not going to go forward, I would like the Rules Committee to make in order my amendment uh, that would uh, provide for, in effect, closing out the official offices of the former speakers after three years. And those former speakers who are presently extant uh, would be included uh, from the time of enactment, and all future former speakers would be included uh, from the time they left uh, a congressional office, a House of Representatives office. What period of time would that be, for? Excuse me? For how long? Three years. Three years. Period of three. There are other proposals, incidentally, Mr. Chairman, as you may have heard, some going as long as five years, some as short as uh, sunsetting immediately. Uh, but the idea is to, to, is to not to catch anybody by surprise and treat everybody fairly, and this is certainly over generous in that, in that area. The, uh, obviously, what I need from the Rules Committee is to make the amendment in order and uh, to grant a waiver on the legislation uh, prospect here, because this clearly is legislating, uh, and I would need that waiver in, in order to uh, avoid a point of order. 
in the event that I cannot uh, get that, successfully pre uh, prevail on that, then I would like to ask the Rules Committee uh, to simply zero out uh, the 1994 uh, amendment for support of those public offices. Uh, I cannot name a specific item because there is no such line item. Uh, it is buried uh, in the legislation and it is not designated by a specific amount. Obviously, if I could find the amount, uh, I would zero the amount out. But uh, all the avenues of exploration and investigation that my office has been able to undertake uh, have failed to reveal that number to us. And if anybody here knows it, we would be very happy if they would share it with us. But in the absence that they, we don't have that number, then I would simply uh, like to suggest uh, that it would be possible to uh, offer an amendment um, to zero out any public expenditure for former speaker's offices in the 1994 Legislative Appropriations Bill. Uh, I would need a waiver on that, most likely, because that would be regard a limiting amendment uh, and to ensure that we don't have a point of order against it while we're having a reading of the bill, uh, I would ask for that waiver in the event it's necessary to have uh, that amendment because my first amendment was not acceptable to the Rules Committee. Uh, that, uh, that pretty much covers, uh, I believe, that area uh, of the former Speaker's bill. I suspect we're going to have other testimony by other members of Congress on that uh, during our hearings today. Uh, I've been informed of that. I don't know it's true. I have one other amendment uh, which I have a lot less enthusiasm for, but which I am going to offer. And it is basically an amendment that uh, involves a 5% cut in the 94 appropriations uh, bill for uh, the Congressional Record Service. This is not to say that in any way do I feel that CRS does a superior job. We have had nothing but good responsibility, good response, uh, tremendous responsibility for the things we've asked from them. Uh, and I, uh, if I had anything I could say about CRS, it would be something very nice indeed in the way of praise. But the fact of the matter is we do have a serious uh, budget crunch confronting the United States Congress and the uh, and our budget, uh, the United States government, and we have a gigantic debt out there. And I believe that all players have to participate, even those that are doing outstandingly good jobs like CRS. So my amendment, uh, which I ask uh, to be considered here, um, and the necessary uh, waivers that may be granted uh, to consider it, uh, would cut the amount appropriate to them 5% next year. Uh, and I would ask that in my prepared statement would be accepted for the record on that point. Without objection. Thank you very much. That is all I have to present. Thank you, Mr. Garth. Mr. Quillen. Well, it's most interesting to have you at the table in front of us instead of up here with us at this point. But I'd like to say you do a good job in both seats and Thank you, glad sir. to hear from you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Buddha. Thank you. No, not the Honorable Scott Plug, Wisconsin. Sure, if I could defer for a moment, Ms. Dunn from Washington was supposed to be part of the panel with Charlie Taylor and Chris Cox and Jay Dickey, and she was in committee and asked if she could place a amendment to it as possible. Very noble of you. <laughs> thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I also want to thank Mr. Klug for allowing me to go ahead of him. I was in this Science, Space, and Technology Committee and uh, we were required to be there for votes. But I appreciate this opportunity to appear before your committee, and I appreciate you giving my amendments due consideration and hope that I'll be given the opportunity to present these amendments before the full House tomorrow. Secondly, I would like to associate myself with the remarks of my other colleagues on the previous panel, Mr. Cox, Mr. Dixie, and Mr. Taylor, uh, who discussed uh, various forms of 25% cutbacks in legislative appropriations. I believe they've taken the pulse of the American people and they are presenting bold initiatives that respond to a widespread sentiment that I have heard personally in my district, particularly during our recent break, to cut the size of government and especially to cut the size of committee staffs. 
Mr. Chairman, I have four amendments to offer for consideration today. The First Amendment cuts 25 percent from committee investigative funding with one-third of the remaining funds to be expended at the discretion of the ranking member. The second, uh, let me just make a statement that committee investigative funding has grown tremendously. Was able to see firsthand in the Accounts Subcommittee of House Administration how this had ha happened. In the past decade, we've witnessed some committees more than double their budget in this area. Armed Services, for example, has been up 136 percent, Ways and Means up 76 percent. Mr. Chairman, for this amendment, I request that the Committee on Rules grant me the appropriate and necessary waivers. Secondly, uh, is, is a simple striking amendment that would cut 25 percent for the funding of committee <coughs> investigative funding. This is done without the third being given at the discretion of the ranking member. Simple 25 percent cut. The third amendment would cut 25 percent from the funding for statutory funding, which, as we all know, is fair in itself, <coughs> two to one, uh, majority to minority. And so I would offer an amendment that would cut 25 percent from the statutory funding. And the last amendment would cut 5 percent for the funding of the Office of the Doorkeeper. Mr. Chairman, I ask that all four of my amendments be made in order because I think that all four of them respond to the public sentiment uh, to reduce spending. I think the public is not asking for tax increases. They want spending cuts. They want them first. And I believe this is an opportunity for the United States Congress to show that they really can lead this very important chart. Thank you. Mr. Solomon. <coughs> Ms. Dunn, thank you very much for coming to testify. And uh, uh, I think uh, only one of your amendments needed a, uh, a waiver. That's right, the First Amendment. First Amendment. And uh, the, uh, just so you will know, and I've uh, mentioned it before, uh, we don't have an opportunity to have an authorizing bill uh, before us uh, where you would be able to offer your amendment under an open rule process. Uh, if we did, uh, Thank you. <laughs> if we did, certainly uh, that amendment would be in order as well. So that uh, even though uh, we on our side uh, object sometimes to uh, legislating and appropriation bills, we don't have any other choice in, in this situation. So we certainly support not only the other three of your amendments, we support that one as well. And we will do everything we can to make them in order. You deserve to have the right to, uh, to debate them on the floor. Thank you. Just Thank asking you for, for fairness. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Quillen. One question is done. Amendment number one, you say, 25% cut in House investigative staff, one-third for a minority. You're cutting more for the minority? Uh, in this case, uh, if we pass my second amendment that is uh, simply a 25% cut, it could unduly affect the minority. But in the first amendment, after the cut is made, uh, we request that one-third of that remaining 75 percent of the budget be controlled by the, the ranking member, and so that would be a fair combination. Sure would. Thank you. Mr. Goss. I apologize for having to absent myself from the room during your testimony. I think it's clear uh, what you're trying to accomplish, and I certainly support your right to present that to the floor, and I suspect I would uh, support what you're trying to accomplish as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Scott. Oh, that's right. I can speak. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Well, we'll make this a New York affair. Huh? Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Kluge. How are you, Mr. Chairman? Nice to see you. Nice Thank you for to your indulgence you well. today. Welcome to the Rules Committee. Congratulations again on your ability to sit still for this many hours. Um, I have two amendments in front of you, and the parliamentarian has already told us that neither of them require a waiver, so these are both fairly straightforward. Let me talk first about a proposal to reduce by 50 percent, or $44 million, the funds available to the government printing office for printing and binding of publications distributed to members of Congress. Now, as you know, the Government Printing Office was first established in 1861 to guarantee that copies of the congressional record would be printed overnight and made available to members of Congress. Uh, that type of printing was unavailable at that time, but needless to say, there are numerous private firms which could accomplish that task cheaper, better, and much more simpler. There was a recent General Accounting Office audit done of the Government Printing Office, and the title itself, I think, should tell you a great deal about the operation. It says, monopoly-like status 
contributes to inefficiency and ineffectiveness. And among the General Accounting Office's discoveries were that the General Printing Office, for example, wasted 22 to 32 percent of paper used, which is 12 percent higher than the waste found in private industry, that six of 12 print firms polled perceived GPO's print quality as poor, and the General Printing, the Government Printing Office, rather, sent an average of 26 jobs a month back to press at a cost of an average of $45,000 a month. And perhaps more importantly, according to the GAO, $150 million of the total government printing bill is produced in government-owned and operated plants. And if the work done in these plants could be bid out through the private sector, we'd achieve a 50 percent savings and uh, manage to accomplish the same job, which now cost $150 million for $75 million. And uh, I think it's uh, obviously appropriate that given the kind of constraints the federal government's under, um, all the talk in the administration and around the country about reinventing government, it seems to me one of the obvious things to do is privatize operations. And I think a 50 percent reduction in the government printing office would be certainly appropriate. And I think we could still manage to get the same amount of work done for much less cost in this time done in the private sector. The Second Amendment uh, is a variation on a number of across-the-board proposals for cuts you've seen today. Some of the freshmen, Republicans and Democrats I know have been talking about a 25 percent reduction. My colleagues, Tim Penny included, have been talking about um, overall spending reductions of 5 percent. Um, both Chairman Fazio and Ranking Member Don Young deserve a great deal of congratulations for their fine work in already bringing in a bill that's 5 percent under baseline. Uh, but I think the mood in the country suggests we even do much better. Many of us over the last district work period had town hall meetings, and I'm intrigued to tell you that when CBO Director Bob Reischauer and Scott Hodge from the Heritage Foundation were out last week, we had 900 people at a town hall meeting in the deficit in Madison. And there wasn't a single person in the room who suggested the way to get us out of this woods was to raise taxes. Instead, what everybody said was reduce spending and reduce operations. Um, in my own personal office, I can tell you that we spent about 82 percent of our money uh, over the last several years. Uh, which puts us in pretty good stead compared to the rest of the delegation. And I think it's the very least we could do to ask uh, the United States government to save another 5 percent on its legislative operations. And let me tell you that I think uh, if the rule is made in order, we'll accomplish to do the same things which Charlie Taylor and Chris Cox and Jay Dickey did, which is to specify very closely and intriguingly specific cuts that should be done rather than ask each office to take a 5 percent cut period. And thank you for your patience and diligence. Ms. Klug, uh, I certainly support what you're trying to do. I've held uh, similar meetings uh, throughout my district and find the uh, exact same sentiment. And certainly uh, we need to do everything we can to uh, cut spending, just the same as we're asking the American people to do. Uh, I hope we can make your amendments in order, and we'll do everything we can to help you. Appreciate you coming. Thank you. Mr. Quillen. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I have no questions. I Thank you for being so patient today. Mr. Goss. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I think this uh, very definitely is indicative of the kind of uh, creative thinking that uh, people are expecting uh, from this institution. I congratulate you on the amendment. I hope we can get it to the floor for you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clue. We Th appreciate your coming. Thanks for your indulgence. I, uh, Mr. Craig Thomas. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chairman. You <coughs> folks are doing yeoman's work today. <laughs> we do that. It takes a long time. Well, good for you. I have two amendments. I'll be very brief. Uh, one has to do with the government printing office. And uh, I think this amendment goes to the heart of prioritization. Uh, we in this body obviously have to make some difficult decisions to balance the budget. And each of them is tough. And there's always a constituency for everything that we want to, want to cut. Government printing office, more than $5.7 million is appropriated for salaries of 63 GPO employees who don't work at the GPO, but are instead detailed to the Congress. In both the House and the Senate, the detailees are working for nearly every committee, with several employees working for committees since the early 70s. And uh, this appropriation stands without amendment. There will be $5.77 million will be spent this year to an agency where the people uh, uh, haven't needed them for years, indeed for decades. So our argument is simple, uh, Madam Chairman. If uh, GPO can afford not to have them there to loan them out to do somebody else's work, then GPO, of course, can afford to cut. 
Uh, further, it seems to me as a, ma a matter of, of uh, fundamental accountability that if the committees in which these people are attached have a genuine and bona fide need for them, why that's where the costs ought to be uh, attached. So that amendment would simply uh, take away the salary from DPO for those areas that uh, where detailees are assigned uh, on committees. The second one, Madam Chairman, is uh, I think designed to give an alternative. Obviously, there are going to be a number of different things that people will be willing to do. And I, by the way, would like to have uh, the statement of my co-sponsor on this one, Mr. Kyle, had put in the record, if I may. Without objection. It simply takes a 5% cut off GAO. Um, GAO is an agency that is designed, of course, to be a nonpartisan information searching agency. I don't think we've all found it to be that way. I think we found it too often to be an instrument of chairmen who are seeking to legitimize the decisions that are already been made. We had great and uh, passionate uh, arguments about it last year. So this is not a new notion, but one that I think might provide an alternative for doing something on the bill. So I'll stop there, Madam Chairman, and thank you for the time. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Mr. Solomon? <laughs> Craig, neither of your amendments uh, require waivers. No, sir, In other words, you, you, if, we, uh, if this bill went directly to the floor from the Appropriations Committee, you'd be able to offer your amendments, and uh, under those circumstances, we would certainly like to make them, make them an order, and uh, we'd do everything we can to help you. Appreciate it. It make a lot of sense. Thank Thanks. Mr. Giles? I, uh, I think they do make great sense also, and I hope we can get them to the floor. And I thank you for coming forward and sharing them with us today. Thank you very much. Thank I you, Mr. It. Thomas. Our next witness is the Honorable Rick Santorum. He's next. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Appreciate it. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to testify before the committee. Well. Uh, I have three amendments. Uh, I'll try to be very brief because I know you've had a long day. Uh, the First Amendment uh, does not require a waiver. It is simply to, uh, to strike any unspent money from fiscal years 1991 and 1992 accounts. In, in searching the, uh, the reports and the clerk of the House, uh, it came to our attention that even though we had an amendment on the floor last year in this bill uh, offered by Mr. Sweat and Mr. Clude to strike 91 funds, there were still unspent funds remaining at the end of 1992 of the 1991 accounts, some $5 million. Uh, we checked, there were also about $12 million of unspent funds for 1992 left over. We checked the reprogramming as best we could, given the information that we had, and we figured that the combined amount is roughly about $10 million still left over that has not been reprogrammed from 1991 and 92 accounts. Uh, since we are past the point of uh, you know, having unpaid bill from, bills from last year being submitted, uh, our, my, my amendment would simply strike the remaining money and, uh, and put us for 1991 and also strike the money for 1992 that's left over so we can uh, just send that money back to the, to the Treasury, roughly $10 million. Again, that's, that's the best estimate we have uh, given uh, all the information that has been made public as to money that's left over plus money that has been reprogrammed. That's the First Amendment. Uh, the Second Amendment is a privatization amendment uh, that's been offered to this committee on, on many occasions. Uh, one is to privatize, uh, it's, it's a combined amendment to privatize the house restaurant, uh, the barber shops, beauty shop, uh, the folding room, uh, and uh, to eliminate uh, the parking attendants and elevator operators. Uh, those are uh, things that either are unnecessary or could be done by the private sector, particularly the restaurant uh, and the barber shops can certainly be uh, sublet to uh, any kind of private business that could run this without spending, in the restaurant's case, $1.8 million. Uh, we can get someone to come in and run the restaurant, hopefully on a for profit basis, uh, in, in the Capitol building. So that's the second amendment. We have rescissions to match the, uh, uh, the, uh, each of the uh, uh, stated uh, operations. Uh, and finally, the third one is, is an amendment that was made in order by the Rules Committee last year, but was subject to a point of order and was not allowed to be offered on the floor which was to make a public and independent financial audit of the performance audit and financial audit of the, uh, uh, all the accounts and operations of the House of Representatives. Uh, this committee did make this me measure in order. Unfortunately, you made it in order and didn't waive the point of order to it, uh, which had the effect of not making it in order. 
Uh, I would hope that in this case, uh, while we do need a waiver of a point of order, that we would have the opportunity to, uh, to have a full accounting uh, uh, and performance audit of, uh, of all accounts in the House to, again, open up the process so the people of this country can see how, how, this, uh, how this House is operated and whether it's complying with financial standards that the rest of America has to comply with. At that, Madam Chairwoman, I'll be happy to stop and take any questions. Any questions, Mr. Solomon? <clears throat> Don't really have a question, but uh, Rick, I want to uh, say all three of your amendments make great sense, uh, uh, particularly the, the first one, the returns unspent legislative funds to the Treasury. Uh, I guess in the years that I've been here, I've returned uh, close to three quarters of a million dollars to the, uh, uh, back to the fund and never have known where that money went to. But what really uh, irritated me one year Congress voted itself a raise during the term of office. And uh, at the time, I have five children. At the time, I had several of them in college, and was, it was a struggle. And I returned my raise every month during that period of time until the end of the term and found out the money never went back to the Treasury. And I was never so irritated in my life. So your amendment makes great sense. And I let let me, if, if I can comment on that amendment again, it was the intent, and I, I would argue this to the committee, it was the intent of this committee and the, and the, and the, uh, and the body last year in voting to strike all remaining fiscal year 91 appropriations left over to eliminate any excess money. Now, what happened, obviously, is that that didn't occur, that there, there were, I guess, maybe less expended expenses than they anticipated, and there was leftover money at the end of year 1992 from fiscal year 91, even though we took action to, to strike all that money. So I, I would just say that if... Uh, if, you know, if the intent of the committee and the intent of the body was to eliminate this excess funds, uh, then this is a very appropriate amendment that was made in order last year and should, at least for 1991, be made in order this year. Um, we heard a, another amendment doing the same thing, but I think we should make it clear, uh, at least the Republicans and C-SPANs here, that this is not money that comes over in a federal truck and lays around until we draw it, that the money is in the Treasury. And uh, is only spent is drawn down, and unspent money stay there. So I, I think that's an important point we want to make. But I understand what you're saying about the appropriations for legislative appropriations and the uh, to make sure that it is not spent and not sp and not pulled down. But I think I don't want to leave anybody the impression that once we make an appropriation here, the, the federal truck pulls up outside with no, dollar bills. If, 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 if you would yield, the, the the reason I want to eliminate this money is not because we don't have money. We, we don't have needs to be to have that money to be spent on, or it's mm -hmm. or it's being used for some other illicit purpose while it's sitting there. The reason is is because that money is going to be reprogrammed, not by the body, but by you know a few select members of the appropriations committee for purposes other than what it was appropriated for. And when if we what the point I'm trying to make is that if we should spend the money in the year in which it's appropriated for the purpose of which it's appropriated, and anything left over should go back and we should reappropriate money for whatever needs we have the following year. And so this money that's left over from 91 has been sitting around now and being reprogrammed for things that it wasn't originally author appropriated for. Sitting around where? It's sitting in the Treasury. I mean, well, I'm, I'm, I, see, I think that's a very important point. Well, I don't want to leave the notion that we, we have a, a room here where people go in and draw off those bills. No, it's no, I, it and, is in the Treasury. And, that, and, that's, and that's not, my point is not that the money sitting there is somehow being wasted or used uh -huh. or abused. Okay. The point is, is when it's reprogrammed, it's reprogrammed really with not the consent of the body or, the, or really in front of the American public's eyes that if we are going to appropriate this money, it should be spent for that purpose. And if it isn't, if, if for some reason the needs of, of, of that functioner are, are, are not as great as what we appropriated, then the money should go back and next year we should appropriate new money. The gentleman would, uh, would or the gentleman lady would yield. Um, Mrs. Slaughter is right, the money is not sitting around in a wheelbarrow, but the fact is the authorization appropriation is there. And what this does by forcing it to go back to the Treasury technically, then it forces belt tightening on our part. Right. And that's really what we're looking for. So uh, you both are right. Really. Uh, like you, I return money every year since I've been here. And I don't have any notion, again, that that's just lying around in waste. And I think we, uh, we've dealt with this issue, as you point out many times right. before. And I would hope that we could make something in order, right. whether it's mine or somebody else's. Mr. Gall. I think you're uh, following testimony that we've had from others, uh, 
getting right on the subject and around it in different ways. I think this is a need, and perhaps the most refreshing thing I've heard here today is we only ought to appropriate what is a high priority need. But uh, of course, in the legislative appropriations, the chances of that happening are probably not very good because of the process we use. Uh, I, 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 I agree with what you're trying to do. Uh, I, I think it is important that we have the opportunity if those funds are not obligated by those who have the responsibility for them for lawful purposes and proper purposes within the original uh, intent, uh, that they should be freed up uh, for other high priority purposes that should go through the system of determining what those are. And I think that's what you're trying to accomplish. Exactly. I mean, this, this money has been colloquially known as a slush fund, and everyone denies yeah. that this is a slush fund. The fact of the matter is it's money that is not really accountable to the public in the sense that the that the, that the body doesn't appropriate the money as to where the money goes, that a group of, uh, of the leaders here in the Appropriations Committee make that decision and, and send money from account to account uh, without approval of the body. And, and those are the kinds of things we should keep to a minimum. And, and we can keep that to a minimum by sending back whatever is left over back to the Treasury before they can get their hands on it. Uh, I would agree we should at least know exactly what's going on. And I think that your amendment would accomplish that purpose as well. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Thank Santorum. You, Our next witness will be the Honorable Thomas Ewing. He's been with us for some time, I noticed, but we just got to you on the list, Mr. Ewing. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman, and um, it's been a very interesting discussion, and I've enjoyed uh, sitting in and listening on this discussion. What I'm here today, and I appreciate the opportunity, to request uh, that this uh, committee consider an amendment to the Legislative Appropriation Bill. My amendment is fairly simple and straightforward. Uh, it would reduce the committee's recommendation for $32,287,000,000 for the House Office Building Account to $29,058,300. Uh, $29, and the amendment is a 10% reduction in the committee recommendation. The committee notes uh, indicate that um, they recommended 15 plus billion less than we requested. But the truth, uh, a more realistic figure is only 100,000 below the amount which was appropriated in 93, which is only a cut of about three tenths of 1%. Um, and I think that we can do better. I understand that um, much of the spending in the House office buildings uh, is necessary and that we certainly want to continue to maintain the buildings in an in a adequate fashion. However, I feel it's critically important today that uh, the House demonstrate to our constituents the willingness to tighten the belt and the percentage cut which I have suggested, I believe, can be easily absorbed. Uh, the architect's office, which would be responsible, can uh, spread this amount uh, throughout the maintenance fund, and I think we'll see absolutely no deterioration in the maintenance of our building. Uh, the House should have the opportunity to vote on this amendment. It's a very simple amendment. Uh, I hope that you will give me that opportunity to present this amendment on the floor uh, when we consider this bill. And I would ask for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, questions? Mr. Solomon? <laughs> Stewing, your amendment is just a, uh, a striking amendment. It would be allowed under the normal uh, process if the, uh, if the appropriation bill had gone to the floor, and uh, certainly you ought to have that opportunity, and we'll do everything we can to help you. It makes a lot of sense. Thank you. It's very simple, but I think it's straightforward right. and, and to the point. Thank, thank you. you. Mr. Quad? If not, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Congressman Dick Zimmer. Trio. I'm sorry, Dick Zimmer, Congressman Dave Camp, and Congressman James Talent. What? Yeah, if we can have all of you together yes. in a panel. That's correct. Camp. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm joined today by my colleagues, uh, Congressman Dick Zimmer of New Jersey and Congressman Jim Talent of Missouri, in support of this amendment. This amendment would give members of Congress an opportunity to take or an incentive to take action against our federal deficit. It would do this by allowing unused funds from members' clerk hire, official expenses, and official mail 
cost to be turned back to the treasury specifically to reduce the deficit if congress is going to ask the american people to live with the hard choices we must make in order to balance the budget then we as a representatives must take the lead right now there's no option for congress to direct unspent funds toward deficit reduction presently funds that are not spent are often shifted to other accounts to be spent there and the only choice then left to members of congress is to spend it all or let someone else spend it when it's reprogrammed and this amendment would give us a third choice mr chairman over the 102nd Congress, I chose not to spend uh, well over $250,000 in office budget allowances. Let's have the option to direct those savings to deficit reduction. I urge the committee to waive all points of order against this amendment, including Clause 2 of Rule 21, and allow the members to debate the merits of this amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Who's next? Mr. Congressman. Congressman Talent from Missouri. Talent. Uh, just a brief additional statement, Mr. Chairman. I would like uh, permission to submit a, a written statement for the record, if I could. Okay. Um, when I was in the legislature, uh, the rule was that uh, if appropriations were not spent, they lapsed back to the Treasury. And I thought that was particularly important with regard to personal budgets for members, because then what they did was between them and their constituents. And now, from the standpoint of the personal, uh, a personal member where the situation is exactly as if if you don't spend your money, it goes to another member who spends it on his budget. And so you really have no incentive to try and save money. And so, you know, my feeling is there are a lot of people here who may need to spend their whole budgets. That's between them and their constituents. They can justify it. I want to be in a position where I'm hoeing my own row. I think this is a very moderate reform uh, and one that we ought to offer to make clear who's spending, uh, to allow people to make clear back home who's spending their money and who isn't. Yes, sir. I'm Congressman Dick Zimmer from New Jersey. Um, I share the view of my constituents that frugality begins at home, and I think for Congress uh, to try to reduce the deficit, we've got to start by reducing our own expenses right, right in our own offices. Uh, I naively thought when I first took office that by not spending my uh, entire uh, allowances that I would be uh, automatically uh, reducing the size of the deficit. And it was only later that I learned uh, that, that that wasn't the case, but the money was free to be re reprogrammed. Uh, my, my constituents were astounded when I told them that. I was astounded when I learned that, uh, frankly. And, and there's no reason this should be the case. Uh, and I believe that uh, we would be setting an example and perhaps regaining some of our credibility if we made it clear that uh, we were going to save as much as we could and what we saved would actually reduce the deficit for the benefit of every taxpayer. Well, I want to thank all of you. I think it's... Uh, I think it's... Uh, I think it's valid, and I think it's important. Answer the answer this question: What what does happen to the money? I mean, each one of you turned back money. I did too. In other words, the legislative process just uses it in any way they want. It can be reprogrammed uh, without uh, another act of Congress and used and spent in other accounts, and it's been used for other purposes uh, around the Capitol. Uh, have have you traced any of the money? Have they told you what they do with it? Well, it's difficult, and Congressman Santorum just testified on the amounts. It's difficult to get a handle on the amount, but uh, uh, some of the improvements that we've seen in the Capitol building, for example, are the result of reprogramming funds. That includes, for instance, the marble floors and the elevators in the Capitol. And there's, there's no new appropriation or act of Congress to direct that. And so what this would do is 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 have it specifically go to reduce the deficit and not be reprogrammed for these other uses that members haven't voted on as a body. It's a good idea. Questions, Mr. Solomon? <clears throat> I think you gentlemen heard uh, heard my <laughs> my previous testimony with Mr. Santorum. The same thing happened with me on both uh, pay raises and on leftover funds. And really, your amendment would just prevent the leftover funds from being reprogrammed. It's a forced uh, belt tightening on the part of the Congress. And uh, in effect, it means the money is just uh, uh, cannot be spent because they cannot be reprogrammed. Therefore, it in effect does go towards a deficit or does go toward back to the Treasury. And that's a very good amendment. It's long overdue, and it ought to be allowed. I can, if I can make a comment on that, Jerry. Again, it's what each member decides to do. I mean, if a member decides he needs his whole, he or she needs his whole budget, they spend it, and they probably do need it to service their people back home. Others aren't in that position. 
And, uh, you know, I like a situation where, where the members can hold their own roads and answer their own constituents is what they're going to do. And right now, we don't have that situation. It just, uh, to me, it's just not fair. It doesn't promote individual or corporate uh, responsibility with, with money. I should say also that it, it does not reduce the appropriation and does not uh, change current office budgeting practices, but the incentive that members would get knowing that their savings went to the deficit, I think, would result in members running their offices more efficiently and then, as a result of that, uh, saving the taxpayers' money. <coughs> Not only that, but it would set an example, and it would That's further right. uh, help the rest uh, of the members to be a little more frugal, too, perhaps. So, good example. There's no further questions. Thank you very much for coming and sharing this amendment. It's a good idea. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Turn on your mic. Oh, sorry. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is a simple amendment that's been sponsored uh, by other members uh, in past uh, uh, Congresses. Uh, as, as, this, as my amendment is drafted, it would simply prohibit the hiring of any new elevator operators for automatic elevators as the positions become vacant. It would not require laying off anyone who currently employed, uh, but uh, it would work on the assumption that uh, if we are capable enough to uh, manage a $1.5 trillion budget and the affairs of, the, of this nation, we can uh, push buttons on an elevator for ourselves. Uh, the, uh, there are, uh, I know there have been substantial reductions in the number of, of uh, elevator attendants over the years, uh, but it's a source of, of uh, ridicule and derision, and rightly so, uh, from, from the taxpayers who can't believe that we're serious about cutting the budget if we insist on having this throwback to the days of patronage and, and uh, blatant pork. So you would eliminate all the elevator operators in all of the buildings? In, uh, the, uh, there are 12 on the House side of the Capitol and 10 in the House office buildings. And uh, there are 20 elevator operators uh, on the Senate side of the Capitol. And, and I, we, I would eliminate them by attrition, yes. By attrition. Uh, the ones that operate automatic elevators. There are some elevators that are not automatic that don't work by push button. And they would, of course, continue to require that, uh, operators. Questions? So? No question. It's a, it's a good amendment. Uh, we don't uh, need them. Uh, and uh, we aren't here just to create jobs. And, uh, and as you say, there are some that uh, don't require, uh, that, that do require uh, elevator operators uh, that are not automatic. And uh, in those cases, uh, we could continue with them under your amendment. Is that correct? That's correct. It's and nobody good, would be fired under this amendment. It's a very good amendment. Thank you. Mr. Goss? Uh, I apologize for coming in late. I, I, I d detect that this is part of the Sil Conte. Uh, uh, effort that uh, has been going on for many years. Is it, I, I did not know it originated with Sil Conte. I'm not sure I, it did, but he was a champion of it, okay. if I'm not it mistaken. <laughs> it did. All right. Well, I think uh, your predecessor distinguished himself, and you have distinguished yourself by uh, maintaining uh, this effort. Thank you very much. Thank you, mister. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Bartlett. Thank you very much. I have a very uh, simple amendment, Congressional Pay for Performance Amendment. This amendment speaks to reform, and it would be very effective in helping to restore public confidence in this body. It doesn't cost anything. It doesn't reduce funding for any program. My Congressional Pay for Performance Amendment to the Legislative Appropriations Bill forces the Congress to be responsible and to use fiscal restraint. My amendment would provide for a reduction in pay for members of the U.S. House of Representatives of 50 percent if Congress has not passed all appropriation bills before the beginning of a fiscal year. This amendment would hold members' feet to the fire to finish the appropriation measures by October 1st of each year. If not, we are each held responsible for not completing our legislative duties. Uh, I would ask for a waiver of uh, uh, Clause 2 of Rule 21 and Clause 7 of Rule 16 if it is argued that there needs to be a waiver for uh, uh, in these two cases. So in other words, uh, the House has been very diligent in their efforts, especially on appropriation bills. So, you know, it seems like where we always run into troubles with the Senate 
but there are rules over there, and basically they don't have rules relative to debate to speak of. So in other words, if they hold us up, you would penalize everybody in the House of Representatives? No, it says uh, if we don't do our work. We don't do our work. So in other words, you can pass the budget over here, all 13 bills, but if it doesn't pass over there, the senators get penalized. If we set this uh, precedent, they should follow. They will be embarrassed into following, I think. It's not a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Solomon. Well, that would certainly light a fire under them. Uh, I'd like to carry yours one, one step further, uh, Roscoe. Uh, uh, you know, I think when the Congress uh, was only in session four or five months a year, maybe six months a year down here, uh, I think the country was a lot better off, and uh, certainly uh, I think we had better representation because members of Congress spent a lot more time back home, six months back home, and uh, I really think that's, uh, that's what we need today. So maybe we ought to just cut the salaries 50 percent and uh, force an adjournment on June 30th, and uh, we'd have fewer laws, f fewer lawyers to, to have to represent people to live by those laws, and we'd have a better country. Enough said, and I support your amendment. Goss. I presume that these, uh, that these appropriation bills would be within the budgetary guidelines. I can see a great tendency to uh, accommodate the timeline that you want to do and, uh, and do a little violence to, uh, to the numbers. But I think the spirit of what you're trying to accomplish is right. And um, I, uh, I think it would be a very interesting amendment to have on the floor uh, for debate. And uh, I hope we can get it there. Thank you. I think it sends the right message to the American voter, and it would help restore confidence in this institution and help to get our job done when it should be done. Well, it doesn't cost anything. If there's one thing that, uh, that I do like the matchup and the way you've presented it is there is a direct uh, nexus, a direct connection between pay and work for members of Congress. I'm sure that will appeal to the people of this country. Let me try to understand this again. You'd have to pass all 13 appropriation bills in the House of Representatives. If you didn't pass one for whatever reason, I mean, it could get hung up for a lot of very, very good reasons. Say you couldn't pass a bill because of an amendment that was the Senate and the House were fighting over it. In other words, you have to pass all 13, and if you don't pass, let's say you pass 12 and don't pass the 13th, all members would uh, lose, what, 50 percent of their salary? I suspect there'd be considerable peer pressure to get them all passed. And Any if the chairman would prevail, I think that might be the longest legislative day in history, too, if we got to that situation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Castle. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and uh, members. You've had a long day. I'm Mike Castle from the uh, state of Delaware. And I am here today because I believe that the practice of franking, mailing under a congressional signature, should be ended completely. And the amount of funds allocated for congressional mail should, at the very least, be cut in half. Or put another way, members of Congress should receive a much smaller allowance for mail, and the actual letter should be mailed using a postage meter or other standard business method. In addition, members who have exhausted their mail accounts should not be permitted to transfer funds from their office accounts to send additional frank mail to their constituents. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the American taxpayer is tired of footing the bill for millions of pieces of unsolicited mail from members of Congress. In addition, Americans genuinely resent the use of the frank. It is exactly the kind of special privilege Congress reserves for itself, which the average American does not have. When a resident receives a piece of frank mail from a member of Congress, particularly one that he or she did not ask for, his or her reaction is increasingly one of annoyance or even anger. Many Americans quite correctly believe that members of Congress are simply using the frank for their own self-promotion, particularly during election years. The statistics support this view. In election years, members of Congress send out many millions more pieces of mail than they receive. This is essentially campaign literature printed and mailed at the public's expense. I believe members of Congress should be able to correspond with their constituents and even send follow-up letters on issues of interest to the residents of their districts. However, members certainly do not require funds to mail every person in their district three times. An average mail budget of $200,000 for each member is simply unnecessary. 
The majority of these funds are used for unsolicited mass mailings, which the American people view as another form of junk mail. My amendment will effectively end mass mailings and unsolicited mail sent by Congress. Cutting funds for congressional mail and ending the use of the franc is not only good government, it is a major contribution to campaign reform. It will level the playing field and make congressional elections more competitive. The American people want members of Congress to live under the same rules everyone else does. The franking privilege is a glaring example of how Congress considers itself to be different. It should be eliminated. Specifically, Mr. Chairman, my amendment would do the following. Uh, one, end the use of frank mail by the House. It would force the House to replace signatured mail with more standard forms of postage, including mail meters, prepaid envelopes, and stamps. Congress should send its mail the same way as other, other citizens. Two, cut the total House mail allowance in half to $23.8 million in fiscal year 1994. I believe the allowance should be cut by a greater amount, but I have used a conservative estimate pending further study. I will urge larger cuts in future legislation. Three, require that any unused funds in the official mail allowance be returned to the Treasury for deficit reduction. And four, ban the use of office expense and personnel funds for official mail. This would end the practice of allowing members to transfer $25,000 from office expenses and clerk hire to their mail account. This is too often used to boost the campaigns of incumbents in close races. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, by eliminating the franc and implementing a standard business mailing system, we will not only save the taxpayers millions of dollars, but we will begin to restore their faith in Congress as an institution. We must do everything we can to end the public's perception of Congress that it uses every method at its disposal to protect its own members instead of serving the public good. I ask the committee to waive clause two of rule 21 of the House rules and protect this amendment from a point of order. If the committee chooses not to make this entire amendment in order, I ask that a more limited amendment be permitted which would simply ban the transfer of funds to the mail account from a member's office expense and clerk hire account. I have provided a separate copy of this amendment to the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Do you, do you send out a questionnaire to your constituents? I do not send out a questionnaire to my constituents. Uh, I realize this is a, a debatable subject, and I realize this is a gray area as to whether it is, it is uh, in the form of uh, a political mailing or campaign mailing. Uh, I have determined uh, in my own case uh, to not send out announcements of town meetings. I often combine them with other meetings which are already going on. Uh, to not use questionnaires, at least in the form of paid for by the franking privilege. Uh, I might do it out of campaign funds at some point uh, during a campaign. Um, and not to send other uh, mass mailings per se. Uh, I just believe that uh, it, it is an abused privilege, not by a lot of members of Congress, but uh, by a number. And I, and I just don't think it's particularly appreciated by the public. And I think if we're doing our job, there are other ways in which we can communicate, including legitimate mail, and including radio, television, or whatever it may be. Now, would your amendment uh, it would do away with the ability to send out questionnaires. It would not necessarily do away with the ability to send out questionnaires per se. Uh, it would just limit the amount of money and it would also make sure that it's done through the regular mail. But your amount would be limited in such a way that you would have to make decisions as to how you're going to use your mail. Um, at some point it may get to the point that it that effectively eliminates uh, all types of mass mailings. But I think on a on a basis of uh, certain areas or certain uh, subject matters, whatever it may be, you could still fit well within a budget of 50 percent of what it is today. I guess I'm trying to understand your amendment because I thought I heard you say that you would have to, you would demand or your, it would mandate the doing away, do away of all mass mail, which means questionnaires, which I find that my district really looks forward to. Uh, that would probably end, end that that practice immediately. It, it does not end it by the written word that is in the amendment. Uh, by reducing it to 50 percent, it certainly reduces the ability to uh, necessarily, uh, or the ability to be able perhaps to do that, at least on a full district-wide basis. Other questions? Mr. Solomon. <clears throat> Mike, uh, as I understand it, really, uh, what your amendment would do, it would, uh, it would treat us, I think, uh, like state legislators. And there's nothing wrong with that. In other words, when I was in the state legislature, I had an X number of dollars to operate my, my office account and my personnel. And out of that, I could choose to uh, mail a questionnaire. I could uh, uh, save the money and uh, use it for whatever uh, other purposes that I, that I wanted to do. And as I look at your amendment, I think yours does just that. So. 
uh, and I depend on that questionnaire at the first of every year myself. It's very important in an area that's as big as uh, or bigger than Delaware and much harder to to get around it. I don't have uh, I-95 running through, through the middle of my district, but uh, uh, is that right? I mean, uh, you can uh, still use those money. That is correct. You, you could use it for those purposes. For example, and uh, the chairman asked me this question, in my instance, uh, I had a series of town meetings a month or so ago, and I took questionnaires with me to the town meetings, and I distributed them there, and we collected them there, and we had uh, several hundred responses before we were all said and done. So we, had, we did the same thing as, as one would do uh, in a mailing circumstance. You could still do that. All, all it does is exactly what, what you have said, Mr. Mm -hmm. Solomon. You would, you would essentially be able to, uh, to, to use your, uh, your, your mail as you please. It would have a stamp on it or a stamp machine on it uh, as opposed to the signature, which, which some people, I think, resent, even though effectively it's the same thing, we, we understand. But you get rid of a franking privilege per se. A lot of people perceive that's free mail. Um, and, and then you could use it uh, as you please, including some limited mailing. And, and what I said to the chairman was that I, I think you would find by the time you do your regular mail, you probably couldn't, you certainly couldn't do three district-wide mass mailings. Uh, you probably could still do one questionnaire if that's what your choice is. It doesn't have to be my choice. Well, I think your, uh, your amendment makes a lot of sense. Let me, you weren't here earlier, but uh, uh, the fact that you're asking to legislate in this appropriation bill is not uh, uh, a situation which uh, uh, we should we should ignore because uh, the fact is that we don't have any authorizing bill and won't have this year or next year or probably the year after which would allow you to offer your amendment uh, and have it be germane so the only way you can do that and a number of other members who have come before us uh, this uh, today uh, is to uh, receive a waiver uh, for the point of order uh, I'm one of those, who, and I have an amendment which would uh, require random drug testing of, uh, of employees of, this, of, the, uh, of the United States House of Representatives. And I won't have that. I haven't had the opportunity for five years. I won't have it for another five years. And I'm in the same boat that you are. So I hope we can waive the point of order for you. But uh, if that does not happen, I hope we can at least make your amendment in order uh, and have you have the opportunity to debate it on the floor. Appreciate your coming. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Goss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think it's interesting. Uh, we've been here a good number of hours today, and we've had a probably high percentage of the amendments that have been offered have uh, addressed the issue of the frank. So there's no question that their uh, message is received from the constituency that there is indeed some sensitivity to abuse of the frank or misuse of the frank. And I think you've brought up an innovative point that nobody has brought up so far is that the franc represents something that the average citizen can't do, sign an envelope and stick it in a mailbox and have it be mailed for an official purpose. Uh, and uh, I, I think that you probably are on to something. I, I don't know whether that's an original idea with you or whether it comes from some other study. Uh, can it's, you like it, me? It probably is not original. It's new to me. <laughs> but I'm sure somebody else has thought of it or said it before. The, the other part of, the, uh, of your proposal um, beside the uh, perception that it's a special privilege, uh, you know, a royalty type thing as opposed to uh, something more appropriate for the house of the people. Um, the other issue is the overuse, the abuse of the franc. Uh, I have uh, listened to testimony all day long, and I am convinced for, for every member there's a very specific, unique situation. And I think a member does have to make those decisions you've talked about. But I think it needs to be within limits of what I will call reasonable affordability. Uh, for the amount of mail that gets sent out. And um, I don't know that we've heard a formula yet that allows us to exercise that kind of wisdom, nor do I think this is the right committee to do that. Um, but I suspect before we get through with this issue, that is an exercise we're going to have to undertake, uh, allowing the flexibility that is fair to everybody, but still putting some limits on it uh, that gets it under control so that it is, becomes more acceptable uh, for the perception that presently is out there right now, which is clearly uh, not acceptable to the people of the United States. They feel we abuse this privilege. Well, just in response, uh, Mr. Goss, to what you have said, and, and it, it's interesting because I, uh, I've talked to a lot of people who very much resent the fact that, uh, that sure. they perceive the Congress and I believe the White House and I think some agencies of government, although other agencies have gone away from the Frank, uh, can mail based on a signature. They assume that there is absolutely no restriction on that, that you can just do it and that you're different than everybody else. And I would implore this committee, even if you don't adopt uh, th this amendment, uh, if there's some other way we can uh, bring this before the Congress, uh, to get into the concept of, of trying to do mail just as everybody else does. There's nothing wrong with having a, 
business allowance for doing mail, but for goodness sake, put a stamp on it or uh, a normal uh, cancellation uh, through a stamping machine on it or whatever it may be, so the perception is that we're the same to everybody else. And you're right on the, uh, uh, the, the second point. Uh, I'm not trying to restrict exactly how the mail is used, but it, it, I just think that uh, it, it's just way too much. We, we did examine some numbers, and I think since 1987, which was the base year that we found, uh, mail is up by something like one-third that we receive. I, I might add that there is even perhaps greater abuse on the other side. That is all the fundraising groups that are organizing mailing to your member Indeed. of Congress, send in $15 and we'll help you send a letter and you call the people and they don't even know what it's about, why they're doing it. Uh, so it's abuse both ways in, in this issue in, in many instances that needs to be dealt with as well. So we have to have the, the uh, ability to respond to those kinds of pieces of mail that we receive. But I do believe that there is a public perception, I think it's undoubtedly shown in election years, uh, that, that certain members of Congress, and it's probably a, a minority of Congress, uh, do abuse this, this uh, privilege to some degree. Uh, and I just think uh, we, we provide for that with uh, more money than is, than is necessary. That's my, my own view of it. And as a matter of fact, I wanted to cut a lot more than 50 percent. My staff talked me into 50 percent. And may I ask how many uh, pieces of mail you get a week in your office? You, you represent the whole state of Delaware. I represent the entire state of Delaware, and we have a population of 665,000 people. And I am not sure of the exact pieces of mail that we get in our office. We do have a total. Uh, and we look at it in terms of we separate postcards and first class mail because we get uh, right. a tremendous number of postcards now uh, on varying issues. And we also separate it by in-state and out-of-state. And I'm sorry, I don't have those uh, figures here. But uh, I would imagine Delawareans write as, as much, uh, at least as any other state, perhaps not more. Uh, the reason I ask is we've heard from some members who have shared some of the information that didn't know, and, and it seems to me your figure, your, the, the amount of money you're assigning for the mail function in the office, whether you do it by meter or stamp or, or uh, some other conventional way, it seems about right. I, I haven't heard of anybody who would be deprived yet, uh, but not everybody would spend the money the same way. That's very clear. We looked at the numbers. My staff looked at the numbers pretty carefully and, and felt that a, an allowance of 50 percent of the existing franking privilege would be more than sufficient to handle any regular mail, uh, much more than sufficient right now to handle any regular mail. We came to the same conclusion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Castle. Thank you, Chairman. I appreciate it. We have a panel that I'd like to bring up, Representative Fingerhut, Representative Fowler, Representative Torkelson. Representative Fingerhut. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it is a pleasure to be before this committee for the second time today. I'm sure it is much longer for those of you sitting up there than it is for those of us waiting our turns. Um, Someday you may get the privilege. <laughs> at the rate I'm going, I doubt that. The, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, uh, as you know, both the uh, freshman Democratic class and the freshman Republican class uh, began the year committed to uh, bringing about reforms in the institution of the Congress. We each formed task forces uh, of our respective classes uh, that met separately to develop a consensus among each of our respective classes. Uh, that uh, effort on our side was uh, chaired by Karen Shepard of Utah and myself, and on the Republican side by uh, my two friends sitting to my right, uh, Tilly Fowler and Peter Torkelson. Uh, at the conclusion of each separate effort, we then began meeting together to determine what areas we had in agreement that uh, we could work on on a bipartisan basis, believing, as I know you do, uh, Mr. Chairman, from your uh, political career, uh, that uh, the effort to bridge the uh, partisan gaps uh, is so critically important to where we're moving in this country. Uh, we found a couple of areas uh, of immediate agreement. Uh, and uh, our belief was that we ought to move on those together to begin to build the bridges of confidence between our classes that will enable us to move forward. Uh, one of those, for example, was the Congressional Accountability uh, Bill, which we have, are working together to have passed. And the second effort is today. Uh, it appeared on both of our uh, reform lists uh, a, a striking concern about the amount of money uh, that is spent uh, by this uh, institution in supporting the former speakers of the House. Now, it may seem like a trivial matter, like a small matter, uh, but as we all know, the 
the Congress itself is coming under uh, increasing scrutiny for the way we spend our money and also the way uh, we regard ourselves uh, as, as being uh, somehow different than the people that we represent rather than among the people we represent. And so we are here to jointly offer an amendment that we would like this committee to make an order. It is an amendment uh, that I believe you have that is uh, actually in the name of uh, Mrs. Shepard, who could not be with us uh, right at this moment, but is, uh, is an effort that, that we jointly sponsor. Uh, we're currently spending $400,000 annually for former speakers, including salaries for nine staff, uh, the official allowance of $67,000 for each former speaker, and an unspecified amount of franking funds. Um, all allowances or benefits are currently available to a former speaker for as long as he finds necessary uh, and solely to provide assistance in the administration and conclusion of matters regarding the former speaker's service as a representative uh, and speaker of the House. Uh, we believe that uh, this is a, uh, again, a small but an important and symbolic uh, effort to rein in spending in the legislative branch. Our amendment would put a five-year limit on the funding for former speakers. Uh, this, we believe, is a generous allocation and should provide former speakers with adequate time to conclude their duties. All current uh, former speakers would be given five years from this date in order to conclude their functions. And in the future, all retiring speakers would be given a five-year period in which they would be required uh, to conclude their duties. Uh, again, uh, Mr. Chairman, we appreciate this hearing and respectfully request that this amendment be made in order. And I would uh, yield, if, uh, if you would permit, to uh, my colleagues. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Fingerhut has already explained to you how the four of us got together on this, so I would just like to go forward and say that we do think that this amendment is a good first step in ending some of the privileges that have led people of this country to think that Congress is out of touch. Allowing former speakers to enjoy the luxuries of taxpayer financed offices and staff for as long as they desire no longer makes sense in these days of budget tightening. In many instances in the bill that you have before you, the committee has made cuts that will affect current members of the House, and that's good. But it then does not make sense to enact those cuts and continue to appropriate funds to former members in an unending fashion. Equally as significant as the savings this amendment realizes is the fact, as Mr. Fingerhut has already pointed out, that we are offering this in a bipartisan effort with our freshman Democratic colleagues. We have worked together since we came up with our separate reform packages. We've met regularly to find common ground, and this is one of the areas on which we're working together. So we do urge you to allow this amendment uh, to come to the floor tomorrow. Thank you, and I'll turn it over to Mr. Torres. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, and, and I don't want to repeat what my colleagues have said. Uh, to add uh, a few relevant points, um, your colleague, our colleague, Porter Goss, has been um, um, pushing this issue for, for some time, and many of us thought that the three-year uh, limit would be very, very solid. Uh, we talked about what was achievable. Uh, someone suggested a five-year as a compromise. Certainly a five-year limit is better than no limit at all. We're looking at the case where literally uh, this could go on for 10, 20, uh, or more years. And when people look at all the cuts that have to be made, and I think we all agree spending cuts have to be made, we should be willing to cut spending on the legislative branch, including former members of this body. Now, I know it's going to rile some people, but it's just simple fairness to say, Yes, current members of the House are going to have to take cuts. Former members of the House, in this case former speakers, are going to have to, to live with some cuts too. And I, I think realistically five years is more than enough time for, for any former speaker to conclude his or, or someday her business, uh, wh whatever that may be. Five years I think is a very uh, generous and, and more than reasonable period of time. Maybe in the future we can scale it back even further. But I think this is an amendment that, that we can all agree on and I would hope it would be allowed in order for tomorrow. Well, I want to thank all of you for coming up and sharing the amendment with us. Uh, just a couple questions. How much is it, $400,000 a year for each one of them or for total? I, I, believe, I believe that's total. Yes. Total for how many remaining, how many speakers do we have? Three, four? Three. three. We have three. So they split $400,000 between the three of them. And what are they allowed to do with that? I believe that uh, while it says for official expenses and wrapping up duties that it's been relatively, uh, a relatively free. Uh, uh, it says for staff and official expenses. Okay. And then on top of that, they also have the franking privilege for their mail. They have franking. Are they allowed to rent the, uh, an office or something? Or? I would think so. Yes. That would be that, an official expense. 
uh, office, telephone, normal expenses along that lines, as well as staff are I'm all. I'm trying to understand, though, between three former speakers, how how do they divide four hundred thousand? I mean, is each one of them given one hundred seventy-five thousand piece, or how do you do that? I I believe that. Uh, they have nine staff, it's right. said here, so they've each got probably three staff members. We, we could certainly provide, provide the, the breakdown. I apologize for not having it with me, but again, the the notion was that uh, we concur certainly that there's they're public figures, they're going to get a lot of mail, they're going to get a lot of attention for a period of time after they've concluded their service in this office, but there does come a point in time when uh, it should no longer be the taxpayer's responsibility. Uh, as we mentioned, there's three former speakers, one of them has been uh, receiving these allowances for quite some period of time now. Now, do we always appropriate the same amount of money, $400,000 a year? Or the, the way it's structured, I believe it's really an entitlement, believe it or not. Um, you know, with all the other entitlements we talk about, the way the language is written in the law, this is an entitlement for former speakers, and so the amount could increase substantially um, year to year. Mr. Solomon? Let me yield to my good, uh, my good friend Porter Goss, who has been one of the champions of this, and uh, let him continue. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, Mr. Solomon, very much. I was going to ask the chairman to yield, but I thought I'd wait for my own time. I don't blame the panel for not being uh, completely current with every penny, because trying to ferret this information out that you've been asked to provide is very, very difficult. This is closely held information, uh, by and large, and the numbers you have cited uh, for us to consider are probably the best that you can find in printed documents. There's much, much more to this. Uh, specifically to answer your question, Mr. Chairman, uh, the amount of $417,000, which is in the budget uh, recommended for next year, is actually nine staffers, uh, up to $67,000 each, three per office. In addition to that, uh, we have got uh, all of the logistical support that goes into the offices, including the rent of the office, the air conditioning, the heating, the parking, and entertainment. I cannot give you an exact figure. Uh, unfortunately, you were absent earlier when I was testifying on my amendment because we can't find a line item figure. There is no line item figure. If it's there, it is, it is hidden in Arcania somewhere uh, in this process. And, and if you can find it uh, and, and make this number more correct, uh, we estimate, uh, after dealing and doing a lot of investigation over a number of years on this, that the 417,000 floor for staff, followed by the office rent, followed by the uh, legitimate office expenses that are included, uh, total about $750,000 a year. We feel that's a fair bracket estimate. And you multiply that by the number of years, which is now 29 years of former speakers, if you uh, include the numbers of, uh, we, of course, we have overlap. Uh, this bill was, I believe, passed in the very early 70s. And the purpose of the bill was very clear. It was stated that it was to administer, settle, and conclude the affairs of the Speaker's office. Uh, and the only problem has been is that, dis that discretion as to when that process was completed was left to the former speakers. And it is curious that a former speaker who has been out of office now some 17 years has still been unable to conclude uh, his duties as former speaker. Uh, likewise, it is curious that a former speaker who has been out of office eight years has been unable to conclude his duties as former speaker. Likewise, it is curious that a former speaker who has been out of office four years has been unable to conclude uh, his business as former speaker. And when we've been investigated what, in fact, they are doing with these offices, we discover that, in fact, they are perpetuating the office of speaker rather than closing it down, winding it down, which is the stated purpose of the legislation. So I, I think that the panel has very properly presented the right idea because this perception is now out there. And it, it, this is not just us talking here. This has been on ABC News. It's been on uh, Coast to Coast uh, Network News in the evening. Uh, it's been picked up in uh, well-respected newspapers that are read uh, around the nation. And this has become one of those symbols of perkdom here uh, that needs to be stopped. And there really is no reason to stop it. Um, so I will yield back, uh, not to stop it, that I know of. Uh, we have corresponded with the former speakers, and they have not suggested that it shouldn't be stopped. They have suggested that they are using the money well to perpetuate the office of former speaker, those who have responded. But they have not suggested that they are prepared to wind down. So I think this is very necessary legislation, and I very much congratulate 
both sides of the aisle for having the initiative to pick this up and to bring it forward. And my only question, uh, Mr. Solomon, am I still allowed to proceed on your time? My only question for the panel then would be, how did you happen to arrive at five years instead of three? Uh, in the true bipartisan effort of our freshman class, it was a compromise. And we hope to be setting an example for the Congress during that uh, we work in a bipartisan fashion and reach our compromises. Yes, I, I don't know who suggested it originally, but when it was uh, just earlier today, someone said, well, could you live with five? And I said, well, I'll talk with uh, Congressman Fowler and Congressman Buck McKean, who's the, the Republican president of the freshman class. And we just decided that you know five would be better than nothing. And if that's something that we can get a rule on, great. Uh, I would love to see a rule on three. Uh, I was told that might be much more difficult to achieve. So okay. five is better than nothing. And, and at least it's a start in the right direction. Uh, the reason I asked the question, obviously, is because we came up with three, uh, and we felt it was over generous, but we felt it was extremely fair to those who, who were former speakers presently. And it was very reasonable for those who would be in the future. Uh, I have no objection to five as a starting point. I think three is, is a lot fairer. And I, Mr. Chairman, I need to correct one point. I misread my note. The 67,000 is the actual number each speaker is allowed for the office that comes to $210,000 for the three combined office allowances, uh, plus the franking uh, that goes into that. And the $417,000 is, as I said, it's for the nine staffers, three per each speaker. Uh, and I gather there is latitude in those numbers for each speaker to set the staff as there should be. Reclaiming so, my time. <laughs> thank you for yielding. Uh, you know, the art of compromise is probably the, uh, the most difficult thing for anyone to, uh, in our profession to, uh, to learn. I know it was for me, because when you compromise, you feel you're compromising your principles. And, uh, but uh, you have to do that sometime in order to uh, accomplish something. And you are, in my opinion, really accomplishing something that is worthwhile. Uh, most speakers, uh, and I have great respect for all of them, Tip O'Neill uh, was, was a great friend. Uh, but uh, the fact remains is when they uh, do retire, they not only have their retirement, whatever that might be, uh, which is uh, equivalent to everyone else's, uh, but they also uh, are no longer bound by uh, being prohibited from receiving honoraria, and uh, they, it's unlimited, and most of them certainly take advantage of that, and that amounts to literally hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, most of them write a book. Uh, and that's quite lucrative, and uh, so I think you are being most generous with your five-year limitation, and I commend you for it, and I hope we're going to be successful in putting your amendment on the floor for debate. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Grams. Uh, I, I just wanted to make sure I had asked uh, also permission to make a personal statement not associated with any of the other people. If, I'm certainly willing to wait until after others or to proceed now as the committee wishes. On, on a different issue? Yes. Sir. And then I think we're up on a different issue, too. We're, we're on the schedule for now for another amendment. As well? As well. Okay. Well, go ahead. Uh, I, I appreciate the indulgence, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to uh, emphasize that, that the statement I'm about to make is in no way associated <laughs> with these nice people to, uh, <laughs> to my right. Uh, nor to Karen Shepard, who was also on this panel, nor to anybody else other, other than myself. Um, and I don't have an amendment to offer, but merely a, a statement to make to the committee. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have uh, struggled, as I know many new members have, with the concept of, of the Rules Committee and what its appropriate role and function is um, in the uh, institution of the House. And there's no question in my mind that it has an appropriate role uh, in guiding the debate, shaping the debate, and making sure that uh, we move on our business in an appropriate and timely way. Uh, and I have, uh, by and large, supported the product of the work of this committee this year, even when it was uh, controversial, believing that we had, in fact, shaped that. Um, there is, however, no issue uh, that is more central to the public debate today than the subject of government spending. Uh, none of us can possibly uh, go home and talk to a single constituent uh, without hearing something about government spending. And there is nothing uh, more central to our personal responsibility with respect to government spending uh, than our own budget. Uh, I have talked to a number of members uh, throughout the year about the subject of government spending, and I talked to you one of my very first days here about the role of the Rules Committee. And in each case, as I expressed frustration with my ability to impact uh, the subject of government spending, 
uh, I was told by uh, senior members that uh, when we in fact get to the appropriations process, when we actually get to voting on spending a dime of the government's money as opposed to the authorization process and everything else that goes on in this place, which there's legitimate uh, debate about, uh, that that would be the time when I would be able to uh, make my personal decisions about what is appropriate and what isn't. Uh, I also am aware that historically uh, in this institution that uh, appropriations bills have come to the floor uh, with as free and open uh, a range of debate and options of amendments as possible. Uh, and so therefore, it's just my personal uh, plea as a uh, freshman member of Congress desiring to have an impact and desiring to set a personal example with respect to our, our own uh, budget uh, that this committee will see fit to issue a rule that uh, permits the broadest possible uh, scope of debate that any legitimate amendments that have been offered uh, would be permitted to move forward to the floor I certainly understand that there is a role in sifting through those amendments which are germane and which are not germane and placing them in appropriate orders for debate. I'm sure there's been a lot of duplication uh, in subjects that have been offered uh, to the committee that this committee needs to sift through and, and make sure. But uh, I, I say this not to, uh, to insult anyone or to denigrate any, uh, personal but, uh, any person, but just as a matter of personal conscience, as you well know, Mr. Chairman, that's what we have in this place. Um, I do hope that that will be the, uh, the outcome of this committee's work today, and I thank you for the chance to make that statement. Thank you. Jim, did you want to respond before you leave? I'd like to. Thank you, Mr. Finger. I, you're, you're on a different matter. We're on a different matter. Okay. Um, <laughs> this is a very difficult piece of legislation to pass, legislative appropriation. I mean, there's, there's not much in here for the rest of the country. Uh, it, 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 it has a very limited constituency, and you're, you're talking to it right here. Although the people in this country care very deeply about it, and they care how we spend our money. I think many of the amendments that were mentioned today hopefully will be in order. And uh, we, I don't think the rule has been shaped or fashioned yet, and uh, they're still talking about what amendments will be in order. I, I don't think, I don't speak for the whole committee, I don't speak for the chairman, just myself, that, uh, that every amendment is going to be in order. Basically, you can't on a, on a bill like this. We've had, now we've been going many, many hours on many, many amendments that have been offered. And uh, in order for us to really legislate, this would take probably weeks to pass this bill if this was a completely open bill. Now, some bills we can do that. I know that uh, the Republicans and many people would love to see a complete open rule on everything, but you, you cannot if they, in fact, took over the House of Representatives today. They would do many of the same things that the Rules Committee has to do. You have to limit debate often. You don't want to, but you have to. It's one of the reasons why we have the problem in the Senate today. They have no rules. They have no Rules Committee like this that decides. That's why we have the five-minute rule. So because we have so many members, we have to be able to limit people. And uh, they have no rules over there. A minority of one can stop things, and that's why they don't pass their 13 appropriation bills. One of the best amendments that came up today, I, I don't know if I'm saying it facetiously or I really believe this, is to stop their pay if they don't pass their bills, the 13 appropriation bills. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's not probably going to happen. You're not going to see that amendment up, I'm sure. But uh, this is a very difficult bill to pass because it allows everybody in the world in a very sincere way and also in a frivolous way to take a pot shot not only at the whole legislative process, but to make the whole le legislative process look very, very bad sometimes. And I think that we need to give a lot of different amendments on both sides. We need to give you, I think, your amendment that you came with, with your panel, is a good idea. Hopefully you'll see that. I think that you probably will. But um, just, we haven't fashioned the rule yet. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure what's going to be in it. I have my own ideas of what ought to be in it. but. Uh, that's where we are right now. I appreciate your statement. I appreciate your courtesy in, in that. And if I could just very briefly respond, I, uh, I hope that I've indicated that I appreciate the role of the Rules Committee and appreciate the fact that it helps this uh, body do its business. And certainly, if you check my record this year, I uh, have generally supported the work of this committee because I think that it is important. Uh, nor am I saying that, uh, that there should be no limits on this rule. Uh, clearly, we could go on forever uh, taking shots at, uh, at different parts of it. Uh, but I do feel a personal uh, sense of, of responsibility in this particular case to be able to be involved in as broad a range of this particular bill as possible. And for those of us who 
not a member of the Appropriations Committee and not a member of the committee uh, which you currently chair, uh, it, it becomes difficult to have that uh, process. And I simply wanted to have in your thought process as you shape the rule and in, uh, and in the committee's record the, the notion that for this uh, new member approaching voting on our budget for the first time uh, that this is a, uh, a matter of personal uh, strong concern. And I appreciate your listening to that statement. Eric, we don't always get what we want around here. I just had my committee eliminated on the I know that. Committee on Hunger. And I am supposedly one of the inside group of it, right? <laughs> and the Congress, not necessarily in its wisdom, eliminated it. So, uh, you know, if this is the I worst thing you're going to face, that you don't get all your amendments on the legislative appropriation bill in your freshman year, you're not doing too bad. You're making a big head and you and you're really making a statement, all of you, in a bipartisan fashion. So keep it up. We don't intend to quit. Mr. Solomon. Mr. Chairman, before my uh, good friend Mr. Fingerhood leaves, and, uh, and I have great respect for him in the short time that he's, uh, that he's been here, as I do for you, Mr. Chairman, uh, as I said on C-SPAN on a couple of different occasions, I have great Great respect for you, and uh, uh, some of your constituents were surprised to hear me say that, uh, uh, but uh, I meant it sincerely. But uh, let me just point out something that that is realistic. Six six or seven hours ago when we started this hearing, uh, I pointed out that that, uh, this week we have been in session debating bills two hours. Monday we had no session. Tuesday, we were in session for about an hour. Wednesday today, I think we were in session for 45 minutes. Uh, Friday, there will be no session. So we will have practically have had uh, nothing to do except this one bill this week. We could have put this bill on the floor. And I I don't recall whether it was my good friend Tony Hall or you that said this is the the people, this is our bill. This is uh, no one outside the Beltway cares about this bill. This is for our function. And they're right. But the fact of the matter remains that uh, we have had about 44 uh, Republican amendments offered. We've had eight or nine Democrat amendments offered. And all of them make uh, great sense, uh, whether they, you're going to vote for them or against them. And I'm not going to vote for all of them. But uh, I think you're going to be in for a, a shock, because I really feel the same thing is going to happen this year that happened last year. And what happened last year was the first time it happened in 205 years, and that is that we restricted the amendment process, the open rule, the open uh, amendment process on the legislative appropriation bill. Mr. Natcher, the man we have probably the greatest respect for of all on both sides of the aisle. I mean, he is just a fine gentleman. And he refuses to come to this committee and ask for a restricted or structured rule on his appropriation bills. He feels that they ought to be allowed, that we as members of Congress ought to be allowed to offer our amendments as long as they're germane uh, in whatever fashion that we want and let the House work its will. Last year, this committee, for the first time in the history of this Congress, limited this, the Congress to 12 amendments to be offered on the floor. And in doing so, they left five of those amendments uh, exposed to points of order. So really, we only had a chance to, of all of these terribly important issues that you've all testified to and 49 other members have testified to here, uh, it meant that we could not even debate that on the floor of this Congress. I'm afraid that the same thing is going to happen this year. I would just, uh, if I were a wagering man, I would wager that maybe there would be uh, seven or eight amendments allowed uh, at all. And that doesn't cover any of these main issues that we've been talking about. And that's just a shame. And uh, uh, I hope that doesn't happen. But uh, if it, uh, if that is the case, then uh, certainly uh, we ought to defeat this rule if it comes on the floor. And we ought to let people like Mr. Natcher bring his amendments to the, bring his bills to the floor, and let's debate them, and let's let the House operate under what the rules are that we, did, we enacted on the opening day of this Congress. So I say that to the gentleman not to discourage him, but I'm just afraid of what's going to happen. Uh, there's no reason we could not debate all of these issues. If we, even if we took just the germane amendments, it wouldn't take uh, 20 hours of debate on the floor of Congress, 20 hours over one week. We could have done all that today, this week, instead of just two hours that we spent on the floor. So having said all that, we thank you very much. I know you're sincere, and uh, we commend you for your efforts before and on this statement as well. Thank you. Mr. Quill. Mr. Goss. 
Mr. Chairman, thank you. I, I just wanted to add uh, one quick statement that I'm very impressed by the sincerity that you bring forward in the testimony. Um, I know uh, we all feel to one degree or another uh, that way. Um, I, I suppose if you sit here long enough, uh, there's an inevitability that your, your degree of cynicism uh, grows in this town. It seems, seems to be something that does flourish here, but it is extremely compelling to hear the statement that you've made. And I, I think that much of what the chairman said is accurate. He has great wisdom, and I, I defer to his wisdom on many things. And I agree that the pragmatics of a bill like this are very, very difficult. Um, I also agree that Mr. Solomon is right that if we got to the task, uh, we have always in the past with open rules had the opportunity for a compromise on time if, if the open rule were in fact dragging on too long and we were getting down to what I would consider to be less important business and the leaders would consider to be less important business. There's an agreement struck on each side that they'll, they'll put some time limits on it. And I would much prefer that we did this bill that way and started out uh, with the open rule uh, idea that everybody would get a chance to, to take a shot uh, at a thing that matters to them. And of course, they have to be responsible matters. Um, and I, I think there is some concern that some of the amendments offered might be a little dilatory. It seems to me that that, that is a legitimate concern, but it seems to me there's a much graver concern, which I think you've put your finger on, and it's, I think other freshmen I've talked to feel the same way. That is that there are some things that are allowed to go on in the process that really are not defensible, and debate on the floor or any place else. You simply cannot defend some of the practices of this institution. And it's those that, are, when they are kept off the floor, that we do the greatest disservice the constituency we represent. Uh, I would say that abuse of the franking privilege is not defensible. Uh, and to not allow that matter to come forward for discussion, debate, and remedy on the floor uh, is going to be a very hard proposition to explain uh, in a 30-second bite or longer to any constituent. And I want to see those, those amendments made in order. Whether they will be or not, I don't know. But uh, it, it seems to me that is a greater concern. Uh, so I would err on the side that you have recommended, and I hope we're able to do that. I am not confident that that's going to happen because that has not been the recent history, and it has certainly not been the history we've seen in the 103rd so far. But perhaps if you say it enough and work enough with your colleagues and we do with ours, uh, we will get that done. And I hope we do because I think that America benefits from it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I start, I would like to say that I, I do share Mr. Fingerhut's concerns and uh, would echo his request for the allowance of as many amendments and as open a rule as possible. I want to thank you for allowing us the opportunity to testify a second time before you this afternoon. The amendment that we have before you is quite simple. It merely expands on the improved disclosure practices regarding the House's franking expenditures that were established in the fiscal year 1991 Legislative Branch Appropriations Bill. Language in that bill directed the U.S. Postal Service to report all franking expenditures on a monthly basis to the House. These monthly reports provided to each of our offices are kept confidential and are not available to the public. The law for fiscal year 1991 also directed the clerk of the House to report a total for each member in his or her quarterly report. While this directive broke new ground in public disclosure of franking expenses, it is insufficient at a time when citizens are demanding open government and when they should be able to scrutinize every dollar of their money that we spend. What the House currently discloses does not provide any details as to the size, timing, or cost of specific taxpayer-financed mailings. But where current disclosure practices are most inadequate is in the area of timeliness. The quarterly report of the clerk is usually issued some three months after the close of the reported quarter. In an election year, that means that money spent by a member in July, August, and September, just before the election, is not made public until December or January, well after the election. The alternative to waiting for the quarterly report is to file a Freedom of Information request with the U.S. Postal Service. So those who oppose our amendment may do so with the argument that the information we seek to disclose is already available, but is only available to citizens who are willing to read this 68-page book on how to file a Freedom of Information request and go through the lengthy process involved. 
While every citizen has the right to petition the government for information under this act, we believe the Congress has a responsibility to provide that information itself. The National Taxpayers Union agrees and has endorsed our amendment. In 1990, Congress created a detailed method for the accounting and reporting of all taxpayer money spent on franked mail. In 1993, we hope that you will give the members a chance to take the next step toward meaningful reform and allow them the opportunity to pass our amendment to make that information readily available to the public. And I'd like to turn over to Mr. Torkelson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Thank you. Chairman. Um, I, too, would like to uh, commend my colleague Eric Fingerhut for his comments. I, I, I think they are, are very valid, and I know the, the difficulty uh, being a, a member of the majority party it might be to, to bring up those comments, but I want to commend him for doing so. Uh, I don't want to repeat what Congresswoman Fowler has said. Um, just to emphasize, what we're asking for here is an automatic disclosure of the reports that all of us have to, to sign off each month on how much we use franking or how much we use free mail. We're not adding a lo level of bureaucracy for any uh, one in our office. We're actually uh, reducing what would be the need for the, the, the summaries or the quarterly reports. We're just saying that the paperwork that is already done, information that is already compiled, should just be readily available to the public simply for asking for it. Don't make them go through freedom of information. Don't make them wait five months or longer. Just the, the reports that we have to fill out on a timely basis, people should be able to see those, uh, the information that's contained in them, should not surprise anyone. I hope there are no surprises in there, but this will just let people know we're willing to be open uh, and timely about the amount of money and the number of pieces of mail each one of us uh, is spe uh, spending and the amount of mail we're sending out. Uh, it, it's not uh, the greatest reform on earth. Uh, it's part of the package of reforms the freshman Republicans came up with. We do think it would go a long way in, in opening up the process and shedding a little bit more light on what happens up here on Capitol Hill. Thank you. Questions? Makes a great deal of sense, and we hope we can make it in order for you. Thanks for being patient. Thank you, Mr. Sell. Well done. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You've been very patient today, and we appreciate that. And what you say makes sense to me. Whether or not it, your amendment will be allowed, I don't know. But hopefully it will. And thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Goss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, congratulate my colleague from Florida and her accomplice from the Commonwealth. I, I think you, you've done very well with this. Um, it's my understanding uh, right now that there's actually nothing that would prohibit a member from making the monthly uh, statement that each of us sign and uh, fill out and uh, sign uh, available. That's uh, I hope we're going to be able to make your amendment uh, in order because that's the proper way to do this and to get the debate on the floor, and either it goes up or down. But uh, if it should get on the floor and go down, or if it's precluded from going on the floor because we can't get the amendment in order, I suspect that following the avenue of voluntary uh, exposure on this uh, will have a very uh, salubrious effect on what you're trying to accomplish. And you might start a trend by leadership uh, rather, and by example uh, rather than by legislation, and that would be refreshing also. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Chairman. We appreciate your allowing us. Thank you. Representative Grams. I have three amendments, so I hope I don't want to take more than an hour or two of your time. I know you're going to But, uh, should I go through all three of them at once, or would yes, you want me to do at them once. at once? Okay. Uh, so, but because this is a limiting amendment, the first one, I would ask the Rules Committee to waive Clause 2 of Rule 21 to allow this to be permitted to be offered during the reading of the bill. The amendment would prohibit the creation of any additional LSOs other than those certified after June 1st of 1993. Currently, there are only 28 legislative service organizations, or LSOs, which use taxpayer funds and house offices to promote a variety of special interests. LS O's are funded through the voluntary pooling of members, clerk hire, and unlike personal offices, can use their funds for food, entertainment, as well as gifts for members. Now, many members are concerned about the accounting procedures and possible financial abuses going on with the LSOs. In fact, Pat Roberts has offered an amendment to eliminate the LSOs completely. However, House Administration Committee Chairman Charlie Rose announced that he would be lifting a 10-year moratorium on the formation of new LSOs to allow more to be created. 
And this, I feel, is being done to allow the select committees, which were not reauthorized by the House, to use taxpayer dollars as LSOs. Now, permitting select committees to become LSOs circumvents the will of the House and means that select committees will never have to undergo the scrutiny of the House again. This is a slap in the face to the taxpayers of America who made it clear that they do not want their tax dollars funding such activities. In addition, it would open the door for other informal caucuses, such as the Mushroom Caucus, to apply for LSO status, and at a time when the practices of current LSOs are under scrutiny, to allow any additional LSOs would be to create be created would be irresponsible. So that is the first. Uh, the second, uh, this amendment is asking to strike $130,000 from the office of the clerk, which funds the Democratic Personnel Committee, a three-person office whose traditional role has been to interview and hire for the 1,200 patronage employees on Capitol Hill. Those are patronage jobs which include the following, or folding room, elevator operators, etc. Now, many times during the House Post Office and House Bank scandals, the Democratic leadership stated that patronage hiring in the House was over and dead. Yet the leadership has never dismantled this office, which is the remainder of the business-as-usual approach rejected by the voters. In addition, much of the responsibility for these patronage positions have been shifted over to the Director of Non-Legislative Services, which hires for these jobs on a competitive basis. All jobs are be to be moved over by October 1st of 1993, Thus, the existence of a partisan patronage office is unnecessary. In fact, the only responsibility that would be left over for the personnel committee after October will be to allocate page positions for the Democrats. Now, this can be shifted over to the Speaker's office in the same way that the Republican leader allocates Republican page positions. Since this amendment would take effect in October 1993, the beginning of fiscal year 1994, it would give enough time for employees to relocate and for all responsibilities to be transferred elsewhere. And for the third, uh, this also is a limiting amendment, and I must ask that the Rules Committee waive Clause 2 of Rule 21 to allow it to be offered uh, during the reading of the bill as well. And this amendment would ask to prohibit funding for members of <coughs> Congress to move from office to office after the start of a new Congress. Now, moving a congressional office involves more than just the member's individual staff. For example, the architect of the Capitol, House Information Service and the Clerk of the House are involved in every move. The costs incurred by all of these offices is approximately about $2,800 per move. These expenses are comp uh, comprised of moving the furniture for each office, moving up to 15 to 25 telecommunications devices per move, printing new directories, painting offices, and lost manpower during the move. Now, since the initial move to accommodate the 110 freshmen at the beginning of the 103rd Congress, which resulted in 312 total moves. There have been an additional 13 moves to accommodate four special elections. Were these four members allowed to take the offices of departing members, if that were to happen, we would have saved $36,500 in taxpayers' dollars. At a time when Congress is calling on the American people to sacrifice through higher taxes, it is unacceptable that we spend the money that we do to move offices simply to make members of Congress happy. Those are the three that I would like to have considered. On the last uh, amendment, are you cutting out the ability of members to move um, by cutting out their funds, or what are, you, what are you saying now? What we'd like to see is after the Congress takes effect and everybody moves during the normal rotation of that Congress, that if there were special elections, that the office really is selected for the district, not just the member. So if uh, the member would step down or take another position, that the incoming congressman would take that office for the remainder of that Congress. And then, of course, being a freshman or a second-year man, his name would then be put back into the pool for the next draw. So say he would happen to be a freshman with an office in Rayburn, but not to be moved so everybody could, uh, you know, facilitate moves. Because, you know, the recent moves of the four special elections really caused a ripple in a number of moves that were additional tax dollars uh, spent uh, just to accommodate that. So. What our proposal is, is once the move has been made for, say, the 103rd Congress, that it would remain. A freshman in Rayburn wouldn't be bad, I guess. <laughs> Questions? Mr. Solomon? <coughs> Mr. Graham, since uh, there is no authorization bill likely to come before this Congress mm -hmm. this year, uh, and one of your amendments would require a waiver, you ought to uh, have that right, you deserve the right to offer all three of the amendments. Uh, I hope we can accommodate you. Uh, so that you can at least debate them on the floor and let the chips fall where they may. 
Appreciate you coming. These are just small moves, but again, I think it's a step that we want to try to save as many dollars as we can. Thank you. All right, thank you. Mr. Quillen? Do you have any questions? Mr. Goss? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Martin Hoke, he is Martin. I saw him earlier. He's coming back. He's coming right, Mr. Inglis. Mr. Inglis? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think Mr. Hope wanted to swap places, if that's all. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to present these amendments. I've got several, and um, I'll go through them as, as quickly as possible, realizing that you've been here a long time. And I think that it's important to say at the outset why we've been here a long time, or you've been here a long time. And of course, that is that I believe, as a freshman member of this body, that the people of this country have spoken very clearly in 1992 that they want to cut spending and they want it to start right here in this house and that's why i think this bill will take a long time and it's taking a long time today um, and of course many of the bills uh, or many of the amendments will sound familiar um, and that's because i think that many of us know where the pressure points are and, and you'll see in these amendments some similar themes the first amendment that i've got um, would limit expenditures on mass mailings by members of the House, another franking privilege reduction. Rather than placing restrictions on the number and size of mailings, this limit um, would be one directed at an overall cut that would accomplish a 75% uh, reduction in the amount allocated for um, members of Congress to frank to their districts. The result of this, we believe, would be that members of Congress would essentially be stopped from doing mass mailings to their constituents. Um, we've done a little bit of math on this proposal. The proposal here, the, uh, the total allocation, would allow each member to mail approximately, or would give them approximately fifteen to $20,000 for postage. Um, that would allow each member to answer approximately 60,000 first-class letters. According to our informal sur survey of members of Congress, that would be uh, that our member, the members of this body answer approximately 15 to 40,000 inquiries a year. So our appropriation here would allow them to answer 60,000 inquiries, uh, giving them a, a comfortable cushion. Um, that uh, basically, as I say, would eliminate the ability of members to do mass mailings to their districts, which I, I believe is what the American people find very offensive. And certainly what I'm hearing in my district is they don't want me campaigning for re-election at their expense. It's fine for me to campaign for re-election at my expense or at my contributor's expense, but not at their expense. They just don't want to pay for it. Um, the second amendment I've got before you and asked to um, uh, be made in order is an amendment that would cause um, House congressional staffs uh, to be cut. Uh, of course, House congressional staffs have grown from a few hundred in 1914 to over 10,000 today. Uh, in 1914, the House employed 105 committee staff. Today, over 2,000 committee staffers are employed by the House. Uh, this amendment is based on uh, my bill, H.R. 1485, which would reduce the funding for investigative committees by approximately 50 percent. Permanent committee employees would not be reduced. Uh, nearly $58 million has been provided for standing special and select committee staff employees in 1993. This amendment would provide $28,950,000 for investigative committee staff during 1994. Again, about a 50 percent cut. The, the third uh, amendment is before you, I think, in this handout. Uh, actually, I, I don't need to offer at this point because, thankfully, it's already in the bill. And uh, I commend the committee. Uh, for um, the Appropriations Committee for including this in the bill. It's one that is a significant cut to the Botanical Gardens uh, appropriation, and uh, I'm very happy to see it there. It uh, basically comports with the bill that I've introduced, except it's $150,000 over, but uh, that's close enough and appreciate the uh, work of the Appropriations Committee on that. The uh, last, next to the last one that I have is a, um, um, an elimination of the uh, personal physician for the Congress. At a time when tens of millions of Americans have no personal physician, it seems appropriate to end the practice of funding a member's personal physician. I've got a bill, uh, H.R. 1855, which would prohibit 
which would provide that no funds shall be appropriated, reprogrammed, pr reprogrammed used, obligated, or otherwise provided to continue member's personal physician within the office of the attending physician during 1994. Um, of course, members of Congress can uh, have access to health care through, through our um, plan, health care plan, and uh, I believe that having a personal physician is redundant. This amendment would simply eliminate that expenditure. The final one that I would offer to the committee and ask to be made in order is one that may require a, a waiver um, that involves the, uh, what the Cleveland Plain Dealer is called this year's most outrageous perk. That is the ability of members of Congress to back up a moving van to one district office as they leave office and literally unload the whole office or, or carry it off at about 10 cents on the dollar. This happened to me, it happened to many other members of Congress that uh, uh, came in in 1993. I think the Cleveland Plain Dealer has it pe pegged exactly right. It is this year's most outrageous perk. Um, this uh, amendment that I'm asking for would pro prohibit the expenditure of funds to permit, process, or assist the purchase of district office equipment or furniture by any departing House member under the first section of public law 93462. Um, again, this uh, I believe is the, uh, this year's most outrageous perk of 110 members who departed at the end of the 102nd Congress, 98 purchased some or all the equipment from one of their district offices. Uh, of course, that was purchased way below fair market value. And as I say, I think that the Cleveland Plain Dealer has it right. This is this year's most outrageous perk. I know that uh, language was included in the uh, committee report on that, um, and I appreciate that, but I would hope that we could go ahead and eliminate the, this ability this, uh, in this bill rather than waiting for some future time. Those are my amendments, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the opportunity thank to you. present them. Questions of Mr. Inglis. Mr. Solomon? <coughs> Mr. Uh, Chairman, let me uh, just say we hope you have the, uh, the opportunity to offer all of your amendments. Uh, you deserve that. Uh, concerning the elimination of the physician's office, uh, if you are unsuccessful <coughs> in uh, being able to offer that amendment and it doesn't come uh, to pass, uh, you might want to consider uh, sometime in the future what I did uh, when I was the ranking member of the Veterans Affairs Committee a few years ago uh, when we, uh, we provided that uh, veterans who were uh, uh, hospitalized in veterans hospitals uh, we provided that the Veterans Hospital Medical Care Delivery System could recover third-person third reimbursements. Uh, in other words, you and I as members of Congress, we buy for and pay for our own health insurance. Um, and if we are going to, the, uh, to a naval doctor here in the Capitol, uh, we could underwrite that cost uh, by a cost we're already paying for through the premiums that we pay for your, for your uh, uh, hospital and, uh, and uh, doctor's insurance. So um, it's just a thought that in the future, if we are unsuccessful, because I support what you're trying to do, but if we're not, uh, we at least could save the taxpayers that money because we're paying it out already in premiums, and uh, we could recover that third-party uh, third cost and pay for that. It would go into the Treasury and would be a savings to the taxpayers of the nation. So yep. for what it's worth, I appreciate you coming before the committee. We'll do all we can to help you, Mr. Angus. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Mr. Clark. I must say that you have some amendments that probably will open the members' eyes. I, I have no objection <clears throat> to your offering them on the floor. I think an open rule is appropriate. But the attending physician's office is very important, I know, because they are the ones who, the attending physician is the one who recommended that I have a stress test and I did, and I failed it miserably, and I had an arteriogram, and I had five blocked arteries, so I had five bypasses. Had I waited to have gone to a private physician, I don't know how I would have made out. Now that's a personal reason. But how many other members, 435 members, might in a crisis need that. I've seen the attending physician come to the House floor 
when a, a member has had an attack and they carry him in a stretcher down to their uh, office and treat him or take him to Bethesda or the, or the Army Hospital. I think it's critical to the health care of this uh, body here in the House of Representatives. How we pay for it, I don't know. But I think it's critical. And uh, I reduced the statutory staff by 60 percent. I haven't analyzed that. Committee statutory, and you, then you recommend the uh, cutting of the member staff also? No, sir. We we're just talking here about committee staff. So, um, um, that's of course something we can get to at a later date. I'm, I'd like to go after that as well. But at this point, I think that uh, uh, it, it's sufficient to talk about 50% cut in this uh, in the uh, permanent committee uh, in, in, the, in the investigative committee staff. I'm not arguing with your with your amendments or your right to offer them. Right. I, mean, I appreciate that. People have the would have the opportunity to vote yes or no. I personally would vote no on the elimination of the physician's office. Yes, sir. But I think you have a right to offer them. And you've given us some thought, and it's going to open some eyes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a couple of questions and observations. Uh, I happen to agree with Mr. Quillen on the question of the uh, capital uh, physician. Uh, under the current policy, um, I know in my case, and I assume it's Mr. Quillen's and other members too, I pay into Blue Cross or whatever plan you all participate in. I happen to have Blue Cross, which is uh, taken out of my check every month. And then I also pay a separate fee over and above that to be able to see the capital physician. It's billed to us, I think, on an annual basis, and I gladly pay that. Uh, I think the, uh, the, uh, the significance of having a doctor on duty in the capital that members pay for uh, is of a real service to, uh, to us. We, uh, uh, we lead uh, very uh, stressful lives, as you know, and I think it's not unreasonable to have a, a physician on duty in the, in the Capitol. Um, let me ask you a question uh, in terms of your, uh, your franking uh, amendment. What would you do about uh, town hall meeting notices? Would you prohibit those under your franking amendment? It's possible that a member could decide to frank uh, using uh, use the frank in order to advertise town meetings. In my case, we do not use the No, frank no, you, you have purpose. a very low uh, figure. 75 percent cut. That's, that's correct. You it, have, if I understand this, uh, uh, each member would be allotted approximately fifteen to twenty thousand dollars for postage. Uh, is that, does the town hall meetings have to come out of that in addition to your regular, answering your regular mail? That's correct. Well, uh, you wouldn't be able to send very many town hall meeting notices if that were the case. I, I, I can, would only observe that uh, in my own district, uh, people are always asking, when are, they, when are we going to have another town hall meeting? They want to come out and uh, tell the congressman what's on their mind. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's really the, uh, the constituents' most effective uh, direct way of communicating with me as a congressman and, and with you as a member of Congress. Uh, and I, I think your, uh, your approach uh, is... Uh, uh, is awfully extreme in that it makes it very difficult for members to advertise town hall meetings. Well, I wonder if, uh, if I may respond to that. I'd like to respond to the physician, if I may as well. But the, uh, um, we've found in our experiences working quite well. We're getting good attendance at town meetings. Uh, we're mean, without, without sending notices out, you mean? No notices. And uh, the local media has done a very responsible job of uh, advertising those and providing space in the in the uh, column area where they normally do that and uh, also in stories. Well, what are the major cities in your district? Greenville and Spartanburg, South Carolina. Yeah. What, what is the largest city that you have? Greenville. I mean, how many people is that? 320,000 in the county, which is the most relevant uh, mm -hmm. geographic area to discuss. The city is small mm -hmm. geographically. And your, your, your local newspaper adequately publicizes your town meetings? Uh, yes, particularly we find in these small communities it does. There's no question about small communities, but I was asking about the larger community. Yeah, we've gotten very good coverage there, and people have come. In fact, I had a town ca uh, health care town meeting recently and had very good attendance. So um, because we uh, made it known to the local media that we're relying on them, 
And they, realizing the responsibility they have in a free society, said, well, we're glad to help. Mm -hmm. And uh, Well, uh, I happen to come from a media market where there are seven members of Congress uh, served by um, uh, two newspapers. And um, while the newspapers sometimes publicize some of my town hall meetings, they never publicize all of them. And they never publicize all the town hall meetings of all seven congressmen in the media market. And uh, I would suggest to you that it may be difficult for some members to, uh, to get the word out, uh, depending upon the size uh, communities that they represent. In each of those town meetings, I'd ask you, do you direct it at the entire population, or are you try trying to uh, get elicit responses from a particular area of the city? In other words, if uh, I would imagine if yours is somewhat like mine, you've got small newspapers that service uh, neighborhoods. No, or in, uh, in the Dallas-Fort uh, Worth area that I represent, uh, uh, you don't have very many. You do have a few smaller newspapers, but uh, generally uh, it would be for a, uh, an entire uh, part of the county or an entire uh, portion of the city of Dallas or the portion of the city of Fort Worth. And in fact, uh, uh, there are no... Uh, uh, weekly newspapers that serve, uh, significant weekly newspapers that serve the city of Fort Worth on a regular basis. Um, there are several, uh, several uh, weekly newspapers that serve portions of the city yeah. of Dallas and uh, suggest to you that members may have different experiences in different districts and that it may be difficult. To, uh, the, uh, the local media is not necessarily uh, always as cooperative in terms of uh, pu fully publicizing uh, town meetings for all members. And of course, I, I would uh, also point out, we've, we've uh, attempted some other creative means of getting the word out, uh, for example, posting notices in local diners that are popular and places like that. Uh, the owners have generally been very receptive to that because they want to take part in the process. And the result has been uh, good attendance. But um, back on the physician, if I may just for a moment, don't want to take much of your time, I'd ask the chairman, I've got to assume that those uh, charges that we would pay would not cover the full cost of that physician. And therefore, there is a subsidy by the American taxpayer for our convenience to have a physician here. And with all due respect to Mr. Quillen, I think that um, uh, I find it hard to justify at a time when many Americans are uncovered by health insurance to have us with sort of overlapping systems and with systems that are clearly subsidized. I cannot imagine that the amount that we're paying fully pays the cost of that operation. And if it does not, then we're asking the American taxpayer to subsidize my health care. I assume it depends on how often you use it, uh, how often you see the physician. Some members may see the physician once a year well, uh, here in the Capitol. Some members may not, may go for an entire year without seeing the physician except in an emergency situation. But uh, I believe recently, wasn't the fee increased to $400 or something like that? Whatever it year. is, uh, I send them a check. That's all I know. And, uh, and do it, do it uh, gladly for having the convenience in the... In the and multiply it times 435, it would nowhere near come close to the cost of operating that office is what I'm um, suggesting, which <laughs> indicates to me that we've got to get in touch with the American people. The American people want us to live like they live. I have no other questions. Thank you very much. We Thank appreciate you. you coming. Mr. Hoke. Sure. All right. We're going to. Mr. Hope. Thank you, sir. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to mention that there's a technical correction of the amendment it's before you. Two numbers in the uh, first figure were inadvertently reversed. It shouldn't be 11 million 238. Oh, 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 it should be 11,328,000. Oh, oh, oh. So my intention okay. is to strike out the $11,328,000 as it appears uh, in the bill now. What my amendment would do would be to prohibit the appropriation of any funds provided in this legislation for the purchase of calendars by the House clerk from the United States Capitol Historical Society. If enacted, my amendment will save taxpayers, first of all, nearly three quarters of a million dollars with respect to the purchase of the calendars, and then nearly another million dollars, I'm sorry, uh, more than a million dollars, if we factor in the money that's normally obligated 
for the franking of these calendars. Every year, the clerk of the House purchases calendars that are printed by the U.S. Capitol Historical Society. In 1992, the clerk purchased one million calendars at a cost of $720,000. Those were in turn distributed among the members of Congress for the purpose of delivering them to constituents. I submit that in a time of runaway budget deficits and continued spending increases on unwanted and non-essential constituent services, this is an area in which we can save money for the American people and eliminate what is in fact a self-serving, self-promotional campaign tool uh, and part of a re-election uh, incumbency uh, technique. The potential uh, overall savings to taxpayers reaches uh, nearly $2 million factoring in the amount that's obligated for the franking. I brought this uh, forward today because it is my constituents that have urged me to take concrete action to reduce the deficit and have brought to my attention specifically uh, their having in the past uh, received unsolicited um, calendars from their representatives with uh, self-serving congratulatory or thank you type of letters. And uh, they have objected to that as being a, a profligate, wasteful uh, practice that really reflects a, a kind of um, a subtle advertising engaged in by, by uh, representatives. The, uh, with respect to the issue of germaneness, this amendment avoids the problem of trying to add a policy directive to an appropriations bill. What it does is simply delete $720,000, which is the amount spent last year by the clerk on calendar purchases, from the proper line, the appropriate line, under the bill's allowances and expenses section. Because this spending remains unnecessary to the effective operation of the legislative branch and deals with the expenditures of funds contained only within the appropriations bill, I respectfully request the committee to rule this amendment to be in order for consideration by the full house so <clears throat> this bill just takes the calendars out of the appropriations committee that's correct money. it takes uh, this the amount of money that was spent last year on the million calendars that were purchased out of the uh, out of the appropriating language and this was done as a result of some constituent who didn't want to receive the calendar uh, actually it was it's done as a result of a number of things uh, one is just a, a a general sense that there's something wrong with spending three quarters of a million dollars of the taxpayers money on on unsolicited calendars um, two is that there have been a number of uh, complaints within my uh, area northeastern Ohio from constituents who have received unsolicited calendars and felt that this was a a real abusive waste of taxpayer money for purely self-serving uh, purposes. <clears throat> I've had uh, many complaints about newsletters, but nobody's ever called me about a calendar. In fact, more of my constituents would like to get calendars, and I just tell them we just don't have any, you know, just to run out. Who represented the district before you? Uh, it was, my district was act actually represented by two different people. Uh, part of it was represented by uh, Congressman uh, Ed Fian and uh, part of it by uh, Mary Rose Okar. Okay. Mr. Solomon. <laughs> Martin, uh, your amendment, uh, you are simply going to strike the funding for those calendars? That's correct. It, uh, it strikes. And you're going to explain then, then what it's for, but your amendment is just a striking it's amendment. It's simply a strike in the line for supplies, materials, administrative costs, and federal tort claims, out of which there's a, a $11,328,000 in that line item um, in 1992, fiscal 92. It was 720,000 of that was uh, devoted to calendars. So it just strikes that to keep it germane. And then, yes, we will explain in offering the amendment the, the purpose of it. Well, for the, the first 203 years of this, uh, this Congress, you would ha have had that right automatically. And uh, last year, you probably would have been denied. And this year, uh, that's a shame. I hope you aren't going to be denied. Uh, Mr. Natcher, the uh, chairman of the Appropriations Committee, uh, the Democrat chairman uh, wants you to have that right to offer that amendment, um, and as do I, and I hope the Rules Committee here does too. We'll do everything we can to give you the, the right that 203 Congresses have given you in the past. Thank you very much, Thank Mr. You. Solomon. In fact, you probably could use the same calendars. <laughs> Mr. Goss. 
If I had to put it to the test in my district and ask the question of the recipients of the calendars, would you rather have the calendar or the money? I'm not sure how it would come out. Yeah. But I think it's a fair question and one that deserves to be debated on the well, floor it, of the House. I, I, I appreciate that. I think that you might find that if you ask the 2,500 or so uh, recipients that they might feel that it was a good use of taxpayer money. But if you asked all 572,000 or so of your constituents, they might feel differently. I, I certainly do agree with that uh, observation, and uh, I agree that there is a potential there for getting over the line from official use into what I will call self-serving election purposes, and I suspect uh, uh, from your testimony that, that that may have been something that you've run into with some constituents, um, which is unfortunate. Thank you. I think we, I think a couple of years ago we made a drastic cut in the calendars. Uh, I forgot how many we cut them back. This is just another step in that yeah, direction. Yeah. This is just a little bit more drastic. It sort of kind of cuts it right down to nothing. Okay. Mr. Quillen? Nothing uh, except I want to observe that we've been in session today for <laughs> over six hours talking about amendments. And I wonder if the members of the House are going to on other appropriation bills are going to be as concerned as they have been today on the legislation, legislative appropriation bill. You know, it'd be wonderful if they would be, but I think all, all of these amendments are, are really to make a point, and I hope that uh, it's carried through. I, we could have had this bill on the floor and maybe finished it today. Well, I, I appreciate what you're saying, Mr. Quillen. It, it seems to me that uh, you know we're a representative body, and and uh, it probably is not surprising that we would have so much attention focused on the legislative process when there is so very much dissatisfaction among those people whom we represent with respect to the way that process works. And so, I think it's probably not surprising that that there are the number of amendments that have been offered today. But the only 40 percent of this, these funds go to the legislative process. The rest are our different agencies. And I think the perception is just exactly what you say, that it's all legislative, but that's not true. And I think we've got to tell our story and get it out so people will not blame us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Quillen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Being no more witnesses, the Rules Committee stands recessed, uh, subject to the call of the chair. Uh, How long are you thankful? Uh, we've got to go over some amendments. And uh, I'll notify the minority uh, within a half an hour of meeting. Is fine? Thank you. Committee stands recessed. As the Rules Committee takes a break, we'll pause to update our morning schedule and return for the evening session of this hearing. Gavel to Gavel is a guide to the televised proceedings of Congress. It gives a detailed description of the legislative process and answers the most often asked questions about Congress. To charge your copy of Gavel to Gavel, call toll-free 1-800-523-3174 or send a check or money order for six ninety five dollars to Gavel to Gavel, C-SPAN Publications, 1616 Main Street, Lynchburg, Virginia. The zip code is 24504.
C-SPAN 2 and its companion network C-SPAN are funded entirely by America's cable television companies as a public service. We're pausing to update our overnight programming. Please remember all times listed are Eastern times only. Just ahead, the House Rules Committee discusses the 1994 Legislative Appropriations Bill. The $1.8 billion bill appropriates funds for the House, Joint Committees, and for Congressional Support Agencies. At 7.30 a.m., it's debate from the British House of Lords. Members debated the Maastricht Treaty, which would broaden economic and political integration between the nations of the European community. At 9 a.m., it's live coverage of Thursday's session of the United States Senate. Senators will continue to debate S-3, the campaign finance bill. That's a brief look at our overnight schedule. Committee will uh, come to order. The chair will entertain a motion in a moment, but just to give you a little preview of the draft rule, we'll make in order only those amendments printed in the report. The committee still must decide which amendments to make in order. After the initial motion is read, the chair will entertain further motions that specific amendments be made in order. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, would you yield? I yield to the gentleman from yeah. New York. I'm uh, reading the. Uh, <laughs> reading the rule and it says uh, what you just uh, alluded to it says no amendments shall be in order except those printed in the report of the committee on rules accompanying this resolution where is the report we haven't decided yet this is what the markup's about right now okay so we're uh, we're going to go through an, a, um, an amendment process That's right. making amendments in exactly. order exactly oh, fine uh, let's go okay Thought you'd never ask. All right. First, I'd like to submit the letters from the authorizing committees. Uh, letter from uh, Charles Rose, North Carolina, chairman of the uh, Committee on House Administration, uh, stating in effect that. Uh, uh,